12 Pilgrim Tales Gabriel Garcia Marquez He was a Colombian writer and journalist who won the 1982 Nobel Prize in Literature. 12 Pilgrim Tales Forward Why 12, Why Stories and Why Pilgrims? The 12 stories in this book were written in the course of the last 18 years. Before its current form, five of them were newspaper stories and movie scripts, and one was a television serial. Another I told it 15 years ago in a recorded interview, and the friend I told it to transcribed and published it, and now I have rewritten it from that version. It has been a rare creative experience that deserves to be explained, if only so that children who want to be writers when they grow up will know now how insatiable and abrasive the vice of writing is. The first idea occurred to me at the beginning of the 70s, regarding an enlightening dream that I had after five years of living in Barcelona. I dreamed that I was attending my own funeral, on foot, walking among a group of friends dressed in solemn mourning, but in a festive mood. We all seemed happy to be together. And I more than anyone, for that pleasant opportunity that death gave me to be with my friends from Latin America, the oldest, the most beloved, the ones I hadn't seen for the longest time. At the end of the ceremony, when they began to leave, I tried to accompany them, but one of them made me see with strict severity that the party was over for me. You're the only one who can't leave, he told me. Only then did I understand that dying is never being with friends again. I don't know why. I interpreted that exemplary dream as an awareness of my identity, and I thought it was a good starting point to write about the strange things that happened to Latin Americans in Europe. It was an encouraging find, since I had finished The Autumn of the Patriarch shortly before, which was my most arduous and hazardous work, and I could not find where to continue. For about two years I took notes of the themes that occurred to me without deciding yet what to do with them. Since I didn't have a notebook at home the night I decided to start, my children lent me a school notebook. They carried it themselves in their book bags on our frequent trips for fear that it would get lost. I got to have 64 songs written down with so many details that I only needed to write them. It was in Mexico, upon my return from Barcelona, in 1974, where it became clear to me that this book should not be a novel, as it seemed to me at first but a collection of short stories, based on journalistic facts but redeemed from their mortal condition by the cunning of poetry. Until then he had written three storybooks. However, none of the three was conceived and resolved as a whole, rather each story was an autonomous and occasional piece. So writing the 64 could be a fascinating adventure if you could write them all in one line, and with an internal unity of tone and style that made them inseparable in the reader's memory. The first two The Trace of Your Blood in the Snow and Mrs. Forbes's Happy Summer were written in 1976, and promptly published in literary supplements in various countries. I didn't take a day off, but in the middle of the third story, which was my funeral, by the way, I felt like I was getting more tired than if it were a novel. The same happened to me with the fourth. So much so that I didn't have the breath to finish them. Now I know why. The effort of writing a short story is as intense as starting a novel. Well, in the first paragraph of a novel you have to define everything, structure, tone, style, rhythm, length, and sometimes even the character of a character. The rest is the pleasure of writing, the most intimate and lonely that can be imagined, and if one does not stay correcting the book for the rest of one's life it is because the same rigor of iron that is necessary to start it is imposed to finish it. The story on the other hand, has no beginning or end, it forges or it does not forge. And if it does not forge, your own experience and that of others teach that in most of the times it is healthier to start it over another way, or to throw it away. Someone I don't remember said it well with a consoling phrase, a good writer is better appreciated for what he breaks than for what he publishes. It is true that I did not tear up the drafts and notes, but I did something worse, I threw them into oblivion. I remember having the notebook on my desk in Mexico, shipwrecked in a squall of papers, until 1978. One day, looking for something else, I realized that I had lost sight of it for a long time. I did not care. But when I convinced myself that I was not actually at the table, I had a panic attack. 
there was not a corner in the house that was not thoroughly searched. We removed the furniture, disassembled the library to make sure it had not fallen behind the books, and subjected service and friends to unforgivable inquiries. No sign. The only possible explanation or plausible is that in some of the many exterminations of papers that I frequently do, the notebook went to the garbage drawer. My own reaction surprised me, topics that I had forgotten for almost four years became a matter of honor. Trying to get them back at any cost, in such arduous work as writing them, I managed to reconstruct the notes of thirty. As the very effort of remembering them served as a purge, I heartlessly eliminated those that seemed insurmountable, and eighteen remained. This time I was encouraged by the determination to continue writing them without pause, but I soon realized that I had lost my enthusiasm. However, contrary to what I had always advised new writers, I did not throw them away but instead re-archived them. Just in case. When I started Chronicle of a Death Foretold, in 1979, I found that in the pauses between two books I lost the habit of writing and it became increasingly difficult for me to start over. That is why, between October 1980 and March 1984, I set myself the task of writing a weekly article in newspapers in various countries, as a discipline to keep my arm warm. Then it occurred to me that my conflict with the notes in the notebook was still a problem of literary genres, and that in reality they should not be stories but press releases. Only after posting five notes taken from the notebook, I changed my mind again, they were better for the movies. This is how five movies and a television serial were made. What I never foresaw was that the press and film work would change certain ideas about the stories, to the point that when writing them now in their final form I have had to be careful to separate with tweezers my own ideas from those contributed to me by the stories. Directors during the writing of the scripts. In addition, the simultaneous collaboration with five different creators suggested another method for writing the stories, I would start one when I had free time, abandon it when I felt tired, or when an unforeseen project arose, and then start another. In little more than a year, six of the eighteen songs went to the waste basket, and among them that of my funerals, since I never managed to make it a party like the one in the dream. The remaining tales, on the other hand, seem to draw breath for a long life. They are the twelve in this book. Last September they were ready to print after another two years of intermittent work. And so it would have ended its incessant pilgrimage back and forth to the garbage drawer, had it not been for a final doubt bit me at the last minute. Since I had described the different cities in Europe where the stories take place from memory and from a distance, I wanted to verify the fidelity of my memories almost twenty years later, and I undertook a quick trip of recognition to Barcelona, Geneva, Rome, and Paris. None of them had anything to do with my memories anymore. All, like all of Europe today, were rarefied by an astonishing reversal, real memories seemed to me to be ghosts of memory, while false memories were so convincing that they had supplanted reality. So it was impossible for me to distinguish the dividing line between disappointment and nostalgia. It was the final solution. Well, I had finally found what I needed most to finish the book, and that could only be given to me over the years, a perspective in time. On my return from that adventurous trip, I rewrote all the stories again from the beginning in eight feverish months in which I did not need to wonder where life ended and imagination began because I was helped by the suspicion that perhaps none of the above was true. Lived twenty years before in Europe. My writing then became so fluid that at times I felt like writing for the sheer pleasure of narrating, which is perhaps the human state that most closely resembles levitation. In addition, working all the stories at once and jumping from one to another with full freedom, I got a panoramic vision that saved me from the fatigue of successive beginnings and helped me to hunt down idle redundancies and deadly contradictions. I believe I have thus achieved the storybook closest to the one I always wanted to write. Here he is, ready to be brought to the table after so much going from Timbo to Derry fighting to survive the perversities of uncertainty. All the stories except the first two were finished at the same time, and each one bears the date I started it. The order in which they are in this edition is the one they had in the notebook. I have always believed that every version of a story is better than the previous one. How then to know which should be the last? 
It is a secret of the trade that does not obey the laws of intelligence but the magic of instincts, as the cook knows when the soup is. Anyway, just in case, I will not read them again, as I have never read any of my books again for fear of regret. Whoever reads them will know what to do with them. Fortunately, for these twelve pilgrim tales ending up in the wastebasket must be like the relief of coming home. Gabriel Garcia Marquez Cartagena de Indias, April, 1992 Good trip, Mr. President. I was sitting on the wooden bench under the yellow leaves of the lonely park, staring at the dusty swans with both hands resting on the silver pommel of the cane, and thinking about death. When he first came to Geneva the lake was serene and clear, and there were tame seagulls coming to eat on the hands, and hired women who looked like six o'clock ghosts, with organdy ruffles and silk umbrellas. Now the only possible woman, as far as the eye could see, was a flower seller on the deserted dock. It was hard for him to believe that time could have wreaked such havoc not only on his life but on the world as well. He was just another stranger in the city of illustrious strangers. She wore the dark blue dress with white stripes, the brocade waistcoat, and the hard hat of retired magistrates. He had a haughty musketeer mustache, thick bluish hair with romantic waves, the hands of a harpist with the widower's ring on the left ring, and merry eyes. The only thing that gave away the state of his health was the fatigue of the skin. And yet, at seventy-three, he was still of prime elegance. This morning, however, he felt safe from all vanity. The years of glory and power were hopelessly past, and now only those of death remained. He had returned to Geneva after two world wars, in search of a definitive answer to a pain that the Martinique doctors failed to identify. He had planned no more than fifteen days, but there were already six weeks of grueling exams and uncertain results, and the end was not yet in sight. They were looking for pain in the liver, in the kidney in the pancreas, in the prostate, where it was least. Until that undesirable Thursday, when the least notorious of the many who had seen him summoned him to the neurology ward at nine in the morning. The office looked like a monk's cell, and the doctor was small and gloomy, his right hand in a cast from a broken thumb. When he turned off the light, the illuminated X-ray of a spine appeared on the screen that he did not recognize as his own until the doctor pointed with a pointer, below the waist the union of two vertebrae. Your pain is here, he told her. It wasn't that easy for him. His pain was unlikely and elusive, sometimes appearing to be in the right rib and sometimes in the lower abdomen, and often it surprised him with an instant stab in the groin. The doctor listened to him in suspense and with the pointer motionless on the screen. That's why he misled us for a long time, he said. But now we know it's here. Then he put the index finger on his temple, and specified. Although strictly speaking, Mr. President, all pain is here. His clinical style was so dramatic that the final sentence seemed benevolent, the President had to undergo a risky and unavoidable operation. The latter asked him what the risk margin was, and the old doctor enveloped him in a light of uncertainty. We couldn't say for sure, he told her. Until recently, he said. The risks of fatal accidents were great, and even more so those of different paralyses of varying degrees. But with the medical advances of the two wars, those fears were a thing of the past. Go easy, he concluded. Prepare your things well, and let us know. But yes, do not forget that the sooner the better. It was not a good morning to digest that bad news, unless in the open. He had left the hotel very early, without a coat because he saw a radiant sun through the window, and he had gone with his counted steps from the Chemin du Beausoleil, where the hospital was, to the refuge of furtive lovers of the English park. He had been there for more than an hour, always thinking about death, when autumn began. The lake rippled like a raging ocean, and a wind of disorder scared away the seagulls and swept away the last of the leaves. The president got up and, instead of buying it from the florist, plucked a daisy from the public flower beds and put it in his buttonhole. The florist surprised him. Those flowers are not from God, sir, she told him, disgusted. They are from the town hall. He paid no attention to her. 
he strode away, grasping the cane at the center of the cane, and sometimes swinging it with a somewhat libertine grace. On the Mont Blanc Bridge, the Confederate flags were being hastily removed, crazed by the wind, and the slender, foam-topped jet went out prematurely. The president did not recognize his usual cafeteria on the pier, because the green awning had been removed from the canopy and the flowery summer terraces had just closed. In the hall, the lamps were lit in broad daylight, and the string quartet was playing a foreboding Mozart. The president picked up a newspaper on the counter from the pile reserved for the customers, hung his hat and cane on the hanger, put on his gold-rimmed glasses to read at the farthest table, and only then did he realize that he had autumn has come. He began to read through the international page, where he found news from the Americas very occasionally, and continued reading from back to front until the waitress brought him his daily bottle of Evian water. It had been more than thirty years since he had given up the habit of coffee by imposition of his doctors. But he had said, if I was ever certain that I was going to die, I would take it again. Perhaps the time had come. Bring me a coffee too, he ordered in perfect French. And he specified without noticing the double meaning, Italian, as if to raise a dead man. He drank it unsweetened, in slow sips, and then turned the cup upside down on the plate so that the coffee grounds, after so many years, would have time to write down his destiny. The recovered taste redeemed him for an instant from his bad thinking. An instant later, as part of the same spell, he felt someone look at him. Then he turned the page casually, looked over his glasses, and saw the pale, unshaven man in a sports cap and turned-up lamb jacket, who instantly looked away so as not to trip over hers. His face was familiar. They had passed each other several times in the hospital lobby, I had seen him again any day on a scooter on the promenade du lac. As he gazed at the swans, but never felt recognized. However, he did not rule out that it was another of the many persecutory fantasies of exile. He finished the newspaper leisurely, floating on Brahms's sumptuous cellos, until the pain was stronger than the pain of the music. Then he looked at the little gold watch that hung from a fob in his vest pocket, and took the two noon calming tablets with the last swallow of Evian's water. Before removing his glasses, he deciphered his destiny on the seat of the café, and felt an icy shudder, there was the uncertainty. Finally he paid the bill with a cosmetic tip, took his cane and hat on the hanger, and went out into the street without looking at the man who was looking at him. He walked away with his festive gait, skirting the beds of wind-blown flowers, and he believed himself freed from the spell. But suddenly he felt the footsteps behind his, stopped around the corner, and turned. The man who followed him had to stop short to avoid tripping over him, and looked at him in awe, less than two feet from his eyes. Mr. President, he murmured. Tell those who pay you not to get their hopes up, said the President, without losing his smile or the charm in his voice. My health is perfect. No one knows better than I do, said the man, overwhelmed by the burden of dignity that fell upon him. I work at the hospital. The diction and cadence, and even his shyness, were those of a crude Caribbean. You won't tell me you're a doctor, the president told him. What more would I like, sir, said the man. I am an ambulance driver. I'm sorry, said the president, convinced of his mistake. It is hard work. Not as much as yours, sir. He looked at him without reservation, leaned on the cane with both hands, and asked with real interest. Where are you from? From the Caribbean. I already realized that, said the president. But from what country? The same as you, sir, said the man, and held out his hand. My name is Homero Ray. The president interrupted him in surprise, without letting go of his hand. Wow, she said, what a good name. Homer relaxed. And what's more, he said, Homer King of the House. A winter stab surprised them helpless in the middle of the street. The president shuddered to the bone and realized that he could not walk the two remaining blocks to the poor inn where he used to eat without a coat. He already had lunch? He asked Homer. I never eat lunch, Homer said. 
like once a night in my house. Make an exception for today, he told her with all his charms on the surface. I invite him to lunch. She took him by the arm and led him to the restaurant across the street, with the name gilded on the canvas canopy, L.E. Berf Kuran. The interior was cramped and warm, and there seemed to be no vacant space. Homero Ray, surprised that no one recognized the president, followed to the back of the room to ask for help. Are you president in office? Asked the boss. No, said Homer. Overthrown. The boss gave an approving smile. For those, he said, I always have a special table. He led them to a secluded spot at the back of the room where they could chat at ease. The president thanked him. Not everyone recognizes the dignity of exile as you do, he said. The specialty of the house was the ribs of beef to the coal. The president and his guest looked around, and saw on the other tables the large roasted chunks with a rim of tender fat. It is magnificent meat, murmured the president. But I have it forbidden. He fixed Homer with a mischievous look, and changed his tone. Actually, I'm forbidden everything. He's also forbidden coffee, Homer said, and yet he drinks it. Realized? said the president. But today was just an exception on an exceptional day. The exception of that day was not only with the coffee. He also ordered a charcoal rib of beef and a fresh vegetable salad with no garnishes other than a splash of olive oil. His guest ordered the same, plus half a carafe of red wine. While they waited for the meat, Homer took out of his jacket pocket a wallet with no money and many papers, and showed the president a faded photo. He recognized himself in shirt sleeves, several pounds lighter and deep black hair and mustache, amid a crowd of young men who had risen to stand out. With a single glance he recognized the place, recognized the emblems of an abhorrent electoral campaign, recognized the ungrateful date. How outrageous! He murmured. I've always said that one age is faster in portraits than in real life. And he returned the photo with the gesture of a final act. I remember it very well, he said. It was thousands of years ago in the Galera of San Cristobal de las Casas. It's my people, Homer said, pointing to himself in the group, this is me. The president recognized it. It was a creature. Almost, said Homer. I was with you throughout the Southern Campaign as the leader of the University Brigades. The president anticipated the reproach. I, of course, didn't even notice you, he said. On the contrary, he was very kind to us, said Homer. But there were so many of us that it is not possible to remember. And later? Who can know more than you? Said Homer. After the military coup, what is a miracle is that we are both here, ready to eat half an ox. Not many were so lucky. At that moment the dishes were brought to them. The president put the napkin around his neck, like a child's bib, and was not insensitive to the quiet surprise of the guest. If I didn't do this, I would lose a tie at every meal, he said. Before he began, he tasted the seasoning of the meat, approved it with a pleased gesture, and returned to the subject. What I can't explain, he said, is why he hadn't approached me before instead of following me like a hound. Then Homer told him that he had recognized him since he saw him enter the hospital through a door reserved for very special cases. It was midsummer, and he was wearing the complete white linen suit from the Antilles, with matching black and white shoes, the daisy in the buttonhole, and the beautiful wind-blown hair. Homer found out that he was alone in Geneva, without help from anyone, he knew by heart the city where he had finished his law studies. The hospital management, at his request, made internal determinations to ensure absolute incognito. That same night, Homer arranged with his wife to make contact with him. However, she had followed him for five weeks looking for a propitious occasion, and perhaps she would not have been able to greet him if he had not confronted him. I'm glad you did, said the president, although the truth is that it doesn't bother me at all to be alone. That's not fair. Why? asked the president sincerely. The greatest victory of my life has been getting them to forget me. We remember you more than you think, 
said Homer without hiding his emotion. It is a joy to see him like this, healthy and young. However, he said without drama, everything indicates that I will die very soon. Your chances of doing well are very high, said Homer. The president jumped in surprise, but did not lose his grace. Oh geez! She exclaimed. Is medical secrecy abolished in beautiful Switzerland? In no hospital in the world are there secrets for an ambulance driver, Homer said. Well, what I know I have only known two hours ago and from the mouth of the only one who should have known. In any case, you wouldn't die in vain, said Homer. Someone will put you in your rightful place as a great example of dignity. The president feigned comic amazement. Thanks for warning me, he said. He ate as he did everything, slowly and with great neatness. Meanwhile he looked Homer straight in the eye, so that he had the impression of seeing what he was thinking. After a long conversation of nostalgic evocations, he made an evil smile. I had decided not to worry about my body, he said, but now I see that I must take certain detective novel precautions so that no one finds it. It'll be useless, Homer joked back. In the hospital there are no mysteries that last more than an hour. When they finished with the coffee, the president read the bottom of his cup, and shuddered again, the message was the same. However, his expression did not alter. He paid the bill in cash, but first he double-checked the amount, counted the money overly carefully, and left a tip that only earned a grunt from the waiter. It was a pleasure, he concluded, saying goodbye to Homer. I don't have a date for the operation, and I haven't even decided if I'm going to have it or not. But if everything goes well we will meet again. And why not before? Said Homer. Lazara, my wife, is a cook for the rich. No one prepares shrimp rice better than her, and we'd like to have it at home one of these nights. Seafood is forbidden, but I will gladly eat it, he said. Tell me when. Thursday is my day off, Homer said. Perfect, said the president. On Thursday at seven in the evening I am at his house. It will be a pleasure. I'll pick it up, Homer said. Hotel Erie Dames, 14 Rue de Lindustry. Behind the station. It's right. Right, said the president, and stood more charming than ever. Apparently he even knows the number I wear. Of course, sir, said Homer, amused, 41. What Homero Ray did not tell the president, but he continued to tell for years to everyone who wanted to hear it, was that his initial purpose was not so innocent. Like other ambulance drivers, he had arrangements with funeral homes and insurance companies to sell services within the same hospital, especially to low-income foreign patients. They were minimal earnings and they also had to be shared with other employees who passed the secret reports on seriously ill patients from hand to hand. But it was a good consolation for an outcast with no future who was barely subsisting with his wife and two children on a ridiculous salary. Lazara Davis, his wife, was more realistic. She was a fine mulatto woman from San Juan, Puerto Rico, small and massive the color of caramel at rest and with the eyes of a brave bitch that suited her way of being very well. They had met in the charity services of the hospital, where she worked as an assistant to everything after a rentier from her country, who had taken her as a babysitter, left her behind in Geneva. They had been married by the Catholic Rite, although she was a Yoruba princess, and they lived in a living room and two bedrooms on the eighth floor without elevator of a building for African immigrants. They had a nine-year-old girl, Barbara, and a seven-year-old boy, Lazaro, with some lower rates of mental retardation. Lazara Davis was smart and short-tempered, but with tender guts. She considered herself a pure Taurus, and had blind faith in her astral omens. However, she was never able to fulfill her dream of earning a living as a millionaire astrologer. Instead, she brought occasional, and sometimes significant, resources into the house by preparing dinners for wealthy ladies who showed off to their guests by making them believe that they were the ones cooking the exciting West Indian dishes. Homer, for his part, was shy of solemnity, and did not give for more than the little he did, 
but Lazara could not conceive of life without him because of the innocence of his heart and the caliber of his weapon. They had done well, but the years were getting harder and harder and the children were growing up. By the time the president arrived, they had started pecking at their five-year savings. So when Homero Ray discovered him among the incognito patients in the hospital, his illusions got out of hand. They did not know for sure what they were going to ask for, or with what right. At first they had planned to sell him the entire funeral, including the embalming and repatriation. But little by little they realized that the death did not seem as imminent as at first. On the day of lunch they were already stunned by doubts. The truth is that Homer had not been a leader of university brigades, or anything like that, and the only time he participated in the electoral campaign was when they took the photo that they had managed to find by a miracle misplaced in the closet. But his fervor was true. It was also true that he had had to flee the country because of his participation in the street resistance against the military coup, although the only reason to continue living in Geneva after so many years was his poverty of spirit. So a lie too much or too little should not be an obstacle to winning the favor of the president. The first surprise of both was that the illustrious exile lived in a fourth-class hotel in the sad district of La Grotte, among Asian immigrants and butterflies of the night, and that he ate only in poor houses, when Geneva was full of dignified residences. For politicians in disgrace. Homer had seen him repeat the acts of that day day after day. She had accompanied him by sight, and sometimes at a less than safe distance, on his nightly walks among the gloomy walls and yellow bell flaps of the old city. He had seen him absorbed for hours in front of Calvino's statue. He had climbed the stone steps behind him, suffocated by the fiery perfume of jasmine, to watch the slow summer evenings from the top of the Burgle Four. One night she saw him in the first drizzle, without a coat or an umbrella, queuing with the students for a rubmstem concert. I don't know how he didn't get pneumonia, he later told his wife. The previous Saturday, when the weather began to change, I had seen him buying an autumn coat with a fake mink collar, not in the bright shops on the Rue du Rhone, where the fugitive emirs shopped, but in the market of the fleas. Then there is nothing to do. Lazara exclaimed when Homer told her. He's a fucking miser, capable of being buried by charity in the common grave. We will never get anything out of you. Maybe he's really poor, said Homer, after so many years without a job. Oh, Black, it's one thing to be Pies Ice with Pies Ice Ascendant and it's another thing to be an asshole, Lazarus said. Everyone knows that he won the government's gold and that he is the richest exile in Martinique. Homer, who was ten years older, had grown impressed with the news that the president studied in Geneva, working as a construction worker. On the other hand, Lazara had grown up amidst the scandals of the enemy press, magnified in a house of enemies, where she had been a babysitter since she was a child. So the night Homer came in drowning with glee that he had had lunch with the president, the argument that she had invited him to an expensive restaurant did not work for her. It annoyed her that Homer hadn't asked her for anything they had dreamed of, from scholarships for the children to a better job at the hospital. The decision to have the corpse thrown to the vultures instead of spending their francs on a dignified burial and glorious repatriation seemed confirmation of his suspicions. But what spilled over the glass was the news that Homer saved for last, that he had invited the president to eat shrimp rice on Thursday night. We just lacked that, Lazarus shouted, let him die here, poisoned with canned shrimp, and we have to bury him with the children's savings. What ultimately determined his conduct was the weight of his marital loyalty. She had to borrow from a neighbor three sets of nickel silver cutlery and a glass salad bowl, from another an electric coffee maker, from another an embroidered tablecloth and china china for coffee. He swapped the old curtains for the new ones, which they only used on holidays, and removed the lining from the furniture. He spent a whole day scrubbing the floors, dusting, moving things around until he achieved the opposite of what would have been best for them, which was to move the guest with the decorum of poverty. On Thursday night, after he recovered from the eight-story drowning, the president appeared at the door with the new old coat and melon hat from another time, and with a single rose for Lazara. She was impressed with his virile beauty and his princely manner, 
but beyond all that she saw him as she expected to see him, false and rapacious. It seemed impertinent to him, because she had cooked with the windows open to prevent the shrimp steam from permeating the house, and the first thing he did when he entered was take a deep breath, as in sudden ecstasy, and exclaimed with his eyes closed and open arms, Ah, the smell of our sea. He seemed more stingy than ever for bringing her a single rose, no doubt stolen from the public gardens. He found it insolent, for the disdain with which he looked at the newspaper clippings about his presidential glories, and the campaign pennants and banners, which Homer had nailed so candidly to the wall of the room. He seemed hard of heart, because he did not even greet Barbara and Lazaro, who had a gift made for him by them, and during dinner he referred to two things that he could not bear, the dogs and the children. I hate it. However, his Caribbean sense of hospitality prevailed over his prejudices. She had put on the African robe from her party nights and her Santeria necklaces and bracelets, and during dinner she did not make a single gesture or say a word to spare. It was more than irreproachable, perfect. The truth was that shrimp rice was not among the virtues of his cuisine, but he did it with the best wishes, and it was very good. The president served himself twice without measuring himself in the praise, and he loved the fried slices of ripe plantain and the avocado salad, although he did not share the nostalgia. Lazaro was content to listen to the desserts, when Homer got stuck in the dead end of God's existence. I do believe it exists, said the president, but it has nothing to do with human beings. He walks into much bigger things. I only believe in the stars, Lazaro said, and scrutinized the president's reaction. What day were you born? March 11. It had to be, Lazaro said, with a triumphant start, and asked in a good tone. Wouldn't there be too much two pies ice on the same table? The men were still talking about God when she went to the kitchen to make coffee. She had packed up the food items and hoped with all her soul for the night to end well. Back in the room with the coffee, she was met by a loose phrase from the president that left her stunned. Make no mistake about it, my dear friend, the worst that could have happened to our poor country is that I was president. Homer saw Lazara at the door with the Chinese cups and the borrowed coffee pot, and he thought she was going to faint. The president also noticed her. Don't look at me like that, ma'am, he told her in a good tone. I am speaking from the heart. And then, turning to Homer, he finished. Good thing I'm paying dearly for my folly. Lazara poured the coffee, turned off the overhead lamp on the table, whose inclement light made it difficult to talk, and the room was left in intimate gloom. For the first time he became interested in the guest, whose grace could not hide his sadness. Lazarus' curiosity increased when he finished his coffee and put the cup upside down on the plate to rest the seat. The president told them in the afternoon that he had chosen the island of Martinique for his exile, because of his friendship with the poet Aimé Césaire, who at that time had just published his Cahier d'un retour au pays natal, and helped him to start a new life. With what was left of the wife's inheritance they bought a hardwood house in the hills of Fort de France, with wire in the windows and a sea terrace full of primitive flowers, where it was a joy to sleep in the hubbub. Of the crickets and the breeze of molasses and cane rum from the sugar mills. He stayed there with his wife, fourteen years older than him and ill since his only birth, entrenched against fate in the vicious rereading of his Latin classics, in Latin, and with the conviction that this was the final act of his life. For years he had to resist the temptations of all kinds of adventures proposed by his defeated supporters. But I never opened a letter again, he said. Never, since I discovered that even the most urgent ones were less urgent a week later, and that two months later, neither the person who had written them remembered them. He glanced at Lazara in the dim light as he lit a cigarette, and removed it with a greedy flick of his fingers. He took a deep drag, and held the smoke in his throat. Lazara, surprised, took the box and the matches to light another, but he returned the lit cigarette to her. You smoke with such pleasure that I could not resist the temptation, he told her. But he had to release the smoke because he suffered a beginning of coughing. I gave up the vice many years ago, but he did not abandon me completely. Said. Sometimes he has managed to beat me. Like now. 
The cough gave him two more jolts. The pain returned. The president looked at the time on his pocket watch, and took the two tablets for the night. Then he scanned the bottom of the cup, nothing had changed, but this time he didn't flinch. Some of my former supporters have been presidents after me, he said. Sayago, said Homer. Sayago and others, he said. Everyone like me, usurping an honor we didn't deserve with a job we didn't know how to do. Some pursue only power, but most seek even less, employment. Lazara bristled. Do you know what they say about you? She asked him. Homer, alarmed, intervened. Are lies. They are lies and they are not, said the president with heavenly calm. In the case of a president, the worst ignominies can be both at the same time, truth and falsehood. He had lived in Martinique every day of exile, with no other foreign contact than the few news from the official newspaper, supporting himself with Spanish and Latin classes at an official high school and with the translations that Amé Césaire sometimes ordered him to do. The heat was unbearable in August, and he stayed in the hammock until noon, reading to the lullaby of the bedroom fan. His wife took care of the birds that she raised in the wild, even in the hottest hours, protecting herself from the sun with a straw hat with large brims, adorned with artificial strawberries and organdy flowers. But when the heat went down it was good to take the cool off on the terrace, he with his eyes fixed on the sea until he sank into the darkness, and she in her wicker rocking chair, with her hat broken and her fancy rings on all the pieces. Fingers, watching the ships of the world go by. That one goes to Puerto Santo, she said. That man can hardly walk with the load of bananas from Puerto Santo, he said. Well, it did not seem possible for a ship to pass that was not from his land. He was playing deaf, although in the end she managed to forget better than he, because he was left without memory. They stayed that way until the roaring twilights ended, and they had to take refuge in the house defeated by the mosquitoes. One of those many August, while reading the newspaper on the terrace, the president jumped in astonishment. Oh geez! said. I have died in Estoril. His wife, levitating in stupor, was shocked at the news. There were six lines on the fifth page of the newspaper that was printed around the corner, in which his occasional translations were published, and whose editor stopped by from time to time. And now he said that he had died in Estoril de Lisboa, a seaside resort and lair of European decadence, where he had never been, and perhaps the only place in the world where he would not have wanted to die. The wife really died a year later, haunted by the last memory that remained for that moment, that of the only son, who had participated in the overthrow of his father, and was later shot by his own accomplices. The president sighed. That's how we are, and nothing can redeem us he said. A continent conceived by the feces of the whole world without a moment of love, children of kidnappings, rapes, infamous deals, deceit, enemies with enemies. I know. He faced Lazarus' African eyes, which were scrutinizing him mercilessly, and tried to tame her with his old master's lip. The word miscegenation means to mix tears with the blood that runs. What can be expected from such a concoction? Lazaro pinned him in place with deathly silence. But he managed to get over it, shortly before midnight, and dismissed him with a formal kiss. The president objected to Homer accompanying him to the hotel, but could not prevent him from helping him find a taxi. On the way home, Homer found his wife sick with fury. That's the best lying president in the world, she said. A tremendous son of a bitch. Despite Homer's efforts to reassure her, they spent a terrible night awake. Lazara recognized that he was one of the most beautiful men she had ever seen, with devastating power of seduction and the virility of a stud. As it is, old and screwed up, it must still be a tiger in bed, he said. But he believed that those gifts of God had been squandered in the service of simulation. He could not bear his boasting of having been the worst president in his country. Not even his ascetic pretenses, if she was convinced that he owned half of the Martinique mills. Nor the hypocrisy of his disdain for power, if it was evident that he would give everything to return to the presidency for a minute to make his enemies bite the dust. 
and all that, he concluded, just to have us surrendered to his feet. What can you gain from that? said Homer. Nothing, she said. What happens is that coquetry is a vice that is not satisfied with anything. His fury was so great that Homer could not bear it in bed, and he went to end the night wrapped in a blanket on the living room divan. Lazara also got up at dawn, naked in full length, as she used to sleep and be at home, and talking to herself in a one-string monologue. In a moment he erased from the memory of humanity all trace of the undesirable dinner. At dawn he returned the borrowed things, exchanged the new curtains for the old ones, and put the furniture in their place, until the house was again as poor and decent as it had been until the night before. Finally, he tore out the newspaper clippings, portraits, pennants and pennants from the abominable campaign, and tossed everything into the garbage drawer with a final shout. Fuck it! A week after dinner, Homer found the president waiting for him outside the hospital, pleading with him to accompany him to his hotel. They climbed the three steep floors to a mansard with a single skylight that overlooked an ash sky, and traversed by a rope with clothes hanging to dry. There was also a double bed that took up half the space, a simple chair, a washstand and a portable bidet, and a poor man's wardrobe with the cloudy mirror. The president noted Homer's impression. It's the same den where I lived my student years, he said apologetically. I booked it from Fort de France. She took out of a velvet bag and spread the final balance of her resources on the bed, several gold bracelets with different jeweled ornaments, a three-stranded pearl necklace and two others of gold and precious stones, three gold chains with medals of saints and a pair of gold earrings with emeralds, another with diamonds and another with rubies, two reliquaries and a locket. Eleven rings with all kinds of precious frames and a diadem of diamonds that could have belonged to a queen. Then he took out of a separate case three pairs of silver and two gold cufflinks with their corresponding tie clips, and a white gold plated pocket watch. Finally, he took out of a shoe box his six decorations two gold, one silver, and the rest, pure junk. It's all I have left in life, he said. He had no choice but to sell everything to cover the medical expenses and he wanted Homer to do him the favor with the utmost secrecy. However, Homer did not feel able to please him as long as he did not have the invoices in order. The president explained that they were his wife's garments inherited from a colonial grandmother who in turn had inherited a package of shares in gold mines in Colombia. The watch, the cufflinks, and the tie clips were his. The decorations, of course, were not before anyone. I don't think anyone has bills for things like that, he said. Homer was adamant. In that case, the president reflected, I will have no choice but to show my face. He began collecting the jewels with calculated calm. I beg your pardon, my dear Homer, but there is no worse poverty than that of a poor president, he said. Even surviving seems unworthy. In that instant, Homer saw him with his heart and surrendered his weapons to him. That night, Lazara came home late. From the door he saw the jewels radiant in the mercurial light of the dining room, and it was as if he had seen a scorpion in his bed. Don't be stupid, Black, she said, scared. Why are those things here? Homer's explanation made her even more uneasy. He sat down to examine the jewels, one by one, with the meticulousness of a goldsmith. At a certain moment he sighed, it must be a fortune. Finally he stared at Homer without finding a way out of his confusion. Damn, he said. How do you know if everything that man says is true? And why not? Said Homer. I just saw that he washes his clothes himself, and dries them in the room just like we do, hanging on a wire. For stingy, Lazarus said. Or poor, said Homer. Lazara examined the jewels again, but with less attention now, because she too was beaten. So the next morning she dressed in the best she had, dressed herself with the jewels that seemed most expensive, put as many rings as she could on each finger, even on her thumb, and how many bracelets she could put on each arm, and she left. To sell them. Let's see who asks Lazara Davis for bills, he said as he left, strutting with laughter. She chose the exact jewelry, with more airs than prestige, 
where she knew it was bought and sold without too many questions, and she entered terrified but steadfast. A lean and pale vendor in formal dress gave her a theatrical bow by kissing her hand, and placed himself at her orders. The interior was lighter than day, from the mirrors and bright lights, and the entire store looked like diamond. Lazara, barely looking at the employee for fear that the farce would show, continued to the back. The clerk invited her to sit at one of the three Louis XV desks that served as individual counters, and spread an immaculate handkerchief over it. Then he sat across from Lazara, and waited. How can I help you? She took off the rings, the bracelets, the necklaces, the earrings, everything she was wearing in sight, and was putting them on the desk in a chess order. All he wanted, he said, was to know his true worth. The jeweler put the monocle over his left eye, and began examining the jewels with clinical silence. After a long time, without interrupting the examination, he asked. Where are you from? You, Lazara had not anticipated that question. I, my lord, he sighed. From far away. I can imagine it, he said. He returned to silence, while Lazara scrutinized him mercilessly with her terrible golden eyes. The jeweler paid special attention to the diamond tiara, and set it apart from the other jewels. Lazara sighed. You are a perfect Virgo, he said. The jeweler did not interrupt the examination. How do you know? By way of being, Lazarus said. He made no comment until he was done, and addressed her with the same parsimony at the beginning. Where does all this come from? Inheritance from a grandmother, Lazarus said in a tight voice. He died last year in Paramaribo at the age of 97. The jeweler looked her in the eye then. I'm very sorry, he said. But the only value of these things is what the gold weighs. She caught the tiara with her fingertips and made it sparkle in the dazzling light. Except for this one, he said. It is very ancient, Egyptian perhaps, and it would be invaluable if it weren't for the poor condition of the diamonds. But it still has a certain historical value. On the other hand, the stones of the other jewels, the amethysts, the emeralds, the rubies, the opals, all, without exception, were false. Without a doubt the originals were good, said the jeweler, as he collected the garments to return them. But from so much passing from one generation to another, legitimate stones have been left behind, replaced by bottle bottoms. Lazara felt a green nausea, took a deep breath and controlled her panic. The seller consoled her. It happens often, ma'am. I know, Lazara said, relieved. That is why I want to get out of them. Then she felt that she was beyond the sham, and she was herself again. Without further ado, she took the cufflinks, the pocket watch, the tie clips, the gold and silver decorations, and the rest of the president's personal trinkets from her bag, and put everything on the table. That too? Asked the jeweler. Everything, Lazarus said. The Swiss francs with which they paid him were so new that he feared the fresh ink would stain his fingers. She received them without counting them, and the jeweler dismissed her at the door with the same ceremony of greeting. On the way out, holding the glass door to give way, he delayed her for a moment. And one last thing, ma'am, he said, I'm Aquarius. At the first night Homero and Lazara took the money to the hotel. After doing the math again, there was a little more left. So the president took off and put the wedding ring the watch with the fob and the cufflinks, and the tie clip he was using on the bed. Lazara returned the ring. Not this, he told her. Such a souvenir cannot be sold. The president admitted it and put the ring back on. Lazara also returned the watch on the vest. This too, he said. The president disagreed but she put him in his place. Who can sell watches in Switzerland? We already sold one said the president. Yes, but not because of the watch but because of the gold. This one is gold, too, said the president. Yes, Lazarus said. But you can even stay without operating, but not without knowing what time it is. 
nor did he accept the gold frame of the glasses, although he had another pair of tortoise shell. He weighed the garments in his hand, and put an end to his doubts. Besides, he said. This is enough. Before leaving, he took down the wet clothes, without consulting him, and took them away to dry and iron them at home. They left on the scooter, Homer driving and Lazara on. The grill, hugging her waist. The public lights had just come on in the mauve afternoon. The wind had ripped off the last of the leaves, and the trees looked like plucked fossils. A tugboat was coming down the Rhone with a radio at full volume that was leaving a trail of music through the streets. George's bra sense sang, Monday Amour have good law, sweep, le temps va passer par la, et le temps est un barbare dans le genre d'Adela, par la ou son cheval passe vamour any repousse pa. Homer and Lazara ran silently intoxicated by the song and the memorable smell of the hyacinths. After a while, she seemed to wake up from a long sleep. Damn, he said. That? The poor old man, Lazarus said. What a fucking life. The following Friday, October 7, the president was operated on in a five-hour session that for the moment left things as dark as they were. In fact, the only consolation was knowing that he was alive. After ten days they transferred him to a room shared with other patients, and were able to visit him. He was someone else, disoriented and haggard, with thinning hair that fell off at the touch of the pillow. Only the fluidity of his hands remained of his former appearance. His first attempt at walking with two orthopedic canes was disheartening. Lazarus stayed the night by his side to save him the expense of a night nurse. One of the sick in the room spent the first night screaming in the panic of death. Those endless evenings put an end to Lazarus' last reluctance. Four months after arriving in Geneva, he was discharged. Homer, meticulous manager of his meager funds, paid the hospital bills and took him away in his ambulance with other employees who helped carry him to the eighth floor. He settled in the bedroom of the children, whom he never quite recognized, and little by little he came back to reality. He insisted on the rehabilitation exercises with military rigor, and again walked with his single cane. But even dressed in the good clothes of yesteryear, he was far from the same, both in looks and in style. Way to be. Fearful of the winter that was predicted to be very severe, and which was actually the harshest of the century, he decided to return on a ship that left Marseille on December 13, against the criteria of the doctors who wanted to monitor him a little more. At the last minute the money was not enough, and Lazara wanted to supplement it secretly from her husband with one more scratch in the children's savings, but there too, she found less than she supposed. Homer then confessed that he had secretly taken it from her to complete the hospital bill. Well, Lazara resigned herself. Let's say it was the oldest son. On December 11 he was put on the train to Marseille in a heavy snowstorm, and only when they returned home did they find a farewell letter on the children's nightstand. Right there he left his wedding ring for Barbara, along with that of the dead wife, which he never tried to sell, and the fob watch for Lazarus. As it was Sunday, some Caribbean neighbors who discovered the secret had come to the Cornhaven station with a set of harps from Veracruz. The president was out of breath, wearing the particular coat and a long-colored scarf that had belonged to Lazara, but still he remained in the box of the last car, saying goodbye with his hat under the lash of the gale. The train was beginning to accelerate when Homer realized that he had kept the cane. He ran to the end of the platform and threw it hard enough for the president to catch him in midair, but he fell between the wheels and was smashed. It was an instant of terror. The last thing Lazarus saw was the tremulous hand stretched out to catch the cane that it never reached, and the train guardian who managed to grab the snow-covered old man by the scarf, and saved him in the void. Lazarus ran in terror to meet her husband trying to laugh behind her tears. My God, she shouted at him, that man doesn't die with nothing. He arrived safely, as he announced in his lengthy telegram of gratitude. Nothing was heard from him again in over a year. Finally a letter of six handwritten pages arrived in which it was already impossible to recognize him. The pain had returned, as intense and punctual as before, 
but he decided to ignore it and dedicate himself to living the life as it came. The poet Amé Césaire had given him another cane inlaid with mother of pearl, but he had decided not to use it. He had been eating meat regularly for six months, and all kinds of seafood, and he was able to drink up to twenty cups of Cerro coffee a day. But he no longer read the bottom of the cup because his predictions were backwards. On the day he turned seventy-five he had had a few glasses of the exquisite Martinique rum, which suited him very well, and he went back to smoking. It didn't feel better, of course, but it didn't feel worse either. However, the real reason for the letter was to inform them that he was tempted to return to his country to lead a renewal movement, for a just cause and a worthy homeland, if only for the petty glory of not dying of old age. In his bed. In that sense, the letter concluded, the trip to Geneva had been providential. June 1979 The Saint Twenty-two years later I saw Margarito Duarte again. He suddenly appeared in one of Trastevere's secret little streets, and it was hard for me to recognize him at first sight because of his difficult Spanish and his good old Roman spirit. His hair was sparse and white, and there was no trace left of the gloomy demeanor and the funeral clothes of the Andean scholar in which he had come to Rome for the first time, but in the course of the conversation I gradually rescued him from the perfidies of his years and I saw him again for what he was, stealthy, unpredictable, and with the tenacity of a stonemason. Before the second cup of coffee in one of our bars of other times, I dared to ask him the question that was eating me inside. What happened to the saint? There is the saint he answered. Waiting. Only the tenor Rafael Ribeiro Silva and I could understand the tremendous human charge of his response. We knew his drama so much that for years I thought that Margarito Duarte was the character in search of an author that novelists have waited for a lifetime, and if I never let him find me, it was because the end of his story seemed unimaginable to me. He had come to Rome in that radiant spring when Pius XII was suffering from a hiccup crisis that neither the good nor the bad arts of doctors and sorcerers had been able to remedy. He was leaving his rugged village of Tolima, in the Colombian Andes, for the first time, and it was noticeable even when he was sleeping. He came to our consulate one morning with the polished pine suitcase that in shape and size resembled a cello case, and presented to the consul the surprising reason for his trip. The consul then phoned the tenor Rafael Ribeiro Silva, his compatriot, to get him a room in the boarding house where we both lived. That's how I met him. Margarito Duarte had not passed primary school, but his vocation for beautiful letters had allowed him a broader training with the passionate reading of whatever printed material he found at his fingertips. At 18, being the a clerk of the municipality, he married a beautiful girl who died shortly after in the delivery of her first daughter. This, even more beautiful than the mother, died of an essential fever at the age of seven. But the true story of Margarito Duarte had begun six months before his arrival in Rome, when his town cemetery had to be moved to build a dam. Like all the inhabitants of the region, Margarito unearthed the bones of his dead to take them to the new cemetery. The wife was dust. In the adjoining grave, by contrast, the girl was still intact after eleven years. So much so that when they uncovered the box, the mist of the fresh roses with which they had buried it was felt. The most amazing thing, however, was that the body lacked weight. Hundreds of onlookers attracted by the clamor of the miracle flooded the village. There was no question. The incorruptibility of the body was an unequivocal symptom of sanctity, and even the bishop of the diocese agreed that such a prodigy should be submitted to the verdict of the Vatican. So a public collection was made for Margarito Duarte to travel to Rome, to fight for a cause that was no longer only his OR the narrow scope of his village, but a matter of the nation. While he was telling us his story at the boarding house in the peaceful Panali neighborhood, Margarito Duarte removed the padlock and opened the lid of the exquisite trunk. This is how the tenor Ribeiro Silva and I participated in the miracle. It did not look like a withered mummy like those seen in so many museums around the world, but a girl in a wedding dress who was still asleep after a long stay underground. The skin was smooth and warm, and the open eyes were diaphanous, giving the unbearable impression that they had seen us from death. 
the satin and the fake orange blossoms of the crown had not withstood the rigors of time in as good health as the skin, but the roses that had been placed in her hands remained alive. The weight of the pine case, in effect, remained the same when we removed the body. Margarito Duarte began his negotiations the day after arrival. At first with more compassionate than effective diplomatic assistance, and then with whatever tricks he could think of to circumvent the countless obstacles of the Vatican. He was always very secretive about his errands, but they were known to be numerous and useless. He made contact with all the religious congregations and humanitarian foundations he encountered, where they listened attentively but without astonishment, and promised him immediate steps that never ended. The truth is that the time was not the most propitious. Everything that had to do with the Holy See had been postponed until the Pope had overcome the crisis of hiccups, resistant not only to the most refined resources of academic medicine, but to all kinds of magical remedies that were sent to him from around the world. Finally, in the month of July, Pius XII recovered and went on his summer vacation at Castel Gondolfo. Margarito took the saint to the first weekly audience in the hope of showing her to him. The Pope appeared in the inner courtyard, on a balcony so low that Margarito could see his well-polished nails and managed to perceive his breath of lavender. But he did not circulate among the tourists who came from all over the world to see him, as Margarito hoped, but gave the same speech in six languages and ended with the general blessing. After so many postponements, Margarito decided to face things in person, and took a handwritten letter of almost sixty pages to the Secretary of State, from which he received no response. He had foreseen it, since the official who received her with the rigorous formalities barely deigned to give the dead girl an official look, and the employees who passed by looked at her without any interest. One of them told him that the previous year they had received more than 800 letters requesting the sanctification of intact corpses in different parts of the world. Lastly, Margarito asked that the weight of the body be checked. The official checked it, but refused to admit it. It must be a case of collective suggestion, he said. In his few free hours and on arid summer Sundays, Margarito stayed in his room, fiercely reading any book that seemed of interest to his cause. At the end of each month, on his own initiative, he wrote a detailed account of his expenses in a school notebook with his precious handwriting as a scribe, to render strict and timely accounts to the taxpayers of his town. Before the end of the year, he knew the date aloes of Rome as if he had been born in them, he spoke easy Italian and as few words as his Andean Spanish, and he knew as much as anyone else about canonization processes. But it was much longer before he changed his funeral dress, and the vest and magistrate's hat that in the Rome of the time were typical of some secret societies with unspeakable purposes. He would leave very early with the saint's case, and sometimes he would return late at night, exhausted and sad but always with a glow of light that breathed new life into him for the next day. Saints live in their own time, he said. I was in Rome for the first time, studying at the Centro Experimental de Sina, and I experienced his ordeal with unforgettable intensity. The pension where we lived was actually a modern apartment a few steps from the Villa Borghese, whose owner occupied two bedrooms and rented four to foreign students. We called her Maria Bella and she was pretty and temperamental in the height of her fall, and always faithful to the sacred rule that everyone is absolute king in their room. Actually, the one who carried the weight of everyday life was his older sister, Aunt Antoinette, a wingless angel who worked for him for hours during the day, and walked everywhere with his bucket and his jargon broom polishing beyond if possible the marbles on the floor. It was she who taught us to eat the singing birds that Bartolino, her husband, hunted because of a bad habit left over from the war, and who would end up taking Margarito to live in his house when resources were not enough for the prices of Maria Bella. Nothing less suitable for Margarito's way of being than that lawless house. Every hour he reserved a novelty for us, even at dawn, when we were awakened by the terrifying roar of the lion in the Villa Borghese Zoo. The tenor Ribeiro Silva had earned the privilege that the Romans did not resent his early rehearsals. He would get up at six, take his medicinal ice water bath, and groom Mephistopheles' beard and eyebrows, and only when he was ready with the plaid robe, Chinese silk scarf, and his personal eau de toilette, she gave herself body and soul to her singing exercises. He would open wide the window of the room, 
even with the winter stars, and he would begin to warm his voice with progressive phrases of great love arias, until he released himself to sing it at the top of his voice. The daily expectation was that when he gave his chest the lion of the Villa Borghese answered him with a roar of earthquake. You are Saint Mark reincarnated, my figure, exclaimed Aunt Antonietta, truly astonished. Only he could talk to lions. One morning it was not the lion who gave him the reply. The tenor began the Otello's love duet, Gianella notte densa estinguioni clamor. Suddenly, from the back of the patio, the answer came to us in a beautiful soprano voice. The tenor continued, and the two voices sang the entire piece, to the delight of the neighborhood who opened the windows to sanctify their houses with the torrent of that irresistible love. The tenor was about to faint when he learned that his invisible Desdemona was none other than the great Maria Coniglia. I have the impression that it was that episode that gave Margarito Duarte a valid reason to integrate himself into the life of the house. From then on he sat with everyone at the common table and not in the kitchen, as at the beginning, where Aunt Antoinette pleased him almost daily with her master stew of singing birds. Maria Bella would read us the daily newspapers after dinner to get used to Italian phonetics and she completed the news with an arbitrariness and grace that made our lives happy. One of those days, he told about the saint, that in the city of Palermo there was a huge museum with the insurrupt corpses of men, women, and children, and even of several bishops, unearthed from the same cemetery of the Capuchin Fathers. The news disturbed Margarito so much that he did not have a moment of peace until we went to Palermo. But a glance as he passed through the overwhelming galleries of inglorious mummies was enough to form a judgment of consolation. They are not the same case, he said. You can tell right away that they are dead. After lunch, Rome succumbed to the torpor of August. The midday sun remained motionless in the center of the sky, and in the silence of two in the afternoon only the sound of water could be heard, which is the natural voice of Rome. But around seven o'clock at night the windows were flung open to summon the fresh air that was beginning to move, and a jubilant crowd took to the streets for no other purpose than to live, amid the firecrackers of the motorcycles, the cries of the watermelon sellers and the love songs among the flowers on the terraces. The tenor and I did not take a nap, we would go on his scooter, he driving and I on the grill, and we would bring ice cream and chocolates to the summer horse who were fluttering under the centennial laurels of the Villa Borghese in search of tourists awake. Full sun. They were beautiful, poor, and affectionate, like most of the Italians of that time, dressed in blue organza, pink poplin, green linen, and protected themselves from the sun with umbrellas moth-eaten by the rains of the recent war. It was a human pleasure to be with them, because they jumped over the laws of the trade and had the luxury of losing a good customer to go with us to have a well-discussed coffee at the corner bar or to ride in the carriages of rent along the paths of the park, or to grieve the dethroned kings and their tragic lovers who rode at dusk in the gallop patio. More than once we served as interpreters with a gringo gringo. It was not for them that we took Margarito Duarte to Villa Borghese, but so that he could meet the lion. He lived in freedom on a desert island surrounded by a deep moat, and as soon as he spotted us on the other shore he began to roar with a disquiet that surprised his guardian. Visitors to the park came surprised. The tenor tried to identify with his morning chest sea, but the lion paid him no heed. He seemed to roar at all of us without distinction, but the watchman realized instantly that he was only roaring for Margarito. So it was, wherever he moved the lion moved, and as soon as he hid he stopped roaring. The watchman, who was a doctor of classical letters from the University of Siena, thought that Margarito must have been with other lions that day who had contaminated him with their scent. Apart from that explanation, which was invalid, he could think of no other. In any case, he said, they are not roars of war but of compassion. However, what impressed the tenor Ribera Silva was not that supernatural episode, but Margarito's shock when they stopped to talk with the girls in the park. He commented on it at the table, and some out of mischief and others out of understanding, we agreed that it would be a good deed to help Margarito resolve his loneliness. Moved by the weakness of our hearts, Maria Bella clutched her biblical madrasa breast with her hands stoned with fancy rings. I'd do it out of charity, he said, 
if it weren't for the fact that I've never been able to beat men who wear vests. That is how the tenor passed through the Villa Borghese at two in the afternoon, and took the butterfly on the back of his scooter that seemed most conducive to giving Margarito Duarte an hour of good company. He made her undress in his bedroom, bathed her with scented soap, dried her, perfumed her with his personal eau de toilette, and powdered her whole body with his camphor aftershave talc. Finally, he paid her for the time they had already taken in an hour more, and she told him letter by letter what to do. The naked beauty tiptoed through the darkened house, like a nap dream, and gently tapped the back bedroom. Margarito Duarte, barefoot and shirtless, opened the door. Buona sera Giovanotto, she told him in a schoolgirl voice and manner. My manda il tenore. Margarito assimilated the blow with great dignity. He finished opening the door to let her in, and she stretched out on the bed as he hurriedly pulled on his shirt and shoes to serve her with all due respect. Then he sat down next to her on a chair, and started the conversation. Surprised, the girl told him to hurry, as they only had an hour. He didn't take notice. The girl said later that she would have stayed as long as he wanted without charging him a penny anyway, because there could not be a better behaved man in the world. Not knowing what to do in the meantime, he scanned the room with his eyes, and discovered the wooden case on the fireplace. He asked if it was a saxophone. Margarito did not answer him, but opened the blind to let in a little light, carried the case to the bed, and lifted the lid. The girl tried to say something, but her jaw dropped. Or as he told us later, me es igelo y el culo. She escaped in terror but made a wrong direction in the corridor, and met Aunt Antonietta who was going to put a new light bulb in the lamp in my room. The fright of both was such that the girl did not dare to leave the tenor's room until late at night. Aunt Antonietta never knew what happened. She came into my room so scared that she couldn't screw the light bulb into the lamp because of the shaking of her hands. I asked him what was wrong with him. It is that in this house they are scary, he told me and now in broad daylight. He told me with great conviction that, during the war, a German officer cut his lover's throat in the room that the tenor occupied. Many times, while walking in her offices, Aunt Antoinette had seen the appearance of the murdered beauty collecting her steps through the corridors. I just saw her bawling down the corridor, he said. It was identical. The city resumed its routine in the fall. The flowery terraces of summer closed with the first wines, and the tenor and I returned to the old Trastevere tractor house where we used to dine with the singing students of Count Cario Calcagni, and some of my colleagues from film school. Among the latter, the most assiduous was Lachis, an intelligent and sympathetic Greek whose only stumbling block was his numbing speeches about social injustice. Fortunately, Tenors and sopranos almost always managed to defeat him with pieces of opera sung at the top of their voices, which nevertheless did not disturb anyone even after midnight. On the contrary, some passing night owls joined the chorus, and windows were opened in the neighborhood to applaud. One night, while we were singing, Margarito came in on tiptoe so as not to interrupt us. She carried the pine case that she had not had time to leave at the boarding house after showing the saint to the parish priest of San Juan de Latran, whose influence before the sacred congregation of the rite was in the public domain. I caught a glimpse of him putting it under a secluded table, and he sat down while we finished singing. As always happens at the stroke of midnight, we put together several tables when the tractor unit began to vacate, and those of us who sang, those of us who talked about movies, and everyone's friends stayed together. And among them, Margarito Duarte, who was already known there as the silent and sad Colombian of whom no one knew anything. Lakis, intrigued, asked him if he played the cello. I was overwhelmed by what seemed like an indiscretion difficult to avoid. The tenor, as uncomfortable as I, could not mend the situation. Margarito was the only one who took the question naturally. It's not a cello he said. It is the saint. He put the box on the table, opened the padlock, and lifted the lid. A flurry of stupor shook the restaurant. The other customers, the waiters, and finally the people from the kitchen in their bloody aprons, gathered in astonishment to contemplate the prodigy. 
some crossed themselves. One of the cooks knelt with her hands together, shaking with fever, and prayed silently. However, after the initial shock, we became embroiled in a shouting match about the insufficiency of holiness in our times. Lachis, of course, was the most radical. The only thing that became clear at the end was his idea of making a critical film with the theme of the saint. I'm sure, he said, that old Cesar would not let this issue escape. He was referring to Cesar Zavadani, our story and script teacher, one of the greats in the history of cinema and the only one who maintained a personal relationship with us outside of school. He tried to teach us not only the trade, but a different way of looking at life. It was a machine for thinking arguments. They were gushing out, almost against his will. And in such a hurry, that he always needed someone's help to think them out loud and catch them on the fly. Only when he finished them his spirits fell. Too bad it has to be filmed, he said. Well, I thought that on screen it would lose a lot of its original magic. He kept the ideas on cards arranged by subject and pinned to the walls, and he had so many that they took up a bedroom in his house. The following Saturday we went to see him with Margarito Duarte. He had such a sweet tooth that we found him at the door of his house on Calle Angela Merici, burning with anxiety at the idea we had announced to him on the phone. He did not even greet us with the usual kindness, but led Margarito to a prepared table, and he opened the case himself. Then what we least imagined happened. Instead of going mad, predictably, he suffered a kind of mental paralysis. Amaza. He murmured in horror. He looked at the saint in silence for two or three minutes, closed the box himself, and without saying anything he led Margarito to the door, like a child taking its first steps. He dismissed him with a pat on the back. Thank you, son, thank you very much, he said. And may God be with you in your fight. When he closed the door he turned to us, and gave us his verdict. It's not good for the movies, he said. Nobody would believe it. That surprising lesson accompanied us on the tram back. If he said it, there was no need to think about it, the story was useless. However, Maria Bella received us with the urgent message that Zaved and I was waiting for us that same night, but without Margarito. We find him in one of his stellar moments. Lakis had brought two or three classmates, but he didn't even seem to see them when he opened the door. Got it, he yelled. The movie will be a cannonball if Margarito performs the miracle of resurrecting the girl. In the movie or in life? Asked. He suppressed the annoyance. Don't be silly, he told me. But immediately we saw the flash of an irresistible idea in his eyes. Unless I am able to resurrect her in real life, he said, seriously reflecting. I should try. It was just an instant temptation, before picking up the thread. He began pacing around the house, like a happy madman, gesturing with his hands and reciting the movie aloud. We listened to him in a daze, with the impression of seeing the images like phosphorescent birds that escaped him in droves and flew madly throughout the house. One night, he said, when about twenty popes who did not receive him have died, Margarito enters his house, tired and old, opens the box, caresses the dead woman's face, and says to her with all the tenderness in the world for the love of your father, my daughter, get up and walk. He looked at us all, and finished with a triumphant gesture. And the girl gets up. Something expected of us. But we were so puzzled that we couldn't find what to say. Except for Lachis, the Greek, who raised his finger, as in school, to ask to speak. My problem is that I don't think so, he said and to our surprise, he turned straight to Zavadani. Then it was Zavadani who was stunned. And why not? What do I know, Lachis said in anguish. It's just that it cannot be. Amaza. The teacher shouted then, with a roar that must have been heard throughout the entire neighborhood. That's what bothers me the most about the Stalmists, that they don't believe in reality. In the following fifteen years, According to what he himself told me, Margarito took the saint to Castel Gondolfo in case he had the opportunity to show her. 
In an audience of about 200 pilgrims from Latin America he managed to tell his story, between shoves and elbows, to the benevolent John XXIII. But he could not show the girl because he had to leave her at the entrance, along with the backpacks of other pilgrims, in anticipation of an attack. The Pope listened to him as carefully as possible in the crowd, and gave him a pat of encouragement on the cheek. Bravo, I'm mine, he said. God will reward your perseverance. However, when he really felt on the eve of realizing his dream was during the fleeting reign of the smiling albino Luciani. A relative of this, impressed by the story of Margarito, promised his mediation. Nobody paid any attention to him. But two days later, while they were having lunch, someone called the pension with a quick and simple message for Margarito, he should not move from Rome because before Thursday he would be called from the Vatican for a private audience. It was never known if it was a joke. Margarito believed not, and was alert. He did not leave the house. If he had to go to the bathroom, he would announce it out loud, I'm going to the bathroom. Maria Bella, always funny in the early dawn of old age, gave her free woman's laugh. We already know, Margarito, he shouted in case the Pope calls you. The following week, two days before the announced call, Margarito collapsed before the headline of the newspaper that was slipped under the door, Morto I L Papa. For a moment he was held in suspense by the illusion that it was an outdated newspaper that they had brought by mistake, since it was not easy to believe that a Pope died every month. But that's how it was, the smiling albino Luciani, chosen 33 days earlier had awakened dead in his bed. I returned to Rome twenty-two years after meeting Margarito Duarte, and perhaps I would not have thought of him if I had not found him by chance. I was too oppressed by the ravages of time to think of anyone. A silly drizzle like lukewarm broth fell incessantly, the diamond light of other times had become cloudy, and the places that had been mine and sustained my nostalgia were other and alien. The house where the pension was still the same but no one gave a reason for Maria Bella. No one answered six phone numbers that tenor Ribeiro Silva had sent me over the years. At a lunch with the new movie people I evoked the memory of my teacher, and a sudden silence fluttered over the table for an instant, until someone dared to say. Zaved and I. My felt. That's right, no one had ever heard of him. The trees of the Villa Borghese were shaggy in the rain, the gallop of sad princesses had been eaten up by a flowerless undergrowth, and the beauties of yore had been replaced by androgynous athletes in Manolo transvestites. The only survivor of an extinct fauna was the old lion, mangy and cold, on his island of withered waters. Nobody sang or died of love in the laminated tractors of the Plaza de España. For the Rome of our nostalgia was already another ancient Rome within the ancient Rome of the Caesars. Suddenly, a voice that could come from beyond stopped me in my tracks in a small street in Trastevere. Hello, poet. It was him, old and tired. Five popes had died, eternal Rome was showing the first symptoms of decrepitude, and he was still waiting. I have waited so long that it cannot be much more, he told me when he said goodbye, after almost four hours of longing. It could be a matter of months. He shuffled down the middle of the street wearing his war boots and faded old Roman cap, not caring about the rain puddles where the light was beginning to rot. Then I no longer had any doubt, if I ever did, that he was the saint. Without realizing it, through the insurrupt body of his daughter, he had already been fighting for twenty-two years in life for the legitimate cause of his own canonization. August 1981 The Plain of the Sleeping Beauty She was beautiful, springy with tender skin the color of bread and eyes of green almonds, and she had straight black hair down her back, and an aura of antiquity that could be just as Indonesian as it was from the Andes. She was dressed with subtle taste, a lynx jacket, a natural silk blouse with very faint flowers, ecru linen pants, and linear shoes the color of bougainvilleas. This is the most beautiful woman I have ever seen, I thought as I watched her pass with her stealthy lioness strides as I queued to board the New York plane at Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris. It was a supernatural apparition that existed for only an instant and disappeared into the crowd in the lobby. It was 9 am. 
It had been snowing since the night before, and the traffic was heavier than usual on the city streets, and slower still on the freeway, and there were freight trucks lined up on the shore, and smoldering cars in the snow. In the airport lobby, on the other hand, life went on in spring. I was in the registration line behind an elderly Dutch woman who spent almost an hour discussing the weight of her eleven suitcases. I was getting bored when I saw the instantaneous apparition that took my breath away, so I didn't know how the altercation ended, until the clerk brought me down from the clouds with a reproach for my distraction. By way of apology I asked him if he believed in love at first sight. Sure you do, he told me. The impossible are the others. He kept staring at the computer screen, asking me which seat I preferred, smoking or no smoking. I don't care, I said meaningfully, as long as it's not next to the eleven suitcases. She thanked him with a commercial smile without taking her eyes off the phosphorescent screen. Pick a number, he said, three, four or seven. Dash four. His smile had a triumphant gleam. In fifteen years I've been here. I said first that she doesn't choose seven. He marked the seat number on the boarding pass and handed it to me with the rest of my papers, looking at me for the first time with grape-colored eyes that served me as consolation as I saw the beauty again. Only then did he warn me that the airport had just closed and all flights were deferred. Even when. Until God willing, he said with his smile. The radio announced this morning that it will be the biggest snowfall of the year. He was wrong it was the largest of the century. But in the first-class waiting room, spring was so real that there were live roses in the vases and even the canned music seemed as sublime and sedating as its creators intended. Suddenly it occurred to me that this was a suitable refuge for the beauty, and I looked for her in the other rooms, shaken by my own audacity. But most were real-life men reading English newspapers while their wives thought of others, gazing at dead planes in the snow through panoramic windows gazing at the glacial factories, the vast fields of Rawasi ravaged by lions. Afternoon there was no space available, and the heat had become so unbearable that I escaped to breathe. Outside I found a breathtaking sight. People of all laws had overflowed the waiting rooms, and were camped in the suffocating corridors, and even on the stairs, sprawled on the floors with their animals and children, and their travel gear. For also communication with the city was interrupted, and the transparent plastic palace looked like an immense space capsule beached in the storm. I couldn't help the idea that the beauty, too, must be somewhere in the midst of those meek hordes, and that fantasy gave me new courage to wait. By lunchtime we had assumed our castaway consciousness. The queues became endless in front of the seven restaurants, the cafes, the crowded bars, and in less than three hours they had to close them because there was nothing to eat or drink. The children, who for a moment seemed to be everyone in the world, began to cry at the same time, and the smell of herd began to rise from the crowd. It was the time of instincts. The only thing I managed to eat in the middle of the scramble were the last two glasses of ice cream in a children's store. I drank them little by little at the counter, while the waiters put the chairs on the tables as they cleared, and seeing myself in the mirror at the back, with the last small cardboard cup and the last cardboard spoon, and thinking of the beautiful. The New York flight, scheduled for 11 in the morning, left at 8 at night. When I finally got on board, the first-class passengers were already in place, and a stewardess led me to mine. I stayed without breath. In the neighboring armchair, next to the window, the beauty was taking possession of her space with the dominance of expert travelers. If I ever wrote this, no one would believe me, I thought. And I barely tried in my half-tongue an indecisive greeting that she did not perceive. He settled down to live for many years, putting everything in its place and in its order, until the place was as well arranged as the ideal house where everything was at hand. As he did so, the purser brought us the welcome champagne. I took a glass to offer it to her, but regretted it in time. Well. She only wanted a glass of water, and she asked the purser, first in inaccessible French and then in slightly easier English, not to wake her for any reason during the flight. His deep, warm voice carried an oriental sadness. When the water was brought to him, 
he opened on his knees a chest of dresser with copper corners, like the trunks of grandmothers, and took out two golden pills from a case where he carried others of different colors. She did everything in a methodical and leisurely way, as if there was nothing that had not been planned for her from birth. Finally he lowered the window curtain, extended the armchair to the maximum, covered himself with the blanket up to his waist without taking off his shoes, put on his sleep mask, lay on his side in the armchair, with his back to me, and he slept without a single pause, without a sigh, without a slight change in position, during the eternal eight hours and the spare twelve minutes that the flight to New York lasted. It was an intense journey. I have always believed that there is nothing more beautiful in nature than a beautiful woman, so that it was impossible for me to escape for a moment the spell of that fabled creature that slept next to me. The purser had disappeared as soon as we took off, and was replaced by a Cartesian stewardess who tried to wake the beauty to give her the dressing case and headphones for the music. I repeated the warning she had given to the purser, but the stewardess insisted to hear from herself that she didn't want dinner either. The flight attendant had to confirm it, and even so he reprimanded me because the beauty had not hung the little card around her neck with the order not to wake her up. I made a lonely dinner, silently telling myself everything I would have said to her if she had been awake. His sleep was so stable that at one point I had the concern that the pills he had taken were not to sleep but to die. Before each drink, he would raise his glass and toast. To your health, Bella. After dinner they turned off the lights, they gave the movie to no one, and the two of us were left alone in the gloom of the world. The greatest storm of the century had passed, and the Atlantic night was vast and limpid, and the plain seemed motionless among the stars. Then I contemplated her inch by inch for several hours, and the only sign of life that I could perceive were the shadows of dreams that passed over her forehead like clouds on water. She had a chain around her neck so fine that it was almost invisible on her golden skin, her ears were perfect without stitches for earrings, her pink nails of good health, and a plain ring on her left hand. Since he looked no more than twenty years old, I consoled myself with the idea that it was not a wedding ring but a temporary engagement ring. Knowing that you sleep, certain, sure, faithful channel of abandonment, pure line, so close to my bound arms, I thought, repeating Gerardo Diego's magisterial sonnet on the crest of champagne foam. Then I extended the armchair to hers, and we lay closer than in a double bed. The climate of her breathing was the same as that of her voice, and her kneel exhaled a faint breath that could only be the scent of her beauty. It seemed incredible to me, the previous spring I had read a beautiful novel by Yasunari Kawabata about the old bourgeois of Kyoto who they paid huge sums to spend the night contemplating the most beautiful girls in the city, naked and drugged, while they died of love in the same bed. They couldn't wake them, couldn't touch them, and they didn't even try, because the essence of pleasure was watching them sleep. That night, watching over the beauty of the beauty, I not only understood that senile refinement, but also lived it to the full. Who would believe it, I said to myself my self-esteem exacerbated by champagne. Me, an old Japanese man by now. I think I slept for several hours, overcome by the champagne and the silent flashes of the film, and woke up with a cracked head. I went to the bathroom. Two places behind mine lay the old woman with the eleven suitcases sprawled badly on the armchair. He looked like a dead man forgotten on the battlefield. On the floor in the middle of the hall were her reading glasses with the colored bead necklace, and for a moment I enjoyed the petty bliss of not picking them up. After venting off the excesses of champagne, I found myself in the mirror, unworthy and ugly, and I was amazed that the ravages of love were so terrible. Suddenly the plane sank, straightened up as best it could, and continued to fly at a gallop. The command to return to the seat came on. I stampeded with the illusion that only the turbulence of God would awaken the beauty, and that she would have to take refuge in my arms fleeing from terror. In the rush I was about to step on the Dutchman's glasses, and I would have been happy. But I retraced my steps, picked them up, and put them on her lap, suddenly grateful that she hadn't chosen seat number four before me. The beauty's dream was invincible. When the plane stabilized, I had to resist the temptation to shake her on any pretext 
because all I wanted in that last hour of flight was to see her awake, even if she was enraged, so that I could regain my freedom, and perhaps my youth. But I was not able. Damn, I told myself, with great contempt. Why wasn't I born a Taurus? She awoke unaided the instant the landing announcements went on, and she was as beautiful and lush as if she had slept in a rose bush. It was only then that I realized that neighbors sitting on airplanes, like old married couples, do not. Good morning when you wake up. Neither did she. She took off her mask, opened her beaming eyes, straightened the easy chair, tossed the blanket aside, brushed off her self-combing mane with her own weight, put the chest back on her knees, and did a quick makeup and superfluous, which was just enough for him not to look at me until the door was opened. Then he put on his lynx jacket, passed almost over me with a conventional apology in pure Spanish from the Americas, and left without even saying goodbye, without thanking me at least for how much I did for our happy night, and disappeared until the sun today in the Amazon of New York. June 1982 I rent to dream. At nine o'clock in the morning, while we were having breakfast on the terrace of the Habana Riviera, a tremendous blow of the sea in full sun lifted several cars that were passing by the avenue of the Malacan, or that were parked on the sidewalk, and one was embedded in one flank of the hotel. It was like an explosion of dynamite that spread panic throughout the twenty-story building and turned the stained glass window in the lobby to dust. The many tourists in the waiting room were thrown into the air along with the furniture, and some were injured by the hailstorm of glass. It had to be a colossal shock because between the wall of the boardwalk and the hotel there is a wide avenue back and forth, so the wave jumped over it and it still had enough strength to crumble the stained glass. The cheerful Cuban volunteers, with the help of firefighters, collected the damage in less than six hours, closed the sea gate and opened another, and everything was in order again. No one had taken care of the car embedded in the wall, as it was thought to be one of those parked on the sidewalk but when the crane pulled it out of the embrasure they discovered the body of one woman tied up in the driver's seat with a seat belt. The blow was so brutal that he did not have a whole bone left. She had a ragged face, ripped ankle boots and tattered clothes, and a gold ring in the shape of a snake with emerald eyes. The police established that she was the housekeeper for the new Portuguese ambassadors. In fact, he had arrived with them in Havana a fortnight before and had left that morning for the market driving a new car. His name didn't say anything to me when I read the news in the newspapers, but instead I was intrigued by the snake-shaped ring and emerald eyes. I couldn't figure out, however, which finger he was wearing it on. It was a decisive fact, because I feared that she was an unforgettable woman whose real name I never knew, who wore the same ring on the right index finger, which was even more unusual at that time. He had met her 34 years earlier in Vienna, eating sausage with boiled potatoes and drinking draft beer in a Latino student tavern. I had arrived from Rome that morning, and I still remember my immediate impression of her splendid soprano breast, her languid fox tails on the collar of her coat, and that serpentine Egyptian ring. It seemed to me that she was the only Austrian in the long wooden counter, because of the primary Castilian who spoke without breathing with a hardware accent. But no, she had been born in Colombia and had gone to Austria between the two wars, if she was a child, to study music and singing. At that time she was in her bad thirties, for she should never have been beautiful and she had started to age before her time. But instead he was a lovely human being. And also one of the most fearsome. Vienna was still an ancient imperial city, whose geographical position between the two irreconcilable worlds left by the Second War had just made it a haven for the black market and world espionage. I could not have imagined a more suitable setting for that runaway compatriot who continued to eat at the student tavern on the corner just out of fidelity to her origin, since she had plenty of resources to buy it for cash with all her guests inside. She never said her real name because we always knew her with the Germanic tongue twister invented for her by the Latin students of Vienna, Frau Frieda. They had hardly introduced her to me when I incurred the happy impertinence of asking her how she had managed to establish herself in such a way in that world so distant and different from its cliffs of Quindio wines, and she answered me with a blow, I rent to dream. Actually, 
it was his only trade. She had been the third of eleven children of a prosperous shopkeeper in the old Caldas, and since she learned to speak she established in the house the good habit of counting dreams on an empty stomach, which is the time when her premonitory virtues are most purely preserved. At the age of seven he dreamed that one of his brothers was swept away by a torrent. The mother, out of pure religious superstition, forbade the boy what he liked best, which was to bathe in the ravine. But Frau Frieda already had her own prediction system. What that dream means, he said, is not that he is going to drown, but that he must not eat sweets. The performance alone seemed infamy, when it was for a five-year-old who couldn't live without his Sunday goodies. The mother, already convinced of the daughter's divinatory virtues, enforced the warning with a heavy hand. But at his first oversight the boy choked on a candy marble that he was eating secretly, and it was not possible to save him. Frau Frieda had not thought that this faculty could be a profession, until life grabbed her by the neck in the cruel winters of Vienna. Then she touched to ask for a job in the first house she liked to live in, and when they asked her what she knew how to do, she only told the truth, dream. A brief explanation was enough for the hostess to be accepted, with a salary barely enough for minor expenses, but with a good room and three meals. Especially breakfast, which was the time when the family sat down to learn about the immediate destiny of each of its members, the father, who was a refined rentier, the mother, a happy and passionate woman of romantic chamber music, and two children of eleven and nine years old. All were religious, and therefore prone to archaic superstitions, and they delightedly received Frau Frieda with the sole commitment of deciphering the daily destiny of the family through dreams. He did it well and for a long time, especially in the war years, when reality was more sinister than nightmares. Only she could decide at breakfast what each one should do that day, and how she should do it, until her predictions ended up being the only authority in the house. His dominance over the family was absolute, even the slightest sigh was at his command. During the days when I was in Vienna, the owner of the house had just died, and he had had the grace to bequeath to her a part of his income, on the sole condition that she continue dreaming for the family until the end of her dreams. I was in Vienna for more than a month, sharing the difficulties of the students, while I waited for money that never came. Frau Frieda's generous and unexpected visits to the tavern were then like parties in our regime of hardship. One of those nights, in the euphoria of the beer, he spoke into my ear with a conviction that allowed no loss of time. I just came to tell you that I had a dream about you last night, he said. You must leave at once and not return to Vienna for the next five years. His conviction was so real that that very night he boarded the last train for Rome. I, for my part, was so suggested, that since then I have considered myself a survivor of a disaster I never knew. I have not yet returned to Vienna. Before the disaster in Havana, I had seen Frau Frieda in Barcelona in such an unexpected and casual way that it seemed mysterious to me. It was the day that Pablo Neruda set foot on Spanish soil for the first time since the Civil War, on the scale of a slow sea voyage to Valparaiso. He spent a morning hunting big game with us in the old-fashioned bookstores, and in Porter he bought an old book, dismantled and withered, for which he paid what would have been his two-month salary at the Ranagun Consulate. He moved among people like an invalid elephant, with a childish interest in the internal mechanism of each thing, for the world seemed to him an immense wind-up toy with which life was invented. I have not met anyone more like the idea one has of a Renaissance Pope, gluttonous and refined. Even against his will, it was always he who presided over the table. Matilda, his wife, put on him a bib that looked more like a hairdresser than a dining room, but it was the only way to prevent him from bathing in sauces. That day in Carvalera's was exemplary. He ate three whole lobsters, butchering them with the mastery of a surgeon, and at the same time he devoured everyone's dishes with his eyes, and was nibbling a little of each one, with a delight that infected the desire to eat, the clams of Galicia, the barnacles from the Cantabrian Sea, Norway lobster from Alicante, Espardnias from the Costa Brava. Meanwhile, like the French, he only spoke of other culinary delicacies, and especially the prehistoric seafood from Chile that he carried in his heart. Suddenly he stopped eating, tuned his lobster antennae, 
and said in a very low voice, someone behind me who does not stop looking at me. I looked over his shoulder, and so it was. Behind him, three tables away, a fearless woman in an old-fashioned felt hat and purple scarf. She chewed slowly with her eyes fixed on him. I recognized her on the spot. She was old and fat, but it was her, with the snake ring on her forefinger. He was traveling from Naples on the same ship as the Neruda, but they had not seen each other on board. We invited her to have coffee at our table, and I induced her to talk about her dreams to surprise the poet. He ignored her, since he stated from the beginning that he did not believe in fortune-telling. Only poetry is clairvoyant, he said. After lunch, on the inevitable walk down the Ramblas, I purposely delayed with Frau Frieda to refresh our memories without strange ears. She told me that she had sold her Austrian properties, and was living in retirement in Porto, Portugal, in a house that she described as a fake castle on a hill from where you could see the entire ocean to the Americas. Even if he did not say it, it was clear from his conversation that from dream to dream he had ended up seizing the fortune of his ineffable patrons in Vienna. I was not impressed, however, because he had always thought that his dreams were nothing more than a ruse to live. And I told him. She gave her irresistible laugh. You're still as daring as ever, he told me. And he said no more, because the rest of the group had stopped to wait for Neruda to finish speaking in Chilean slang with the parrots on the Rambla de los Pajaros. When we resumed our talk, Frau Frida had changed the subject. By the way, he said, you can go back to Vienna now. Only then did I realize that thirteen years had passed since we met. Even if your dreams are false, I'll never go back, I told him. Just in case. At three o'clock we parted ways with her to accompany Neruda to his sacred nap. She made it at our home, after some solemn preparations that somehow resembled the tea ceremony in Japan. You had to open some windows and close others so that there was the exact degree of heat and a certain kind of light in a certain direction, and absolute silence. Neruda fell asleep instantly, and woke up ten minutes later, like children, when we least expected. He appeared in the living room restored and with the monogram of the pillow printed on his cheek. I dreamed of that dreaming woman, he said. Matilda wanted me to tell her about the dream. I dreamed she was dreaming about me, he said. That's from Borges, I told him. He looked at me disenchanted. Is it already written? If it's not written, he's going to write it sometime, I told him. It will be one of his mazes. As soon as he got on board, at six in the afternoon, Neruda said goodbye to us, sat at a secluded table, and began to write fluid verses with the green ink pen with which he drew flowers and fish and birds in the dedications of his books. At the first warning from the ship, we looked for Frau Frieda, and we finally found her on the tourist deck when we were leaving without saying goodbye. She, too, had just woken up from her nap. I dreamed of the poet, he told us. Amazed, I asked him to tell me about the dream. I dreamed he was dreaming about me, she said, and my astonished face confused her. What do you want? Sometimes, among so many dreams, one sneaks up on us that has nothing to do with real life. I didn't see her again or wonder about her until I learned of the snake-shaped ring of the woman who died in the wreck of the Hotel Riviera. So I could not resist the temptation to ask the Portuguese ambassador questions when we met, months later, at a diplomatic reception. The ambassador spoke to me about her with great enthusiasm and enormous admiration. You can't imagine how extraordinary it was, he told me. You would not have resisted the temptation to write a story about her. And it continued in the same tone, with surprising details, but without a clue that would allow me a final conclusion. Specifically, I finally asked him, what was he doing? Nothing, he told me, with a certain disappointment. Dreamed. March 1980. I only came to talk on the phone. One spring rainy afternoon, when she was traveling alone to Barcelona driving a rented car, Maria de la Luz Cervantes suffered a breakdown in the Monegros desert. She was a 27-year-old Mexican, 
pretty and serious, who years before had had a certain name as a variety actress. She was married to a parlor conjurer, whom she was going to meet that day after visiting relatives in Zaragoza. After an hour of desperate beckoning to cars and freight trucks rushing by in the storm, the driver of a rickety bus took pity on her. He warned him, yes, that he was not going very far. It doesn't matter, Maria said. All I need is a phone. It was true, and she only needed it to warn her husband that she would not arrive before seven at night. She looked like a soaked little bird, wearing a student coat and beach shoes in April, and she was so stunned by the mishap that she forgot to take her car keys. A woman who was traveling with the driver, military-looking but sweet, gave him a towel and a blanket, and made a place for him next to him. After half-drying herself, Maria sat up, wrapped herself in the blanket, and tried to light a cigarette, but the matches were wet. The neighbor on the seat gave him a light and asked for one of the few cigarettes that remained dry. As they smoked, Maria gave in to the urge to vent, and her voice resounded louder than the rain and the rattle of the bus. The woman interrupted her with her index finger on her lips. They are asleep, he murmured. Maria looked over her shoulder, and saw that the bus was occupied by women of uncertain ages and different conditions, who slept wrapped in blankets the same as hers. Contaminated by his placidity, Maria curled up in the seat and abandoned herself to the sound of the rain. When he awoke it was night and the downpour had dissolved into icy serenity. He had no idea how long it had been. Asleep or where in the world they were. His seat neighbor had an alert demeanor. Where we are? Maria asked him. We have arrived, the woman replied. The bus was entering the cobbled courtyard of a huge, gloomy building that looked like an old convent in a forest of colossal trees. The female passengers, lit only by a lantern in the courtyard, remained motionless until the military-looking woman brought them down with a system of primary orders, as in a nursery school. They were all older moving so slowly in the gloom of the courtyard that they looked like images from a dream. Maria, the last to descend, thought they were nuns. He thought less of it when he saw several women in uniform who received them at the door of the bus, and they covered their heads with the blankets so that they did not get wet, and they put them in single file, directing them without speaking, with rhythmic and peremptory claps. After saying goodbye to her neighbor, Maria wanted to return the blanket, but she told her to cover her head to cross the patio, and return it at the goal. Will there be a phone? Maria asked him. Of course, the woman said. Right there they indicate. He asked Maria for another cigarette, and she gave him the rest of the wet pack. On the way they dry up, he told her. The woman waved goodbye from the stirrup, and almost yelled, Good luck. The bus started without giving him extra time. Maria started running toward the entrance of the building. A guardian tried to stop her with a forceful slap, but had to appeal to an imperious cry, Stop I said. Maria looked under the blanket, and saw icy eyes and an unappealable index that indicated the row. He obeyed. In the hallway of the building, he separated from the group and asked the doorman where there was a telephone. One of the guards made her return to the line with a pat on the back while saying in very sweet ways. Over here, sweetie, over here is a telephone. Maria followed the other women down a dark corridor, and at the end entered a collective bedroom where the guards gathered up the blankets and began to distribute the beds. A different woman, who seemed more humane and of a higher hierarchy to Maria, walked down the line, comparing a list with the names that the new arrivals had written on a cardboard sewn into the bodice. When he arrived in front of Maria, he was surprised that he did not have his identification. I just came to talk on the phone, Maria told him. He hurriedly explained that his car had broken down on the road. The husband, who was a party magician, was waiting for her in Barcelona to fulfill three commitments until midnight, and he wanted to warn her that he would not be on time to accompany him. It was going to be seven. He was due to leave the house in ten minutes and she was afraid he would cancel everything because of her delay. The guardian seemed to listen carefully. What's your name? She asked him. Maria told her his name with a sigh of relief, 
but the woman couldn't find it after going through the list several times. She asked a guardian in alarm, and she, without anything to say, shrugged her shoulders. I just came to talk on the phone, said Maria. Okay, nice, said the superior, leading her to her bed with a sweetness too obvious to be real, if you behave well you can talk on the phone with whoever you want. But not now, tomorrow. Then something happened in Maria's mind that made her understand why the women on the bus were moving like in the bottom of an aquarium. In fact, they were appeased with sedatives, and this shadowy palace, with its thick stone walls and icy staircases, was actually a hospital for the mentally ill. Scared, she ran out of the bedroom, and before reaching the gate a guard. Gigantic in a mechanic's overalls caught her with a claw and pinned her to the ground with a skeleton key. Maria stared at her, paralyzed with terror. For the love of God, he said. I swear by my dead mother I just came to talk on the phone. It was enough for him to see her face to know that there was no possible plea in the face of that Mameluke freak who was called Herculina because of her enormous strength. She was in charge of difficult cases, and two inmates had been strangled to death with her polar bear arm trained in the art of careless killing. The first case was resolved as a proven accident. The second was less clear, and Herculina was admonished and warned that next time she would be thoroughly investigated. The current version was that that lost sheep of a family with large surnames had a murky career of dubious accidents in various asylums of Spain. In order for Maria to sleep the first night, they had to inject her with a sleeping pill. Before dawn, when she was awakened by the urge to smoke, she was bound by the wrists and ankles on the bars of the bed. Nobody attend the shouting. In the morning, while the husband found no clue to her whereabouts in Barcelona, they had to take her to the infirmary, as they found her senseless in a swamp of her own miseries. He didn't know how long it had been when he came to. But then the world was a haven of love, and in front of his bed was a monumental old man, with a plantigrade gait and a sedative smile, who with two master passes restored him the joy of living. He was the director of the sanatorium. Before saying anything to him, without even greeting him, Maria asked him for a cigarette. He gave it to her on, and gave her the nearly full package. Maria couldn't hold back crying. Take advantage now to cry as much as you want, the doctor told him in a numbing voice. There is no better remedy than tears. Maria unburdened herself without shame, as she never managed to do with her casual lovers in the aftermath of love. While listening to her, the doctor combed her hair with his fingers, he arranged the pillow for her to breathe easier, he guided her through the labyrinth of her uncertainty with a wisdom and a sweetness that she had never dreamed of. It was, for the first time in her life, the wonder of being understood by a man who listened to her with all his soul without expecting the reward of sleeping with her. After a long hour, thoroughly unburdened, she asked him for permission to speak to her husband on the phone. The medic stood with all the majesty of his rank. Not yet, queen, he told her, giving her the most tender pat on the cheek she had ever felt. Everything will be done in good time. He gave him an episcopal blessing from the door, and he disappeared forever. Trust me, he told her. That same afternoon, Maria was registered in the asylum with a serial number, and with a superficial comment about the enigma of her origin and the doubts about her identity. In the margin was a written qualification in the director's handwriting, agitated. Just as Maria had foreseen, the husband left his modest apartment in the Horta neighborhood half an hour late to fulfill the three commitments. It was the first time she hadn't arrived on time in nearly two years of a well-arranged free union, and he understood the delay because of the ferocity of the rains that ravaged the province that weekend. Before leaving, he left a message nailed to the door with the itinerary for the night. At the first party, with all the kids dressed up as kangaroo, he dispensed with the stellar trick of the invisible fish because he couldn't do it without her help. The second engagement was at the home of a 93-year-old woman, in a wheelchair, who prided herself on having celebrated each of her last 30 birthdays with a different magician. He was so upset with Maria's delay that he could not concentrate on the simplest lot. The third engagement was that of every night at a cafe concert on the Ramblas, 
where he performed uninspired for a group of French tourists who could not believe what they saw because they refused to believe in magic. After each performance he phoned home, and waited without illusions for Maria to answer. In the last one, she could no longer suppress the concern that something bad had happened. On the way home in the truck adapted for public functions, he saw the splendor of spring in the palm trees of Paseo de Gracia, and the dark thought of what the city could be like without Maria shook him. The last hope was dashed when he found his message still posted on the door. He was so upset that he forgot to feed the cat. Only now that I am writing it do I realize that I never knew what he was really called, because in Barcelona we only knew him by his professional name, Satano El Mago. He was a man of strange character and with an irredeemable social awkwardness, but the tact and grace that he lacked were in abundance for Maria. It was she who led him by the hand in this community of great mysteries, where no one would have thought of calling anyone on the phone after midnight to ask about his wife. Saturn had done it when he had just come and he did not want to remember it. So that night he settled for calling Zaragoza, where a half-asleep grandmother answered without alarm that Maria had left after lunch. He slept no more than an hour at dawn. He had a muddy dream in which he saw Maria wearing a tattered wedding dress and spattered with blood, and he awoke with the dreadful certainty that she had left him alone again, and now forever, in the vast world without her. He had done it three times with three different men, including him, in the last five years. She had left him in Mexico City six months after meeting, when they were dying of happiness with an insane love in a maid's room in the Anzers neighborhood. One morning, Maria did not wake up at the house after a night of unspeakable abuse. He left everything that was hers, even the ring from his previous marriage, and a letter in which he said that he was not able to survive the torment of that foolish love. Saturn thought she had returned to her first husband, a high school classmate whom she secretly married as a minor, and whom she left for another after two loveless years. But no, she had returned to her parents' house, and there Saturn went to look for her at any cost. He begged her unconditionally, promised much more than he was determined to deliver, but stumbled upon an invincible determination. There are short loves and there are long loves, she told him. And he concluded mercilessly, this was short. He surrendered to her rigor. However, one morning on All Saints' Day, when he returned to his orphan room after almost a year of oblivion, he found her asleep on the living room sofa with the crown of orange blossoms and the long foam line of virgin brides. Maria told him the truth. The new boyfriend, widowed, childless, with a determined life and the willingness to marry forever by the Catholic Church, had left her dressed and waiting for him at the altar. His parents decided to have the party anyway. She played along. He danced, sang with the mariachis, had drinks, and in a terrible state of late remorse, he left at midnight to look for Saturn. She was not at home, but she found the keys in the flower pot in the corridor, where they were always hidden. This time it was she who surrendered unconditionally. And now until when? He asked her. She answered him with a verse by Vinicius de Morias, Love is eternal while it lasts. Two years later, it was still eternal. Maria seemed to mature. She gave up her dreams of an actress and devoted herself to him, both in the office and in bed. At the end of the previous year they had attended a congress of magicians in Perpigna, and on their return they met Barcelona. They liked it so much that they had been here for eight months, and it was doing so well, that they had bought an apartment in the very Catalan neighborhood of Horta, noisy and without a doorman, but with plenty of space for five children. Happiness had been possible, until the weekend when she rented a car and went to visit her relatives in Zaragoza with the promise of returning at seven o'clock on Monday night. At dawn on Thursday he had not yet shown any signs of life. The Monday of the following week the insurance company for the rental car telephoned the house to ask for Maria. I don't know anything, Saturn said. Look for her in Zaragoza. He hung up. A week later, a civilian police officer came to the house with the news that the car had been found in its bones, in a shortcut near Cadiz, 900 kilometers from the place where Maria abandoned it. The agent wanted to know if she had more details about the robbery. Saturn was feeding the cat, 
and he barely looked at him to tell him without further ado not to waste time, because his wife had run away from the house and he did not know with whom or to where. His conviction was such that the agent felt uncomfortable and apologized for his questions. The case was declared closed. The suspicion that Maria might leave again had assaulted Saturn for Easter in Catechase, where Rosa Regis had invited them to sail. We were in the Maritim, the crowded and seedy bar of the Gauche Divine in the twilight of the Franco regime, around one of those iron tables with iron chairs where we could barely fit six and sit twenty. After running out of the second pack of cigarettes of the day, Maria found herself out of matches. A scrawny, manly-haired arm with a Roman bronze slave woman pushed her way through the tumult of the table, setting it on fire. She thanked him without looking at who, but Saturn the magician saw him. He was a bony, hairless adolescent, with the pallor of the dead and a very black ponytail that hung at the waist. The windows of the bar could barely withstand the fury of the spring tramontana, but he was dressed in a kind of raw cotton street pajamas, and a pair of Labrador sandals. They didn't see him again until late fall, at a seafood inn in La Barcelonita, wearing the same coarse chintz ensemble and a long braid instead of the ponytail. He greeted them both like old friends, and from the way he kissed Maria, and from the way she reciprocated, Saturn was struck down by the suspicion that they had been secretly seeing each other. Days later he found by chance a new name and a telephone number written by Maria in the home directory, and the inclement lucidity of jealousy revealed who they were from. The intruder's social record ended up finishing him off, 22 years old, the only child of wealthy people, a fashionable shop window decorator, with an easy bisexual fame and a well-founded reputation as a rental comforter for married ladies. But he managed to get over it until the night Maria didn't come home. So she started calling him on the phone every day, first every two or three hours, from six in the morning until the next morning, and then whenever she found a phone handy. The fact that no one answered increased his martyrdom. On the fourth day, an Andalusian woman answered that she was only going to do the cleaning. The Senorito is gone, she told him, vague enough to drive him crazy. Saturn could not resist the temptation to ask if by any chance Miss Maria was not there. No Maria lives here, the woman told him. The young man is single. I know, he told her. It does not live, but sometimes it does. Or not. The woman reared. But who the hell is talking there? I. Saturn hung up. The woman's refusal seemed to him one more confirmation of what was no longer a suspicion to him but a burning certainty. Lost control. In the following days he called everyone he knew in Barcelona in alphabetical order. No one gave him reason, but each call aggravated his misery, because his delusions of jealousy were already famous among the unrepentant night owls of La Gauche Divine, and they answered him with any joke that made him suffer. Only then did he understand how alone he was in that beautiful, lunatic, impenetrable city, where he would never be happy. In the early morning, after feeding the cat, he clenched his heart not to die, and he made up his mind to forget Maria. At two months, Maria had not yet adjusted to life in the sanatorium. He survived just pecking at the jail pit with the cutlery chained to the raw wood counter and his gaze fixed on the lithograph of General Francisco Franco who presided over the gloomy medieval dining room. At first he resisted the canonical hours with his goofy routine of matins, lauds, vespers and other church services that occupied most of the time. She refused to play ball on the playground, and to work in the artificial flower shop that a group of inmates tended with frenzied diligence. But from the third week on, he gradually incorporated himself into the life of the cloister. After all, the doctors said, that is how they all began, and sooner or later ended up integrating into the community. The lack of cigarettes, solved in the first days by a guardian who sold them at a price of gold, haunted her again when the little money she carried ran out. Later, she consoled herself with the newspaper cigarettes that some inmates made from cigarette butts collected in the trash, since the obsession with smoking had become as intense as that of the telephone. The meager pesetas that he later earned by making artificial flowers afforded him fleeting relief. The hardest thing was the loneliness of the nights. Many inmates stayed awake in the shadows, like her, 
but without daring to do anything, since the night watchman also kept watch in the gate closed with a chain and padlock. One night, however, overwhelmed by grief, Maria asked in a voice enough for her bed neighbor to hear. Where we are? The grave and lucid voice of the neighbor answered him. In the deep underworld. They say this is the land of the Moors, said another distant voice that echoed across the room of the bedroom. And it must be true, because in summer, when there is a moon, you can hear the dogs barking at the sea. The chain on the ring sounded like a galleon anchor, and the door swung open. The guardian, the only being who seemed alive in the instantaneous silence, began to pace from one end of the bedroom to the other. Maria was shocked, and only she knew why. From his first week in the sanitarium, the night watchman had bluntly suggested that he sleep with her in the guard room. He began with a specific business tone, bartering love for cigarettes, for chocolates, for whatever. You will have everything, she would tell him tremulously. You will be the queen. Faced with Maria's rejection, the guardian changed her method. She left little love notes under her pillow, in the pockets of her robe, in the least expected places. They were messages of a heartbreaking urgency capable of shaking stones. She had seemed resigned to defeat for more than a month, the night the incident was promoted in the bedroom. When she was convinced that all the inmates were sleeping, the guardian approached Maria's bed, and murmured all kinds of tender obscenities in her ear, while she kissed her face, her neck tense with terror, her arms stiff, her legs exhausted. Finally, perhaps believing that Maria's paralysis was not one of fear but of complacency, he dared to go further. Maria then hit him with the back of her hand that sent her against the neighboring bed. The guard sat up in a rage amid the scandal of the rowdy inmates. Son of a bitch, he yelled. We will rot together in this pigsty until you go crazy for me. Summer came unannounced on the first Sunday in June, and emergency measures had to be taken, because suffocated inmates began to remove their sloops of this mina during mass. Maria watched with amusement the spectacle of the sick women in Pelota that the guards ran around the ships like blind hens. Amid the confusion, she tried to protect herself from missed blows, and not knowing how she found herself alone in an abandoned office with a phone that was ringing incessantly with a pleading ring. Maria answered without thinking, and heard a distant and smiling voice that was entertaining itself by imitating the telephone service of the hour. It's 45 hours, 92 minutes, and 107 seconds. Fag, said Maria. She hung up amused. He was leaving, when he realized that he was missing an unrepeatable occasion. Then she dialed six digits, in such a rush and in such a rush that she wasn't sure it was her home number. She waited with her heart pounding, heard the familiar ringing in its avid, sad tone, once, twice, three times, and finally heard the voice of the man of her life in the house without her. Well? He had to wait for the ball of tears that formed in his throat to pass. Rabbit, my dear, he sighed. The tears overcame her. On the other end of the line there was a brief, shocked silence, and the jealous voice spat out the word bitch. And he hung up dry. That night, in a frantic attack, Maria took down the lithograph of the Generalissimo in the refectory, threw it with all her might against the stained glass window in the garden, and collapsed bathed in blood. She still had enough anger to face blows with the guards who tried to subdue her, without succeeding, until she saw Herculina standing in the doorway, arms folded, looking at her. He gave up. However, they dragged her to the pavilion of the furious mad women, annihilated her with a hose of ice water, and injected turpentine into her legs. Unable to walk by the inflammation caused, Maria realized that there was nothing in the world that she was not able to do to escape from that hell. The following week, back in the common bedroom, she got up on tiptoe and played in the cell of the night watchman. Maria's price, demanded by her in advance, was to bring a message to her husband. The guardian agreed, as long as the deal was kept secret. And he pointed at her with an inexorable index. If it's ever known, you'll die. So Saturn the magician went to the madhouse the following Saturday, with the circus truck ready to celebrate the return of Mary. 
The director himself received him in his office, as neat and clean as a warship, and gave him an affectionate report on the wife's condition. No one knew where she came from, or how or when, since the first piece of information about her admission was the official record dictated by him when he interviewed her. An investigation initiated the same day had concluded nothing. In any case, what intrigued the director most was how Saturn learned of his wife's whereabouts. Saturn protected the Guardian. I was informed by the car insurance company, he said. The director nodded, pleased. I don't know how they do insurance to know everything, he said. He glanced at the file on his ascetic desk, and concluded. The only certainty is the severity of his condition. He was prepared to authorize a visit with due precautions if Saturn the magician promised, for the sake of his wife, to adhere to the conduct he directed. Especially in the way he treated her, to prevent her from relapsing into her increasingly frequent and dangerous outbursts of rage. It's weird, said Saturn. He was always strong-tempered, but very domineering. The doctor made a wise gesture. There are behaviors that remain latent for many years, and one day they explode, he said. All in all, it is fortunate that he fell here, because we are specialists in cases that require a heavy hand. In the end he gave a warning about Maria's rare obsession with the phone. Go with the flow, he said. Easy, doctor, Saturn said cheerfully. It is my specialty. The visiting room, a mixture of prison and confessional, was the old parlor of the convent. The entrance of Saturn was not the explosion of jubilation that they both could have expected. Maria was standing in the center of the room, next to a small table with two chairs and a vase without flowers. Clearly she was ready to go, in her pitiful strawberry coat and squalid shoes given to her out of charity. In a corner, almost invisible, was Herculina with her arms crossed. Maria did not move when she saw the husband enter nor did any emotion appear on her face still splattered by the ravages of the stained glass window. They had a routine kiss. How you feel? He asked her. Happy you've finally come, Rabbit, she said. This has been the death. They did not have time to sit down. Drowning in tears, Maria told him about the miseries of the cloister, the barbarism of the guards, the dog food, the endless nights without closing her eyes in terror. I don't know how many days I've been here, or months or years, but I know each one has been worse than the other, she said, and sighed with her soul. I don't think I'll ever be the same again. Now that's all over, he said, stroking the fresh scars on her face with his fingertips. I will continue to come every Saturday. And more, if the director allows me. You will see that everything will turn out very well. She fixed her terrified eyes on his eyes. Saturn tried his parlor arts. He told her, in the childish tone of big lies, a sweetened version of the doctor's prognosis. In short, he concluded, you still have a few days to fully recover. Maria understood the truth. For God's sake, rabbit. She said, stunned. Don't tell me that you think I'm crazy too. How can you think? he said, trying to laugh. What happens is that it will be much more convenient for everyone if you continue for a while here. In better condition, of course. But I already told you that I just came to talk on the phone. Said Maria. He did not know how to react to the fearsome obsession. He looked at Herculina. She took advantage of the look to indicate on her wristwatch that it was time to finish the visit. Maria intercepted the signal looked back, and saw Herculina in the tension of the impending assault. Then she clung to her husband's neck, screaming like a true madwoman. He brushed her off with as much love as he could, and left her at the mercy of Herculina, who jumped on his back. Without giving him time to react, he applied a key with his left hand, put the other iron arm around his neck, and shouted to Saturn the magician. Go away! Saturn fled in terror. However, the following Saturday, already recovered from the fright of the visit, he returned to the sanatorium with the cat dressed just like him, the red and yellow mesh of the great leotard, the top hat and a round and a half cape that seemed to fly. 
he entered with the fairground truck to the courtyard of the cloister, and there he did a prodigious performance of almost three hours that the inmates enjoyed from the balconies, with discordant shouts and inopportune ovations. They were all there, except Maria, who not only refused to receive her husband, but even to see him from the balconies. Saturn was mortally wounded. It's a typical reaction, the director consoled him. It will pass. But it never happened. After trying many times to see Maria again, Saturn did everything he could to get her to receive a letter, but it was useless. Four times he returned it closed and without comment. Satano gave up, but kept leaving the cigarette rations at the hospital gate, without even knowing if they reached Maria, until reality overcame him. He was never heard from again, except that he remarried and returned to his country. Before leaving Barcelona, he left the cat half-starved to a casual girlfriend, who also promised to continue taking the cigarettes to Maria. But she too disappeared. Rosa Regis remembered seeing her in the English court, about twelve years ago, with a shaved head and the orange sloop of some oriental sect, and she was pregnant as much as she could. She told him that she had continued to bring Maria cigarettes, whenever she could, and solve some unforeseen emergencies, until one day when she only found the rubble of the hospital, demolished as a bad memory of those ungrateful times. Maria seemed very lucid to him the last time he saw her, a little overweight and content with the peace of the cloister. That day he also brought the cat to him, because he had already run out of the money that Saturn left him to feed him. April 1978 Sparing of August We arrived in Arezzo a little before noon, and we lost more than two hours looking for the Renaissance castle that the Venezuelan writer Miguel Otero Silva had bought in that idyllic corner of the Tuscan countryside. It was a hot and bustling Sunday in early August and it was not easy to find someone who knew anything on the crowded streets. After many futile attempts we returned to the car, left the city along a path of cypress trees without road signs, and an old shepherdess of geese pointed out precisely where the castle was. Before saying goodbye, he asked us if we planned to sleep there, and we answered, as we had planned, that we were only going to have lunch. Thank goodness, she said, because they are scary in that house. My wife and I, who don't believe in noon appearances, scoff at his credulity. But our two children, ages nine and seven, were happy to meet a ghost with a present body. Miguel Otero Silva, who in addition to being a good writer was a splendid host in a refined dining room, awaited us with a lunch that will never be forgotten. As we were late, we did not have time to see the interior of the castle before sitting down at the table but its appearance from the outside was not terrifying, and any concern was dissipated with the complete view of the city from the flowery terrace where we were having lunch. It was hard to believe that on that hill of perched house, where barely 90,000 people could fit, so many men of enduring genius had been born. However, Miguel Otero Silva told us with his Caribbean humor that none of the many was the most distinguished of Arezzo. The greatest, he declared, was Ludovico. Thus, without surnames, Ludovico, the great lord of the arts and of war, who had built that castle of his misfortune, and of whom Miguel spoke to us throughout lunch. He tells us of his immense power, of his disgruntled love, and of his gruesome death. He told us how it was that in a moment of madness of the heart he had stabbed his lady in the bed where they had just loved each other, and then he drove his ferocious dogs of war against himself, which tore him to pieces. He assured us, very seriously, that from midnight the specter of Ludovico roamed the house in darkness, trying to find peace in his purgatory of love. The castle really was immense and gloomy. But in broad daylight, with a full stomach and a happy heart, Miguel's story could only seem like a joke like so many of his others to entertain his guests. The 82 rooms that we walked through without amazement after the siesta had undergone all kinds of changes from their successive owners. Miguel had completely restored the ground floor and had a modern bedroom built with marble floors and facilities for sauna and fitness, and the flowery terrace where we had had lunch. The second floor, which had been the most used in the course of the centuries, was a succession of rooms without any character, with furniture from different periods abandoned to its fate. 
but in the last one an intact room was preserved where time had forgotten to pass. It was Ludovico's bedroom. It was a magical moment. There was the bed of curtains embroidered with gold threads, and the bedspread of prodigies of trimmings still stiff with the dried blood of the sacrificed lover. There was the fireplace with the frozen ashes and the last log turned to stone, the closet with its well-primed weapons, and the oil portrait of the pensive gentleman in a gold frame, painted by some of the Florentine masters who did not have the fortune of survive your time. However, what impressed me the most was the smell of fresh strawberries that remained stagnant without possible explanation in the area of the bedroom. Summer days were long and leisurely in Tuscany, and the horizon stayed in place until nine at night. When we finished visiting the castle it was after five o'clock, but Miguel insisted on taking us to see the frescoes by Piero della Francesca in the Church of San Francisco, then we had a well-discussed coffee under the pergolas of the square, and when we returned to pick up, the suitcases we found the dinner served. So we stayed for dinner. While we were doing it, under a mauve sky with a single star, the children lit some torches in the kitchen, and they went to explore the darkness on the upper floors. From the table we heard their galloping horses up the stairs, the wailing of the doors, the happy shouts calling to Ludovico in the dark rooms. It was them who came up with the bad idea of staying over. Miguel Otero Silva supported them delightedly, and we did not have the civil courage to say no. Contrary to my fears, we slept very well, my wife and I in a downstairs bedroom and my children in the next room. Both had been modernized and there was nothing dark about them. As I tried to get to sleep, I counted the twelve sleepless ticks of the grandfather clock in the living room, and was reminded of the dreadful warning from the goose herder. But we were so tired that we fell asleep very early, in a heavy and continuous sleep, and woke up after seven o'clock to a splendid sun between the vines on the window. Beside me, my wife was sailing on the peaceful sea of innocence. What nonsense, I said to myself, that someone continues to believe in ghosts these days. Only then did the smell of freshly cut strawberries thrill me, and I saw the fireplace with the cold ashes and the last log turned to stone and the portrait of the sad gentleman who had watched us for three centuries in the gold frame. Well, we weren't in the downstairs bedroom where we had slept the night before, but in Ludovico's bedroom, under the cornice and the dusty curtains and the blood-soaked sheets still warm from his damned bed. October 1980 Maria dos Prazeres The man from the funeral home arrived so on time that Maria dos Prazeres was still in a bathrobe and with her head full of throwing tubes, and she barely had time to put a red rose in her ear so as not to look as undesirable as she felt. She lamented even more of his condition when she opened the door and saw that he was not a gloomy notary, as she supposed the merchants of death must be, but a shy young man in a plaid jacket and a tie with colored birds. He was not wearing a coat, despite Barcelona's uncertain spring, whose drizzle of biased wines almost always made it less tolerable than winter. Maria dos Prazeres who had received so many men at any given time, felt ashamed as rarely. He had just turned 76 years old and was convinced that he was going to die before cavity, and even so he was about to close the door and ask the burial vendor to wait a moment while he dressed to receive him according to his merits. But then he thought he was going to freeze on the dark landing, and he ushered him forward. Forgive me for this bat-like appearance, he said but I've been in Catalonia for more than fifty years, and it's the first time someone has arrived at the announced time. He spoke perfect Catalan with a slightly archaic purity, although the music of his forgotten Portuguese was still noticeable. Despite her age and with her wire loops, she was still a slender, vivacious mulatto, with hard hair and fiery yellow eyes, and had long since lost her compassion for men. The salesman, still dazzled by the clarity of the street, made no comment but wiped the solace of his shoes on the jute mat and kissed her hand with a bow. You are a man like those of my time, Maria dos Prazeres said with a hail of laughter. Sit down. Although he was new to the trade, he knew it well enough not to expect that festive reception at eight in the morning, least of all a merciless old woman who at first glance seemed like a mad fugitive from the Americas. So it remained. One step away from the door not knowing what to say, while Maria dos Prazeres drew the thick stuffed curtains from the windows. 
The dim April glow barely illuminated the meticulous area of the room, which looked more like an antique shop window. They were things of daily use, not one more, not one less, and each one seemed placed in its natural space, and with such a certain taste that it would have been difficult to find another house better served even in a city as old and secret as Barcelona. Forgive me, he said. I have the wrong door. I wish, she said, but death is not wrong. The salesman opened on the dining room table a chart with many folds like a seaside chart with plots of various colors and numerous crosses and figures in each color. Maria dos Preziers understood that it was the complete plan of the immense Montjuic Pantheon, and remembered with a very old horror the Manaus Cemetery under the October downpours, where tapers splashed between nameless burial mounds and adventurers' mausoleums with Florentine stained glass windows. One morning, when she was very young, the overflowing Amazon woke up turned into a nauseating swamp, and she had seen the broken coffins floating in the backyard of her house with pieces of rags and the hair of the dead in the cracks. That memory was the reason why he had chosen the Montjuic Hill to rest in peace, and not the small San Gervasio Cemetery, so close and familiar. I want a place where the waters never come, he said. Well, here it is, said the salesman indicating the site on the map with an extendable pointer that he carried in his pocket like a steel fountain pen. She oriented herself on the colored board until she found the main entrance, where were the three contiguous, identical and nameless tombs where Buenaventura Durruti and two other anarchist leaders died in the Civil War lay. Every night someone wrote the names on the blank headstones. They. They wrote with pencil, with paint, with charcoal, with eyebrow crayon or nail polish with all their letters and in the correct order, and every morning the guards erased them so that no one would know who was who under the silent marbles. Maria dos Preziers had attended Durruti's funeral, the saddest and most tumultuous of those ever in Barcelona, and she wanted to rest near his grave. But none were available in the vast overcrowded pantheon. So he resigned himself to the possible. On the condition, he said, that they won't put me in one of those five-year-old drawers where one remains as if it were in the mail. Then, suddenly remembering the essential requirement, he concluded. And above all, that they bury me lying down. Indeed, in response to the noisy promotion of graves sold with advance installments, a rumor circulated that vertical burials were being made to save space. The vendor explained, with the precision of a speech learned by heart, and often repeated, that this version was a perverse infundity of traditional funeral companies to discredit the novel promotion of installment graves. As he explained, there was a knock on the door with three discreet knocks, and he made an uncertain pause, but Maria dos Preziers motioned him to continue. Don't worry, he said very quietly. It is the NOI. The seller picked up the thread, and Maria dos Preziers was satisfied with the explanation. However, before opening the door, he wanted to make a final synthesis of a thought that had matured in his heart for many years, and even in its most intimate details, since the legendary Manaus Crescent. What I mean, she said, is that I'm looking for a place where I'm lying underground, without risk of flooding and if possible in the shade of the trees in summer, and where they won't take me out after a certain time to throw myself away. In the trash. He opened the front door and a little spaniel came in, soaked by the drizzle, and with a particular mood that had nothing to do with the rest of the house. He was returning from his morning walk through the neighborhood, and as he entered he suffered a fit of exhilaration. He jumped on the table, barking senselessly, and was about to destroy the plan of the cemetery with his paws dirty with mud. A single glance from the owner was enough to moderate her impetus. N.O.I. He said without yelling. Bizotti the animal flinched, looked at her frightened, and a pair of clear tears slid down his snout. Then Maria dos Preziers took care of the vendor again, and found him perplexed. Collins! He exclaimed. Has cried. He's just excited to find someone here at this time, Maria dos Preziers excused him in a low voice. In general, he enters the house more carefully than men. Except for you, as I've already seen. But he cried, damn it. 
The salesman repeated and immediately realized his inaccuracy and apologized blushing. All dogs can do it if they teach them, she said. What happens is that the owners spend their lives educating them with habits that make them suffer, such as eating from plates or doing their crap at their hours and in the same place. And instead they don't teach them the natural things they like, like laughing and crying. Where were we going? There was very little left. Maria dos Preziers also had to resign herself to treeless summers, because the only ones in the cemetery had the shadows reserved for the hierarchs of the regime. Instead, the conditions and formulas of the contract were superfluous, because she wanted to benefit from the discount for early and cash payment. Only when they had finished, and as he put the papers back in his wallet, did the salesman examine the house with a conscious gaze and was shocked by the magical breath of its beauty. He looked back at Maria dos Preziers as if for the first time. May I ask you an indiscreet question? He asked. She directed him toward the door. Of course, he said, as long as it's not age. I have a habit of guessing people's trade from the things in their house, and the truth is that I'm not right here, he said. What do you do? Maria dos Preziers replied, dead with laughter. I'm a whore, son. Or is it that I no longer notice it? The seller reddened. Sorry. I should have been sorry more, she said, taking his arm to keep him from slipping against the door. And be careful. Don't break your neck before leaving me well buried. As soon as he closed the door, he carried the little dog and began to pamper him, and with his beautiful African voice he joined the children's choirs that at that moment began to be heard in the neighboring nursery. Three months before, she had had the revelation in her dreams that she was going to die, and since then she felt more attached than ever to that creature of her loneliness. He had so carefully foreseen the posthumous distribution of his things and the fate of his body, that at that moment he could have died without disturbing anyone. He had retired of his own free will with a fortune treasured stone by stone but without two bitter sacrifices, and had chosen as his final refuge the very old and noble town of Gracia, already digested by the expansion of the city. He had bought the mezzanine in ruins, always smelling of smoked herring, whose walls eaten away by saltpeter still bore the impacts of some inglorious combat. There was no doorman, and the damp and gloomy stairs were missing some rungs although all the floors were occupied. Maria dos Preziers had the bathroom and kitchen renovated, covered the walls with brightly colored hangings, and put beveled glass and velvet curtains on the windows. Lastly, she brought in the exquisite furniture, the service and decoration items, and the silks and brocades that the fascists stole from the residences abandoned by the Republicans in the stampede of defeat, and that she had been buying little by little, for many years. Years at bargain prices and secret auctions. The only link she had with the past was her friendship with the Count of Cardona, who continued to visit her on the last Friday of each month to dine with her and have a languid after-dinner love. But even that friendship of youth was kept in reserve, because the Count left the car with his heraldic insignia at a more than prudent distance, and one reached his mezzanine by walking through the shade, both to protect her honor and his own. Own. Maria dos Preziers did not know anyone in the building, except at the front door, where a very young couple had recently lived with a nine-year-old girl. It seemed incredible to him, but it was true, that he had never passed anyone else on the stairs. However, the distribution of her inheritance showed her that she was more implanted than she herself supposed in that community of raw Catalans whose national honor was based on modesty. Even the smallest trinkets he had distributed among the people who were closest to his heart, who were closest to his home. In the end, she did not feel very convinced that she had been fair, but instead she was sure that she had not forgotten anyone who did not deserve it. It was an act prepared with such rigor that the notary of Tree Street, who prided himself on having seen it all, could not believe his eyes when he saw her dictating from memory to her clerks the meticulous list of her assets with the name precise of each thing in medieval Catalan, and the complete list of the heirs with their offices and addresses, and the place they occupied in his heart. After the visit of the burial vendor, he ended up becoming one of the many Sunday visitors to the cemetery. Like his grave neighbors, he planted four-season flowers in the flower beds, 
watered the newborn grass and leveled it with pruning shears until it was like the town hall rugs, and he became so familiar with the place that he ended up not understanding how. It was that at first it seemed so desolate. On her first visit, her heart had jumped when she saw the three nameless tombs near the portal, but she did not even stop to look at them, for a few steps from her was the insomniac watcher. But on the third Sunday, she took advantage of an oversight to fulfill one more of her great dreams, and with lipstick she wrote on the first tombstone washed by the rain, Duryu. Since then, whenever he could, he did it again, sometimes in a grave, in two or three, and always with a steady hand and a heart racing with nostalgia. One Sunday in late September he witnessed the first burial on the hill. Three weeks later, on an icy windy afternoon, they buried a young woman just married in the grave next to hers. By the end of the year, seven plots were occupied, but the short-lived winter passed without disturbing it. He felt no discomfort, and as the heat increased and the torrential noise of life poured in through the open windows, he found himself more in the mood to survive the enigmas of his dreams. The Count of Cardona, who spent the hottest months in the mountains, found her on his return even more attractive than in his surprising youth of fifty years. After many unsuccessful attempts, Maria dos Preziers managed to get Noi to distinguish her tomb on the long hill of equal tombs. Then she insisted on teaching him to cry over the empty grave so that he would continue to cry out of habit after his death. He took him several times on foot from his house to the cemetery, indicating landmarks for him to memorize the route of the Rambla's bus, until he felt adept enough to send him alone. On the Sunday of the final rehearsal, at three in the afternoon, he removed his spring vest, partly because summer was imminent and partly to make it less conspicuous, and left it to his own devices. She watched him walk away down the shady sidewalk with a light trot, his tight sad ass under his ruffled tail, and he managed with great difficulty suppressing the desire to cry, for her and for him, and for so many bitter years of common illusions. Until he saw it turn towards the sea at the corner of Calle Mayor. Fifteen minutes later he got on the bus from Las Ramblas in the neighboring Plaza de Lesseps, trying to see him without being seen from the window, and indeed he saw him among the flocks of Sunday children, distant and serious, waiting for the change of the traffic light from pedestrians on Paseo de Gracia. My God, he sighed. What is only seen? He had to wait for almost two hours under the brutal Montjuic sun. He greeted several mourners from other less memorable Sundays, although he hardly recognized them, for it had been so long since he had seen them for the first time that they no longer wore mourning clothes, nor cried, and placed the flowers on the graves without think about their dead. Shortly after, when they all left, he heard a gloomy roar that frightened the seagulls, and he saw in the immense sea a white ocean liner with the flag of Brazil, and he hoped with all his soul that he would bring him a letter from someone who had died for her in the Pernambuco jail. Shortly after five o'clock, twelve minutes early, Noi appeared on the hill, drooling with fatigue and heat, but with the airs of a triumphant child. In that instant, Maria dos Preziers overcame the terror of not having anyone cry over her grave. It was the following autumn that he began to perceive dark signs that he could not decipher, but that increased the weight of his heart. He drank his coffee again under the golden acacia trees of the Plaza del Rialaje, wearing the coat with the foxtail collar and the hat adorned with artificial flowers that from so much being old had become fashionable again. Instinct sharpened. Trying to explain his own anxiety, he scrutinized the chatter of the bird vendors on the Ramblas, the whispers of the men in the book stalls who for the first time in many years did not talk about football, the deep vices of the war cripples who were throwing them at them. Leaves of bread to the pigeons, and everywhere unmistakable signs of death entered. At Christmas the colored lights were lit among the acacias, and music and voices of joy came out from the balconies, and a crowd of tourists foreign to our destination invaded the outdoor cafes, but within the party the same repressed tension was felt that preceded the times when anarchists took over the streets. Maria dos Preziers, who had lived through those times of great passions, could not control her anxiety, and for the first time she was awakened in the middle of her sleep by claws of fear. One night, state security agents shot dead in front of his window a student who had written with a broad brush on the wall, 
Visca Catalunya liar. My God, she said to herself in amazement, it's as if everything was dying with me. I had only known such anxiety when I was very young in Manaus, a minute before dawn, when the numerous noises of the night suddenly ceased, the waters stopped, time wavered and the Amazon rainforest was submerged in an abysmal silence that only it could be the same as death. In the midst of that irresistible tension, on April 10, as always, the Count of Cardona went to dinner at his home. The visit had become a ritual. The Count would arrive punctually between 7 and 9 at night with a bottle of local champagne wrapped in the afternoon paper to make it less noticeable, and a box of stuffed truffles. Maria dos Preziers would prepare him cannelloni au gratin and a tender chicken in its own juice, which were the favorite dishes of the Catalans of their good times, and an assorted platter of seasonal fruits. While she did the cooking, the Count listened to fragments of Italian operas in historical versions on the gramophone, slowly sipping a glass of port that lasted until the end of the records. After dinner, long and well discussed, they made a sedentary love by heart that left both of them a sediment of disaster. Before leaving, always flustered by the imminence of midnight, the Count would leave twenty-five pesetas under the ashtray in the bedroom. That was the price of Maria dos Preziers when he met her in a hotel passing through the parallel, and it was the only thing that the rust of time had left intact. Neither of them had ever wondered what the friendship was based on. Maria dos Preziers owed him some easy favors. He gave her timely advice for the proper management of her savings, had taught her to distinguish the real value of her relics, and how to keep them so that they would not be discovered that they were stolen things. But above all, it was he who showed her the way to a decent old age in the Gracia neighborhood, when in their lifelong brothel they declared her too used for modern tastes, and wanted to send her to a clandestine retirement home that for five pesetas taught them to make love to children. She had told the Count that her mother sold her at the age of fourteen in the port of Manaus, and that the first mate of a Turkish ship enjoyed her mercilessly during the crossing of the Atlantic, and then left her abandoned without money, without language and without a name, in the swamp of lights of the parallel. Both were aware of having so little in common that they never felt more alone than when they were together, but neither of them had dared to hurt the chance of habit. It took a national upheaval to realize, both at the same time, how much they had hated each other, and how tenderly, for so many years. It was a deflagration. The Count of Cardona was listening to the love duet of La Boheme, sung by Lisha Albanese and Bimamino Gigli, when a casual burst of radio news reached him that Maria dos Preziers was listening to in the kitchen. She tiptoed closer and he too listened. General Francisco Franco, the eternal dictator of Spain, had assumed the responsibility of deciding the final fate of three Basque separatists who had just been sentenced to death. The Earl breathed a sigh of relief. Then they will be shot without remedy, he said because the Cotillo is a just man. Maria dos Preziers fixed on him her fiery king cobra eyes, and saw his passionless pupils behind the gold goggles, the predatory teeth, the hybrid hands of an animal accustomed to humidity and darkness. Just as it was. Well, pray to God not, he said, because with just one shot I'll put poison in your soup. The Count was scared. Why's that? Because I'm a fair whore too. The Count of Cardona never returned, and Maria dos Preziers was certain that the last cycle of his life had just ended. Until recently, in fact, she was outraged that they gave her her seat on the buses, that they tried to help her cross the street, that they took her by the arm to go up the stairs, but she had ended up not only admitting it but even wanting him as a detestable need. Then he had an anarchist tombstone made, without name or dates, and began to sleep without passing the locks on the door so that NOI could come out with the news if she died in her sleep. One Sunday, when he entered his house on the way back from the cemetery, he found the girl who lived in the front door on the landing of the stairs. He accompanied her for several blocks, speaking to her about everything with the candor of a grandmother, while he watched her frolic with the NOI like old friends. In the Plaza del Diamante, as planned, he invited her to an ice cream. Do you like dogs? She asked him. I love them, said the girl. Then Maria dos Preziers made him the proposal that she had prepared for a long time. 
If something ever happens to me, take charge of the NOI, he said, with the only condition that you leave him free on Sundays without worrying about anything. He'll know what he's doing. The girl was happy. Maria dos Prazeres, in turn, returned home with the joy of having lived a dream matured for years in her heart. However, it was not because of the exhaustion of old age or the delay of death that that dream was not fulfilled. It wasn't even my own decision. Life had taken her for her on a frigid November afternoon when a sudden storm hit as she was leaving the cemetery. She had written the names on the three headstones and was walking down to the bus station when she was completely soaked by the first gusts of rain. He barely had time to take shelter in the gates of a deserted neighborhood that seemed like another city, with dilapidated warehouses and dusty factories, and huge cargo trucks that made the roar of the storm more terrifying. While she tried to warm up the soaked puppy with her body, Maria dos Prazeres saw the crowded buses go by, she saw the empty taxis go by with the flag off, but no one paid attention to her shipwrecked signs. Suddenly, when even a miracle seemed impossible, a sumptuous automobile the color of twilight steel passed almost noiselessly down the flooded street, stopped abruptly at the corner, and reversed back to where she was. The crystals lowered by a magical breath, and the driver offered to take her. I'm going very far, Maria dos Prazeres said sincerely. But you would do me a great favor if you bring me a little closer. Tell me where you are going, he insisted. Grace, she said. S. The door opened without knocking. It's my heading, he said. Go up. In the interior smelling of refrigerated medicine, the rain became an unreal mishap, the city changed color, and she felt in a strange and happy world where everything was resolved beforehand. The driver made his way through the clutter of traffic with a fluidity that had something of a magic on it. Maria dos Prazeres was intimidated not only by her own misery but also by that of the sorry little dog that slept on her lap. This is an ocean liner, he said, because he felt he had to say something worthy. I've never seen anything like it, not even in dreams. Actually, the only bad thing about it is that it's not mine, he said, in difficult Catalan, and after a pause he added in Spanish, my lifetime salary wouldn't be enough to buy it. I can imagine it, she sighed. She glanced at him, lit green by the glow of the dashboard, and saw that he was almost a teenager, with short curly hair and a Roman bronze profile. He thought that he was not beautiful, but that he had a different charm, that the cheap leather jacket worn with wear suited him very well, and that his mother must be very happy when she felt him come home. Only because of his peasant hands one could believe that he really did not own the car. They did not speak again during the whole journey but Maria dos Prazeres also felt herself being examined sideways several times, and once again she pained that she was still alive at her age. She felt ugly and compassionate, with the kitchen scarf that had been put on her head anyway when it started to rain, and the deplorable autumn coat that she had not thought to change because she was thinking about death. When they reached the Gracia neighborhood, it had begun to clear, it was night and the street lights were on. Maria dos Prazeres told her driver to leave her at a nearby corner, but he insisted on taking her to the door of the house, and not only did he do it, but also parked on the platform so that she could get off without getting wet. She let go of the puppy, tried to get out of the car with as much dignity as her body would allow, and when she turned to say thanks she was met by a man's gaze that took her breath away. He held her for an instant, not quite understanding who was expecting what or from whom, and then he asked her in a resolute voice. Up. Maria dos Prazeres felt humiliated. I thank you very much for bringing me, he said, but I won't let you make fun of me. I have no reason to make fun of anyone, he said in Spanish with final seriousness. And much less of a woman like you. Maria dos Prazeres had known many men like that, she had saved many others more daring than that from suicide but never in her long life had she been so afraid to decide. She heard him insist without the slightest hint of change in his voice. Up. She walked away without closing the car door, and answered him in Spanish to make sure she was understood. Do what you want. She entered the hall, dimly lit by the oblique glare of the street, 
and began to climb the first flight of the stairs on trembling knees, suffocated by a dread that she would have only thought possible at the moment of death. When he stopped in front of the mezzanine door, trembling with anxiety to find the keys in his pocket, he heard the two successive doors of the car slam into the street. Noi, who was ahead of him, tried to bark. Shut up, he ordered in an agonized whisper. Almost immediately he felt the first steps on the loose rungs of the ladder and was afraid his heart was going to burst. In a fraction of a second, he fully re-examined the premonitory dream that had changed his life for three years, and he understood the error in his interpretation. My God, she told herself in amazement. So it wasn't death. At last she found the lock, hearing the footsteps counted in the dark hearing the rising breathing of someone approaching as scared as she was in the dark, and then she realized that it had been worth waiting so many years, and having suffered so much in the dark. The darkness, even if it had only been to live that moment. May 1979 17 English Poisoned The first thing that Mrs. Prudence Eleanoro noticed when she arrived at the port of Naples was that it had the same smell as the port of Riahatcha. She did not tell anyone, of course, because no one would have understood it on that senile ocean liner packed with Italians from Buenos Aires who were returning home for the first time after the war, but she still felt less alone, less scared and distant, at 72 years of his age and 18 days of rough seas for his people and his home. Since dawn they had seen the ground lights. The passengers got up earlier than ever, dressed in new clothes and hearts heavy with the uncertainty of the disembarkation so that this last Sunday on board seemed to be the only true Sunday of the entire voyage. Mrs. Prudence Eleanor was one of the very few who attended the Mass. Unlike the days before when she was walking around the ship dressed in mourning, she had donned a brown tunic of rough canvas with the San Francisco cord at the waist to disembark, and some rawhide sandals that were too new. They didn't seem like a pilgrim. It was an advance payment he had promised God to wear that cutting habit to death if he would grant him the grace to travel to Rome to see the Supreme Pontiff, and he already took the grace for granted. At the end of Mass, she lit a candle to the Holy Spirit for the courage it instilled in her to endure the storms of the Caribbean, and said a prayer for each of the nine children and the fourteen grandchildren who at that time dreamed of her on the night of wines of Riahatcha. When he came on deck after breakfast, life on the ship had changed. Luggage was piled up in the ballroom, among all kinds of tourist objects bought by Italians in the magic markets of the Antilles, and on the counter of the canteen there was a Pernambuco macaque in an iron lace cage. It was a bright morning in early August. An exemplary Sunday of those post-war summers when the light behaved like a daily revelation, and the huge ship moved very slowly, with sick breaths, through a diaphanous pool. The gloomy fortress of the Dukes of Anjou was just beginning to be seen on the horizon, but the passengers leaning over the rail thought they recognized the familiar sights, and pointed at them without seeing them for sure, shouting with glee in southern dialects. Senora Prudence Eleanoro, who had made so many old friends on board, who had babysat while their parents danced and had even sewed a button from the warrior to the first officer, suddenly found them different. The social spirit and human warmth that allowed him to survive the first nostalgia in the torpor of the tropics, had disappeared. The eternal loves of the high seas ended in sight of the port. Mrs. Prudence Eleanoro, who did not know the fickle nature of Italians, thought that evil was not in the hearts of others but in her own, because she was the only one who went among the returning crowd. This is how all voyages must be, she thought suffering for the first time in her life the pang of being a stranger, as she gazed from the side at the remains of so many worlds extinct at the bottom of the water. Suddenly, a very beautiful girl who was next to her frightened her with a scream of horror. Mama mine, he said, pointing to the bottom. Look there. He was a drowned man. Senora Prudence Eleanoro saw him floating on his back between two waters, and he was a mature bald man with a rare natural poise, and his open and happy eyes were the same color as the sky at dawn. He wore a formal suit with a brocade waistcoat, patent leather ankle boots, and a lively gardenia on the lapel. In her right hand she held a small cubic packet wrapped in gift wrap, and her livid iron fingers were caught in the ribbon of the bow, 
which was the only thing she could find to grasp at the moment she died. She must have fallen from a wedding, said a ship's officer. It happens a lot in summer because of these waters. It was an instantaneous sight, because then they were entering the bay and other less gloomy reasons distracted the attention of the passengers. But Senora Prudence Eleonora kept thinking about the drowned man, the poor drowned man, whose frock coat waved in the wake of the ship. As soon as it entered the bay, a decrepit tugboat came out to meet the ship and hauled it through the debris of numerous military ships destroyed during the war. The water was turning to oil as the ship made its way through the rusted rubble, and the heat became even more fierce than Riahatcha at two in the afternoon. On the other side of the gorge, radiant in the eleven o'clock sun, suddenly appeared the entire city of chimerical palaces and old colorful barracks huddled in the hills. From the shaken bottom an unbearable whiff arose that Mrs. Prudence Linares recognized as the breath of rotten crabs from the patio of her house. While the maneuver lasted, the passengers recognized their relatives with waves of joy in the tumult of the furniture. Most were autumnal patrons with brand new breasts, smothered in morning gowns, with the most beautiful and numerous children on earth, small and diligent husbands of the immortal genre of those who read the newspaper after their wives and dress in strict writers despite the heat. In the midst of that carnival hubbub, a very old man with an inconsolable aspect, especially a beggar, was pulling handfuls and handfuls of tender chicks out of his pockets with two hands. In an instant they filled the dock, chirping crazily everywhere, and just because they were magic animals there were many that were still running alive after being trampled by the crowd unrelated to the prodigy. The magician had put his hat back on the floor, but no one threw a quality coin at him from the side. Fascinated by the marvelous spectacle that seemed to be performed in her honor, since only she was grateful for it, Mrs. Prudence Eleonora's did not realize when the gangplank was laid, and a human avalanche invaded the ship with the howls and impetus of a buccaneer's boarding. Dazed by the jubilation of the stale smell of onions from so many families in the summer, Beaten by the portering gangs who were beating each other for luggage, she felt threatened by the same inglorious death of the politicians on the dock. Then she sat on her wooden trunk with painted brass corners, and stood undaunted, praying in a vicious circle of prayers against the temptations and dangers in the lands of the infidels. There the first officer found her when the cataclysm happened and there was no one left but her in the dismantled room. No one should be here at this time, the officer told him kindly. Can I help you with something? I have to wait for the consul, she said. So it was. Two days before setting sail, her eldest son had sent a telegram to the consul in Naples, who was a friend of hers, to beg him to wait for her at the port and to help her with the procedures to continue to Rome. He had sent her the name of the ship and the time of arrival, and further indicated that he could recognize her by the habit of San Francisco that he would wear to disembark. She was so strict in her laws that the first mate allowed her to wait a little longer, even though it was going to be lunchtime for the crew and the chairs had been pulled up on the tables and the decks were being washed by racks. Several times they had to move the trunk so as not to get it wet, but she changed places without flinching, without interrupting the prayers, until they took her out of the recreation rooms and she ended up sitting in the sun among the rescue boats. There the first officer found her again a little before two in the afternoon, drowning in sweat inside her penitent's diving suit, and praying a rosary without hope, because she was terrified and sad and could hardly bear the urge to cry. It's useless if you keep praying, said the officer, without the kindness of the first time. Even God goes on vacation in August. He explained that half of Italy was on the beach at this time, especially on Sundays. The consul was probably not on vacation, due to the nature of his position, but he would certainly not open the office until Monday. The only reasonable thing was to go to a hotel, rest quietly that night, and the next day to call the consulate, whose number was undoubtedly in the directory. So Mrs. Prudence Eleonora had to comply with that criterion, and the officer helped her with the immigration and customs procedures and money exchange, and put her in a taxi with the random indication J.E. that they take her to a decent hotel. The decrepit taxi with the remnants of a hearse staggered through the deserted streets. Mrs. Prudence Eleonora thought for a moment that she and the driver were the only living beings in a city of ghosts hanging on wires in the middle of the street, but
but she also thought that a man who spoke so much, and with such passion, could not have time to hurt a poor lonely woman who had braved the risks of the ocean to see the Pope. At the end of the labyrinth of streets the sea could be seen again. The taxi continued to lurch along a lonely, hot beach where there were numerous small hotels in bright colors. But he did not stop at any of them but went straight to the least attractive, set in a public garden with large palm trees and green benches. The driver put the trunk on the shady sidewalk and, in the face of Mrs. Prudence Eleonora's uncertainty, assured her that this was the most decent hotel in Naples. A handsome and kind porter slung the trunk over his shoulder and took care of her. He led her to the makeshift wire net elevator in the stairwell, and began to sing a Puccini aria at the top of his voice and with alarming determination. It was an old nine-story restored building, each with a different hotel. Mrs. Prudence Eleonora felt suddenly in an instant hallucinated, stuck in a cage of chickens that climbed very slowly through the center of a stentorian marble staircase, and surprised people inside the houses with their most intimate doubts, with their ripped underpants and their sour burps. On the third floor the elevator stopped with a start, and then the trunk stopped singing, opened the folding diamond door and indicated to Mrs. Prudence Eleonora, with a gallant bow, that he was at home. She spotted a languid teenager behind a stained glass inlaid wooden counter in the lobby and shade plants in copper pots. He liked it right away, because it had the same serif loops as his youngest grandson. He liked the name of the hotel with the letters engraved on a bronze plate, he liked the smell of carbolic acid, he liked the hanging ferns, the silence, the golden stripes on the wallpaper. Then he took a step out of the elevator, and his heart sank. A group of English tourists in beach shorts and sandals dozed in a long line of waiting chairs. There were seventeen of them, and they were seated in a symmetrical order, as if they were a single one repeated many times in a gallery of mirrors. Mrs. Prudence Eleonora saw them without distinguishing them, with a single glance, and the only thing that impressed her was the long row of pink knees, which looked like pigs hanging on the hooks of a butcher's shop. She didn't take another step toward the counter but staggered back in awe and stepped back into the elevator. Let's go to another floor, he said. This is the only one with a dining room, Signara, said the porter. It doesn't matter, she said. The porter nodded in agreement, closed the elevator, and sang the missing piece of the song to the hotel on the fifth floor. Everything seemed less strict there, and the owner was a spring matron who spoke easy Spanish and no one took a nap in the armchairs in the lobby. There was indeed no dining room, but the hotel had an agreement with a nearby inn to serve guests at a special price. So Senora Prudence Eleonora decided that yes, she was staying for one night, as convinced by the eloquence and sympathy of the owner as by the relief that there were no Englishmen on pink knees sleeping in the hall. The bedroom had the blinds closed at two in the afternoon, and the gloom retained the coolness and silence of a secluded forest, and it was good for crying. As soon as she was left alone, Mrs. Prudence Eleonora passed the two locks, and urinated for the first time since the morning with a tenuous and difficult drain that allowed her to regain her identity lost during the trip. Then she took off her sandals and the lace of her habit and lay on her heart side on the marriage bed that was too wide and too lonely for her alone, and released the other source of her belated tears. Not only was it the first time she left Raya Hacha, but one of the few she left home after her children married and left, and she was left alone with two barefoot Indian women caring for her husband's soulless body. Half his life ended in the bedroom in front of the rubble of the only man he had ever loved, and who lay dormant for almost thirty years, lying in the bed of his youthful loves on a goatskin mattress. Last October, the sick man opened his eyes in a sudden flash of lucidity recognized his people and asked for a photographer to be called. They brought the old man from the park with the huge apparatus with bellows and black sleeve, and the magnesium plate for the domestic photos. The patient himself directed the photos. One for Prudencia, for the love and happiness she gave me in life, he said. They took it with the first flash of magnesium. Now two more for my adored daughters, Prudencita and Natalia, he said. They took them. Another two for my sons, examples of the family for their affection and good judgment, he said. 
and so on until the paper ran out and the photographer had to go home to restock. At four in the afternoon, when it was impossible to breathe in the bedroom because of the magnesium smoke and the tumult of relatives, friends and acquaintances who came to receive his copies of the portrait, the invalid began to vanish in bed. And he was saying goodbye to everyone with goodbyes, as if erasing himself from the world on the railing of a ship. His death was not the relief everyone expected for the widow. On the contrary, she was so distressed that her children gathered to ask how they could comfort her and she replied that she wanted nothing more than to go to Rome to meet the Pope. I'm going alone and in the San Francisco habit, she warned them. It is a command. The only pleasant thing that remained of those waking years was the pleasure of crying. On the ship, while she had to share the cabin with two poor Claire sisters who stayed in Marseille, she would linger in the bathroom to cry without being seen. So the hotel room in Naples was the only propitious place she had found to cry at ease since leaving Raya Hatcha. And he would have cried until the next day when the train left for Rome, had it not been for the owner knocking on his door at seven to warn him that if he did not arrive at the inn on time, he would not eat. The hotel employee accompanied her. A cool breeze had begun to blow from the sea, and there were still a few bathers on the beach in the pale seven o'clock sun. Mrs. Prudence Eleonoro followed the employee through the twisty streets. Steep and narrow that were just beginning to wake up from Sunday nap, and he found himself under a shady pergola, where there were dining tables with red checkered tablecloths and jars of pickles improvised like vases of paper flowers. The only diners at that early hour were the servants themselves, and a very poor priest who ate onions with bread in a secluded corner. Upon entering, she felt everyone's gaze for the brown habit but she did not alter, as she was aware that ridicule was part of penance. The waitress, on the other hand, aroused an iota of pity in her, because she was blonde and beautiful and spoke as if she sang, and she thought that it must be very bad in Italy after the war if a girl like that had to serve in an inn. But he felt good in the floral field of the arbor, and the aroma of laurel stew from the kitchen awakened his hunger postponed by the anxiety of the day. For the first time in a long time, she had no desire to cry. However, he was unable to eat comfortably. Partly because it was difficult for him to get along with the blonde waitress, even though she was nice and patient, and partly because the only meat there was to eat were some singing birds that were raised in cages in Riahatcha houses. The priest, who ate in the corner, and who ended up serving as their interpreter, tried to make him understand that the emergencies of war had not ended in Europe and that it should be appreciated as a miracle that there were at least little wild birds to eat. But she rejected them. For me, he said, it would be like eating a child. So he had to settle for a noodle soup, a plate of boiled zucchini with a few strips of stale bacon, and a piece of bread that looked like marble. While she was eating, the priest came over to beg her for charity to invite him to have a cup of coffee, and he sat down with her. He was a Yugoslav but he had been a missionary in Bolivia, and he spoke difficult and expressive Spanish. To Senora Prudence Eleonoro he seemed an ordinary man and without the slightest trace of indulgence, and she observed that he had unworthy hands with chipped and dirty nails, and a breath of onions so persistent that it seemed more like an attribute of character. But after all he was in the service of God, and it was a new pleasure to find someone to get along with so far from home. They talked slowly oblivious to the dense noise of the stable that was closing in on them as the diners occupied the other tables. Mrs. Prudence Eleonoro already had a final judgment about Italy, she didn't like it. And not because the men were a bit abusive, which was already a lot, or because they ate the birds, which was already too much, but because of the bad nature of leaving the drowned adrift. The priest, who, in addition to the coffee, had ordered a glass of grappa to be brought for her, tried to show her her lightness of judgment. For during the war, a very effective service had been established to rescue, identify and bury in sacred ground the many drowned people who were floating in the Bay of Naples at dawn. For centuries, concluded the priest, Italians have become aware that there is only one life, and they try to live it to the best of their ability. That has made them calculating and fickle, but it has also cured them of cruelty. They didn't even stop the boat she said. 
what they do is notify the port authorities by radio, said the priest. The discussion changed the mood of both. Mrs. Prudence Ilanero had finished eating, and only then did she realize that all the tables were occupied. In the closest ones, eating in silence, there were almost naked tourists, and among them some couples in love who kissed instead of eating. At the back tables, near the counter, were the local people playing dice and drinking a colorless wine. Mrs. Prudence Ilanero understood that she had only one reason to be in that undesirable country. Do you think it is very difficult to see the Pope? I ask. The priest replied that nothing was easier in summer. The Pope was on vacation in Castel Gondolfo, and on Wednesday afternoons he received pilgrims from all over the world in public audience. The entrance was very cheap, 20 lire. And how much do you charge to confess to one? She asked. The Holy Father does not confess to anyone, said the priest, a little scandalized, except the kings, of course. I don't see why you are going to deny that favor to a poor woman who comes from so far away, she said. Even some kings, being kings, have died waiting, said the priest. But tell me, it must be a tremendous sin for you to have made such a journey alone just to confess it to the Holy Father. Mrs. Prudence Ilanero thought about it for a moment, and the priest saw her smile for the first time. The Virgin Mary said. It would be enough for me to see it. And he added with a sigh that seemed to come from his soul, it was the dream of my life. In fact, she was still scared and sad, and all she wanted was to leave immediately, not only from that place but from Italy. The priest must have thought that this hallucinated woman could not do enough any more, so he wished her good luck and went to another table to ask for charity that they buy him a coffee. When she left the inn, Mrs. Prudence Ilanero found the city changed. She was surprised by the sunlight at nine o'clock at night, and frightened by the raucous crowd that had invaded the streets for the relief of the new breeze. You couldn't live with the firecrackers of so many maddened scooters. They were led by men without shirts, carrying their beautiful women hugging their waists on their haunches, and they wriggled their way through the hanging pigs and the tables of watermelons. The atmosphere was festive but to Mrs. Prudence Ilanero it seemed catastrophic. He lost his way. Suddenly he found himself on an ungodly street with taciturn women sitting at the doors of their identical houses, whose flashing red lights caused him a shudder of dread. A well-dressed man with a solid gold ring and a diamond in his tie chased her for several blocks, saying something to her in Italian, and then in English and French. When he got no response, he showed her a postcard from a package he took out of his pocket, and it took her only a glance to feel like she was going through hell. She fled in terror, and at the end of the street she found again the twilight sea with the same smell of rotten shellfish from the port of Riahatcha, and her heart returned to its place. He recognized the colorful hotels facing the deserted beach, the funeral taxis, the diamond of the first star in the immense sky. At the end of the bay, alone on the dock, he recognized the ship in which he had arrived, huge and with lighted decks, and realized that it no longer had anything to do with his life. There he turned left, but could not continue, because there was a crowd of onlookers held at bay by a police patrol. A line of ambulances waited with the doors open in front of his hotel building. Steep over the shoulder of the curious, Mrs. Prudence Ilanero then returned to see the English tourists. They were being carried out on stretchers, one by one, and they were all immobile and dignified, and they continued to look like one alone several times repeated in the formal suit they had worn for dinner, flannel pants, diagonal striped tie, and dark jacket embroidered with the Trinity College crest on the chest pocket. The neighbors leaning out of the balconies, and the curious blocked in the street, were counting them in chorus, as in a stadium, as they were taken out. They were seventeen. They were put into ambulances two by two, and carried away with the blare of war sirens. Stunned by so many stupors, Mrs. Prudence Ilanero went up in the elevator crowded by the clients of the other hotels who spoke in hermetic languages. They stayed on all floors except the third, which was open and lighted, but no one was at the counter or in the lounge chairs in the lobby, where he had seen the pink knees of the seventeen sleeping Englishmen. 
The owner of the fifth floor commented on the disaster in uncontrolled excitement. They are all dead, he told Senora Prudencia Lanero in Spanish. They got poisoned from the oyster soup for dinner. Oysters in August, imagine. He handed him the key to the room, without paying any more attention, while saying to the other customers in his dialect, since there is no dining room here, everyone who goes to bed. Sleep dawns alive. Again with the lump of tears in her throat, Mrs. Prudence Eleanor locked the room. Then he rolled the writing table and the armchair against the door, and finally put the trunk up like an insurmountable barricade against the horror of that country where so many things were happening at the same time. Then she put on her widow's nightgown, lay on her back on the bed, and prayed seventeen rosaries for the eternal repose of the souls of seventeen poisoned Englishmen. April 1980 Tramontana I saw him only once at Bachado, the trendy cabaret in Barcelona, a few hours before his bad death. He was harassed by a gang of young Swedes who tried to take him away at two in the morning to finish the party in Catechase. There were eleven of them, and it was hard to tell them apart, because men and women looked the same, beautiful, with narrow hips and long golden hair. He must not be older than twenty years. Her head was covered with soaked curls, the sallow and smooth complexion of the Caribs accustomed by their breasts to walking in the shade, and an Arab look as if to upset the Swedes, and perhaps several of the Swedes. They had seated him on the counter like a ventriloquist's dummy, and they sang trendy songs to each other with their palms, to convince him to go with them. He, terrified, explained his reasons. Someone yelled in to demand that they leave him alone, and one of the Swedes confronted him with a laugh. It's ours, he yelled. We found it in the garbage drawer. I had walked in with a group of friends shortly before after the last concert that David Oistrich gave at the Palau de la Musica, and my skin crawled with the disbelief of the Swedes. For the boy's motives were sacred. He had lived in Catechase until the previous summer where he was hired to sing songs from the Antilles in a fashionable cantina, until the north wind defeated him. He managed to escape on the second day with the decision never to return, with or without the north wind, certain that if he ever did return, death awaited him. It was a Caribbean certainty that could not be understood by a band of rationalist Nordics, fired up by the summer and by the hard Catalan wines of that time, who sowed wild ideas in the heart. I understood it like nobody else. Catechase was one of the most beautiful towns on the Costa Brava, and also the best preserved. This was in part because the access road was a narrow, twisting ledge on the edge of a bottomless abyss, where you had to have a good soul to drive at more than 30 miles per hour. The usual houses were white and low, with the style. Traditional of the Mediterranean fishing villages. The new ones were built by renowned architects who had respected the original harmony. In summer, when the heat seemed to come from the African deserts across the street, Catechase turned into an infernal babel, with tourists from all over Europe who for three months disputed their paradise with natives and strangers who had been lucky to buy a house at a good price when it was still possible. However, in spring and autumn, which were the times when Catechase was most desirable, no one stopped thinking with fear of the north wind, an inclement and tenacious land wind, which, according to the natives and some chaste writers, carries with it the germs of madness. About fifteen years ago I was one of its regular visitors, until the north wind was crossed in our lives. I felt it before it arrived, on a Sunday nap time, with the inexplicable omen that something was going to happen. My spirits fell, I felt sad without cause and I had the impression that my children, then under ten years old, were following me around the house with hostile glances. The porter came in shortly after with a toolbox and some marine ropes to secure doors and windows, and was not surprised by my prostration. It's the north wind, he told me. He'll be here in an hour. He was an ancient seaman, very old, who kept his waterproof jacket, cap and hookah from his trade and his skin charred by the salts of the world. In his free hours he played petanque in the plaza with veterans of several lost wars, and had aperitifs with tourists in the beach taverns, as he had the virtue of making himself understood in any language with his Catalan as a gunner. He prided himself on knowing all the ports on the planet, 
but no inland city. Not even Paris of France with being what it is, he said. Well, he did not give credit to any vehicle that was not seaworthy. In recent years he had aged suddenly, and had not returned to the streets. He spent most of his time in his porter den, alone in Seoul, as he always lived. He cooked his own food in a tin and a small alcohol stove, but that was enough to delight us all with the delicacies of Gothic cuisine. From the Don took care of the tenants, floor by floor, and he was one of the most helpful men I have ever met, with the involuntary generosity and harsh tenderness of the Catalans. He spoke little, but his style was direct and accurate. When he had nothing else to do, he spent hours filling out soccer forecast forms that he rarely had he stamped. That day, while he was securing doors and windows in anticipation of the disaster, he spoke to us about the north wind as if it were an abominable woman but without whom his life would be meaningless. I was surprised that a man of the sea would pay such a tribute to an onshore wind. This one is older, he said. It gave the impression that he did not have his year divided into days and months, but rather in the number of times the north wind came. Last year, about three days after the second Tramontana, I had a colic crisis, he once told me. Perhaps that explained his belief that after each Tramontana one was several years older. Such was her obsession that it made us anxious to meet her as a deadly and desirable visit. There was not long to wait. As soon as the doorman left, a whistle was heard that gradually became more acute and intense, and dissolved into a roar of earth tremors. Then the wind started. First in increasingly frequent spaced bursts, until one froze, without a pause, without relief with an intensity and a fury that had something supernatural about it. Our apartment, contrary to the usual in the Caribbean, was facing the mountain, perhaps due to that rare taste of stale Catalans who love the sea without seeing it. So the wind was hitting us head on and threatening to break the window ties. What most caught my attention was that the weather continued to be of unrepeatable beauty, with a golden sun and an undaunted sky. So much so that I decided to go outside with the children to see the state of the sea. They, after all, had grown up between the earthquakes in Mexico and the hurricanes in the Caribbean, and a wind of more or less did not seem anything to disturb anyone. We tiptoed through the porter's den, and saw him standing in front of a plate of beans and chorizo, gazing out the window at the wind. He didn't see us leave. We managed to walk while we stayed in the shelter of the house but when we went out to the helpless corner we had to hug a pole so as not to be swept away by the power of the wind. We were like this, admiring the immobile and clear sea in the midst of the cataclysm, until the doorman, helped by some neighbors, came to rescue us. Only then did we convince ourselves that the only rational thing was to stay locked up at home until God wanted. And then no one had the slightest idea when he was going to want it. After two days we had the impression that that terrifying wind was not a telluric phenomenon, but a personal injury that someone was doing against one, and only against one. The porter visited us several times a day, concerned about our mood, and brought us seasonal fruits and alpha jars for the children. At lunch on Tuesday he gave us the masterpiece of the Catalan garden, prepared in his kitchen tin, rabbit with snails. It was a party in the midst of horror. Wednesday when nothing but the wind happened, was the longest day of my life. But it must have been something like the darkness of dawn, because after midnight we all woke up at the same time, overwhelmed by an absolute silence that could only be that of death. Not a leaf moved from the trees on the side of the mountain. So we went out into the street when there was still no light in the doorman's room, and we enjoyed the early morning sky with all its glowing stars, and the phosphorescent sea. Despite the fact that it was less than five o'clock, many tourists enjoyed the relief on the stones of the beach, and began to rig the sailboats after three days of penance. When we left we had not been struck by the fact that the doorman's room was dark. But when we got home the air had the same phosphorescence of the sea, and his den was still off. Surprised, I knocked twice, and seeing that it did not respond, I pushed the door. I think the children saw it first than I did and they let out a terrified cry. The old porter, with his distinguished navigator insignia pinned to the lapel of his sea jacket, 
was hanging from the neck on the central beam, still swaying from the last breeze of the north wind. In full convalescence, and with a feeling of anticipated nostalgia, we left town ahead of schedule, with the irrevocable determination never to return. The tourists were on the street again, and there was music in the Veterans Plaza, who barely had the heart to hit the pedant bowls. Through the dusty windows of the Maritimo Bar we caught a glimpse of some surviving friends, beginning life anew in the radiant spring of the north wind. But all that was already in the past. For this reason, in the sad morning of the sketching, no one understood like I did the terror of someone who refused to return to catechase because he was sure of dying. However, there was no way to dissuade the Swedes, who ended up taking the boy by force with the European pretense of applying a donkey cure to his African tricks. They kicked him into a drunken van, amid the applause and shrieks of the divided clientele, and at that hour they set off on the long journey to catechase. The next morning the phone woke me up. He had forgotten to close the curtains when he returned from the party and had no idea what time it was, but the bedroom was bathed in summer splendor. The anxious voice on the phone, which I did not immediately recognize, woke me up. Do you remember the boy they took to catechase last night? I didn't have to hear any more. Only it was not how I had imagined it, but even more dramatic. The boy, terrified by the imminence of the return, took advantage of a carelessness of the venatic Swedes and jumped into the abyss from the moving truck, trying to escape an ineluctable death. January 1982 MRS. Forbes's Happy Summer In the afternoon, on our way home, we found a huge sea snake stuck by the neck in the doorframe, and it was black and phosphorescent and looked like a gypsy curse, with its eyes still alive and the teeth of a saw in the holes. Jaws lopsided. I was then nine years old, and I felt such intense terror at that appearance of delirium that my voice closed. But my brother, who was two years younger than me, dropped the oxygen tanks, the masks and the swim fins and fled with a cry of horror. Mrs. Forbes heard it from the winding stone staircase that climbed the reefs from the jetty to the house, and it caught up with us, livid and livid, but it was enough to see the crucified animal in the doorway to understand the cause of our death. Rrr. She used to say that when two children are together they are both guilty of what each one does separately, so she reprimanded us both for my brother's screaming, and kept berating us for our lack of dominance. She spoke in German, and not in English, as her governess contract required, perhaps because she, too, was scared and reluctant to admit it. But as soon as he caught his breath he returned to his stony English and his pedagogical obsession. It is a Hellenic murina, he told us, so called because it was a sacred animal to the ancient Greeks. Orest, the native boy who taught us to swim in deep water, suddenly appeared behind the caper bushes. He wore a diver's mask on his forehead, tiny bathing pants and a leather belt with six knives, of different shapes and sizes, since he could not conceive of any other way to hunt underwater than by fighting hand to hand with the animals. He was in his early twenties, spent more time on the seabed than on land, and he himself looked like a sea animal, his body always smeared with engine grease. When she first saw him, Mrs. Forbes had told my parents that a more beautiful human being was impossible to conceive. However, his beauty did not save him from the rigor, he too had to endure a reprimand in Italian for having hung the wall on the door, with no other possible explanation than that of scaring the children. Then Mrs. Forbes ordered me to unpin it with the respect due to a mythical creature and had us get dressed for dinner. We did it immediately and trying not to make a single mistake, because after two weeks under Mrs. Forbes we had learned that nothing was more difficult than living. As we showered in the darkened bathroom, I realized that my brother was still thinking about the wall. He had people's eyes, he told me. I agreed, but I led him to believe otherwise, and managed to change the subject until I finished showering. But when I got out of the shower he asked me to stay to join him. It's still daylight, I told him. I opened the curtains. It was the middle of August, and through the window you could see the burning lunar plain to the other side of the island, and the sun stopped in the sky. That's not why, my brother said. I am afraid of being afraid. By the time we got to the table, however, 
he seemed calm, and had done things with such care that he deserved a special congratulations from Mrs. Forbes, and two more points on his good score for the week. On the other hand, he deducted two points from the five that I had already earned, because at the last minute I let myself be carried away by the rush and arrived at the dining room with altered breathing. Every fifty points we were entitled to a double portion of dessert, but neither of us had managed to pass the fifteen points. It was a shame, really, because we never found more delicious puddings than Mrs. Forbes's. Before starting dinner, we would pray standing in front of the empty plates. Mrs. Forbes was not a Catholic, but her contract stipulated that she make us pray six times a day, and she had learned our prayers to fulfill it. Then the three of us sat down, holding our breath while she checked even the smallest detail of our behavior, and only when everything seemed perfect did she ring the bell. Then Fulvia Flaminia, the cook, would come in with the eternal noodle soup of that abhorrent summer. At first, when we were alone with our parents, the meal was a party. Fulvia Flaminia served us cackling around the table, with a vocation of disorder that brightened life, and in the end she would sit with us and end up eating a little of everyone's dishes. But ever since Mrs. Forbes took over our destiny, she served us in such dark silence that we could hear the gurgling of the boiling soup in the kettle. We dined with our spine resting on the back of the chair, chewing ten times with one cheek and ten times with the other, without taking our eyes off the iron and languid autumn woman, who recited a lesson in civility by heart. It was just like Sunday Mass, but without the comfort of the people singing. The day we found the murina hanging on the door, Mrs. Forbes told us about our duties towards the country. Fulvia Flaminia, almost floating in the air rarefied by the voice, served us after the soup a charcoal fillet of snow-covered meat with an exquisite smell. For me, who since then preferred fish to anything else to eat on earth or in the sky, that memory of our house in Guacamayo relieved my heart. But my brother rejected the dish without tasting it. I don't like it, he said. Mrs. Forbes interrupted the lesson. You can't know, he said, you haven't even tasted it. He gave the cook an alert look but it was too late. Murina is the finest fish in the world, my figure, Fulvia Flaminia told him. Try it and you will see. Mrs. Forbes was unperturbed. He told us, with his unforgiving method, that Murina was a delicacy of kings in ancient times, and that warriors disputed its gall because it instilled supernatural courage. Then he repeated to us, as so many times in such a short time, that good taste is not a congenital faculty, but that it is not taught at any age, but that it is imposed from childhood. So there was no valid reason not to eat. I, who had tasted the murina before knowing what it was, was forever left with the contradiction, it had a smooth taste, although a little melancholic, but the image of the serpent nailed to the lintel was more pressing than my appetite. My brother made a supreme effort with the first bite, but he couldn't bear it, he threw up. You go to the bathroom, Mrs. Forbes said quietly, wash yourself well and eat again. I felt great anguish for him, because he knew how hard it was to walk through the entire house with the first shadows and stay alone in the bathroom for the time necessary to wash. But he returned very soon, in another clean shirt, pale and scarcely shaken by a hidden tremor, and he withstood the severe examination of his cleanliness very well. Then Mrs. Forbes carved a piece of the murina, and gave the order to continue. I barely had a second bite. My brother, on the other hand, didn't even take the silverware. I'm not going to eat it, he said. Her determination was so obvious that Mrs. Forbes dodged it. Okay, he said, but you won't have dessert. My brother's relief gave me courage. I crossed the silverware on the plate just as Mrs. Forbes taught us what to do when finished, and said. I won't have dessert either. They won't even watch television, she replied. We won't even watch TV, I said. Mrs. Forbes put the napkin on the table, and the three of us got up to pray. Then she sent us to the bedroom, with the warning that we should fall asleep in the same amount of time as she needed to finish eating. All our good points were cancelled and only after twenty we would again enjoy their cream cakes, their vanilla cakes, their exquisite plum cakes, 
as we would not know others in the rest of our lives. Sooner or later we had to reach that break. For a whole year we had looked forward to that free summer on the island of Pantalana, at the southern tip of Sicily, and it had really been during the first month that our parents were with us. I still remember like a dream the solar plane of volcanic rocks, the eternal sea, the house painted with quicklime, even the sardine trees, from whose windows the luminous blades of the African lighthouses could be seen in the windless nights. Exploring with my father the sleeping bottoms around the island we had discovered a string of yellow torpedoes, stranded since the last war, we had rescued a Greek amphora almost a meter high, with petrified garlands, at the bottom of which lay the embers of an immemorial and poisonous wine, and we had bathed in a steaming pool, whose waters were so dense that you could almost walk on them. But the most dazzling revelation for us had been flaming Fulvia. He seemed like a happy bishop and he always walked with a round of sleepy cats that made it difficult for him to walk, but she said that she did not put up with them out of love, but to prevent them from being eaten by rats. At night, while our parents watched adult programs on television, Fulvia Flaminia took us with her to her house, less than a hundred meters from ours, and taught us to distinguish remote ramblings, songs, bursts of crying from the wines of Tunisia. Her husband was too young a name for her who worked during the summer in the tourist hotels at the other end of the island, and only came home to sleep. Oris lived with his parents a little further afield, always turning up at night with strings of fish and baskets of freshly caught lobsters, and hanging them in the kitchen for Fulvia Flaminia's husband to sell in the hotels the next day. Then he would put the diver's flashlight on his forehead again and take us to hunt the bush rats, big as rabbits, that stalked the kitchen waste. Sometimes we came home when our parents had gone to bed, and we could hardly sleep to the roar of rats fighting for scraps in the yards. But even that hindrance was a magical ingredient in our happy summer. The decision to hire a German governess could only occur to my father, who was a Caribbean writer with more pretense than talent. Dazzled by the ashes of the glories of Europe, he always seemed too eager to have his origins forgiven, both in books and in real life and had set himself the fantasy that no vestige of his own past would remain in his children. My mother always remained as humble as she had been as a wandering teacher in Upper Guajira, and she never imagined that her husband could conceive an idea that was not providential. So neither of them should have wondered in their hearts what our life was going to be like with a sergeant from Dortmund, bent on forcibly instilling in us the most stale habits of European society while they participated with forty fashion writers in a five-week cultural cruise around the Aegean Islands. Mrs. Forbes arrived on the last Saturday in July in the regular little boat from Palermo, and from the first time we saw her we realized that the party was over. She arrived in militia boots and a double-breasted dress in the southern heat, her hair cut like a man's under her felt hat. It smelled of monkey urine. This is how all Europeans smell, especially in summer my father told us. It is the smell of civilization. But in spite of her martial garb, Mrs. Forbes was a scrawny creature, who might have aroused a certain pity in us if we had been older or if she had had some trace of tenderness. The world became different. The six hours at sea, which since the beginning of summer had been a continuous exercise of imagination, turned into a single equal hour, many times repeated. When we were with our parents we had all the time to swim with Orest, amazed at the art and audacity with which he faced the octopuses in their own murky environment of ink and blood, with no other weapons than his fighting knives. Then he kept arriving at eleven o'clock in the little outboard motor boat, as he always did, but Mrs. Forbes wouldn't let him stay with us one minute longer than was necessary for the underwater swimming lesson. He forbade us to return to the house of Fulvia Flaminia at night because he considered it an excessive familiarity with serfdom, and we had to devote the time we used to enjoy hunting rats in analytical reading of Shakespeare. Accustomed to stealing mangoes in the patios and killing dogs with brick in the burning streets of Guacamayo, for us it was impossible to conceive a cruel torment than that life of princes. However, we soon realized that Mrs. Forbes was not as strict with herself as she was with us, and that was the first breach of her authority. At first she stayed on the beach under the colorful parasol, dressed in war clothes, reading Schiller ballads while Orest taught us to dive, and then she gave us theory classes on good behavior in society, hour after hour, 
until lunch break. One day she asked Oris to take her in the little motor boat to the tourist tents of the hotels, and she returned with a one-piece swimsuit, black and iridescent, like a seal skin, but she never went into the water. He was sunning himself on the beach while we swam, and he wiped his sweat with the towel, without going through the shower, so that after three days he looked like a raw lobster and the smell of his civilization had become unbreathable. His nights were of relief. From the beginning of his tenure we felt that someone was walking through the darkness of the house, stroking in the dark, and my brother became uneasy with the idea that they were the wandering drowned people that Fulvia Flaminia had told us so much about. Very soon we discovered that it was Mrs. Forbes, who spent the night living the real life of a lonely woman who she herself would have disapproved of during the day. One morning we surprised her in the kitchen, in her schoolgirl's nightgown, preparing her splendid desserts, her whole body smeared with flour up to her face and drinking a glass of port with a mental disorder that would have caused the scandal of the other lady. Forbes. By then we knew that after we went to bed, he did not go to his bedroom, but went down to swim secretly, or stayed up very late in the living room, watching the movies forbidden for minors without sound on television, while eating whole cakes and they even drank a bottle of the special wine my father kept so zealously for memorable occasions. Against his own preachings of austerity and composure, he choked restlessly, with a kind of unbridled passion. Afterwards we would hear her speaking alone in her room, we would hear her reciting entire excerpts from Die Jungfrau von Orleans in her melodious German, we would hear her sing, we would hear her sobbing in bed until dawn, and then she would appear at breakfast with tear-swollen eyes, increasingly gloomy and authoritative. Neither my brother nor I were ever as miserable as then, but I was willing to endure her to the end, knowing that her reason would prevail against ours anyway. My brother, on the other hand, faced him with all the impetus of his character, and the happy summer turned to hell for us. The episode of the Murina was the last limit. That same night, as we listened to the incessant bustle of Mrs. Forbes in the sleeping house from our beds, my brother suddenly let go of all the burden of resentment that was rotting in his soul. I'm going to kill her he said. I was surprised, not so much by his decision, as by the chance that I had been thinking the same thing since dinner. However, I tried to dissuade him. They'll cut off your head, I told him. There is no guillotine in Sicily, he said. Besides, no one is going to know who it was. He was thinking of the amphora rescued from the waters, where the sediment of deadly wine was still. My father kept it because he wanted to have it subjected to a deeper analysis to find out the nature of its poison, since it could not be the result of the simple passage of time. Using it against Mrs. Forbes was such an easy thing, no one was going to think it wasn't an accident or suicide. So at dawn, when we felt her fall exhausted from the roaring vigil, we poured wine from the amphora into my father's bottle of special wine. From what we had heard, that dose was enough to kill a horse. We ate breakfast in the kitchen at nine o'clock, served by Mrs. Forbes herself with the sweet rolls that Fulvia Flaminia left on the stove very early. Two days after the wine substitution, while we were having breakfast, my brother made me realize with a disenchanted look that the poisoned bottle was intact on the sideboard. That was a Friday, and the bottle remained intact through the weekend. But on Tuesday night, Mrs. Forbes drank half of it while watching the Libertine movies on television. However, he was as punctual as ever for breakfast on Wednesday. He had his usual bad night face, and his eyes were as anxious as ever behind the solid glass, and they became even more anxious when he found a letter with stamps from Germany in the bread basket. He read it over coffee, as he had told us so many times not to do and as he read the bursts of clarity radiating from the written words passed over his face. Then she tore the stamps from the envelope and put them in the basket with the leftover rolls for the collection of Fulvia Flaminia's husband. Despite his initial bad experience, that day he accompanied us in the exploration of the seabed, and we wandered through a sea of thin waters until the air in the tanks began to run out and we returned home without taking the lesson of good manners. Not only was Mrs. Forbes in a flowery mood all day, but at dinner she seemed more alive than ever. My brother, for his part, could not bear the discouragement. 
As soon as we got the order to start he pushed the bowl of noodle soup away with a teasing gesture. I'm up to my balls in this worm water, he said. It was as if he had thrown a war grenade on the table. Mrs. Forbes turned pale, her lips hardened until the smoke from the blast began to dissipate, and the glass of her glasses blurred with tears. Then he took them off, dried them with his napkin, and before getting up he put it on the table with the bitterness of an inglorious capitulation. Do whatever you want, he said. I do not exist. He locked himself in his room since seven. But before midnight, when she assumed we were asleep, we saw her pass by in her schoolgirl's nightgown and carrying half a chocolate cake and the bottle with more than four fingers of poisoned wine to the bedroom. I felt a tremor of pity. Poor Mrs. Forbes, I said. My brother was not breathing peacefully. Poor us if he doesn't die tonight, he said. That morning she spoke alone for a long time again, proclaiming Schiller in loud voices, inspired by frenzied madness, and culminating in a final scream that filled the entire house. Then he sighed many times to the depths of his soul and succumbed with a sad and continuous hiss like that of a boat adrift. When we woke up, still exhausted from the stress of waking, the sun was slashing through the blinds, but the house seemed submerged in a pond. Then we realized that it was going to be ten o'clock and we hadn't been woken up by Mrs. Forbes's morning routine. We did not hear the toilet drain at eight o'clock nor the faucet in the sink, nor the noise of the blinds, nor the shoes of the boots and the three fatal knocks on the door with the palm of his black hand. My brother put his ear against the wall, held his breath for the slightest sign of life in the next room, and finally breathed a sigh of liberation. It is done. Said. The only thing you can hear is the sea. We prepared our breakfast shortly before eleven o'clock and then we went down to the beach with two cylinders for each one and another two to spare, before Fulvia Flaminia arrived with her round of cats to clean the house. Orest was already on the jetty gutting a six-pound gilt head gilt head he had just caught. We told her that we had waited for Mrs. Forbes until eleven o'clock, and since she was still asleep we decided to go down to the sea alone. We also told him that the night before he had had a crying spell at the table, and perhaps he had slept badly and preferred to stay in bed. Orest was not too interested in the explanation, as we expected, and he accompanied us to prowl for just over an hour on the seabed. Then he told us to go upstairs to have lunch, and he went in the little motor boat to sell the Guildhead Sea Bream at the tourist hotels. From the stone staircase we waved goodbye to him, making him believe that we were about to go up to the house, until he disappeared around the cliffs. So we put on the oxygen tanks and continued swimming without anyone's permission. The day was cloudy and there was a clamor of dark thunder on the horizon, but the sea was smooth and clear and its own light was enough. We swam on the surface to the line of the Pantelaria lighthouse, then turned a hundred meters to the right and dove where we estimated that we had seen the war torpedoes in early summer. There they were, there were six of them, painted solar yellow and with their serial numbers intact and lying on the volcanic bottom in a perfect order that could not be accidental. Then we continued turning around the lighthouse, in search of the submerged city of which Fulvia Flaminia had told us so much and with so much amazement, but we could not find it. After two hours, convinced that there were no new mysteries to discover, we surfaced with the last sip of oxygen. A summer storm had come down as we were swimming, the sea was rough, and a crowd of butcher birds fluttered with ferocious shrieks over the trail of dying fish on the beach. But the afternoon light seemed just done, and life was good without Mrs. Forbes. However, when we just barely climbed the stairs to the cliffs, we saw a lot of people in the house and two police cars in front of the door, and then we became aware for the first time of what we had done. My brother was shaken and tried to go back. I'm not going in, he said. I on the other hand, had the confused inspiration that just by seeing the corpse we would be safe from all suspicion. Take it easy, I said. Take a deep breath, and think only one thing, we don't know anything. Nobody paid attention to us. We left the tanks, masks and fins in the portal, and entered through the side gallery, where two men were sitting smoking on the ground next to a field stretcher. Then we realized that there was an ambulance at the back door and several soldiers armed with rifles. 
In the living room, the women of the neighborhood prayed in dialect seated in the chairs that had been put against the wall, and their men were huddled in the patio talking about anything that had nothing to do with death. I tightened my grip on my brother's hand, which was hard and cold, and we stepped into the home through the back door. Our bedroom was open and in the same state we left it in the morning. In Mrs. Forbes's, which was next, there was an armed policeman controlling the entrance, but the door was open. We peeked inside with heavy hearts, and we barely had time to do so when Fulvia Flaminia stormed out of the kitchen and shut the door with a cry of horror. For the love of God, Figlioli, don't see her. It was late. Never, in the rest of our lives, were we to forget what we saw in that fleeting moment. Two men in plain clothes were measuring the distance from the bed to the wall with a tape measure while another took pictures with a black blanket camera like those taken by park photographers. Mrs. Forbes was not on the rumpled bed. She was lying on her side on the floor, naked in a pool of dried blood that had completely stained the floor of the room, and her body was sifted with stab wounds. There were twenty-seven fatal injuries, and from the amount and the severity it was obvious that they had been struck with the fury of a love without rest, and that Mrs. Forbes had received them with the same passion without even crying out, without crying, reciting Schiller in his beautiful soldier's voice, aware that it was the inexorable price of his happy summer. The light is like water. At Christmas the children again asked for a rowboat. Okay, Dad said, we'll buy it when we get back to Cartagena. Nine-year-old Toto and seven-year-old Joel were more determined than their parents realized. No, they said in chorus. We need now and here. To begin with, said the mother, there is no more navigable water here than the one coming out of the shower. Both she and her husband were right. In the house in Cartagena de Indias there was a patio with a dock over the bay, and a shelter for two large yachts. On the other hand, here in Madrid they lived crammed together on the fifth floor of number 47 of Paseo de la Castellana. But in the end neither he nor she could refuse because they had been promised a rowboat with its sextant and compass if they won the laurel of the third year of primary school, and they had earned it. So the dad bought everything without saying anything to his wife, who was the most reluctant to pay gambling debts. It was a beautiful aluminum boat with a golden thread on the waterline. The boat is in the garage, dad revealed at lunch. The problem is that there is no way to get it up either by elevator or by stairs, and there is no more space available in the garage. However, the following Saturday afternoon the children invited their classmates to take the boat up the stairs, and they managed to take it to the utility room. Congratulations, said the father. Now what? Nothing now, the children said. All we wanted was to have the boat in the room, and that's it. On Wednesday night, like every Wednesday, the parents went to the EAM. The children, owners and lords of the house, closed doors and windows, and broke the lit light bulb from a living room lamp. A stream of water cool golden light began to come out of the broken bulb, and they let it run until the level reached four feet. Then they cut off the current, took out the boat, and sailed at leisure among the islands of the house. This fabulous adventure was the result of a lightness of mind when I was participating in a seminar on the poetry of household utensils. Toto asked me how the light came on at the push of a button, and I didn't have the courage to think twice. Light is like water, I replied. You open the tap, and it comes out. So they continued sailing on Wednesday nights, learning how to use the sextant and the compass until their parents returned from the movies to find them asleep like angels from the mainland. Months later, eager to go further, they asked for a spearfishing team. With everything, masks, fins, tanks and air guns. It's bad that they have a rowboat in the utility room that is of no use to them, said the father. But it is worse that they want to also have diving equipment. What if we win the Golden Gardenia for the first semester? said Joel. No, said the mother, scared. No more. The father reproached his intrasigence. These children don't earn a nail for doing their duty, she said, but on a whim they are capable of earning even the teacher's chair. The parents finally said neither yes nor no. 
but Toto and Joel, who had been the last in the previous two years, won the two golden gardenias and public recognition from the rector in July. That same afternoon, without being asked again, they found the diving equipment in their original packaging in the bedroom. So the following Wednesday, while the parents were watching the last tango in Paris, they filled the apartment to the height of two fathoms, they dived like sharks. Tame under the furniture and beds, and rescued from the background of the light the things that for years had been lost in the dark. At the final award, the brothers were acclaimed as an example for the school, and they were given diplomas of excellence. This time they didn't have to ask for anything, because the parents asked them what they wanted. They were so reasonable that they just wanted a house party to entertain their classmates. Dad, alone with his wife, was radiant. It's a test of maturity, he said. God hear you, said the mother. The following Wednesday, while the parents were watching the Battle of Algiers, the people who passed by the Castellana saw a cascade of light that fell from an old building hidden among the trees. It came out through the balconies, poured down the facade, and was channeled down the great avenue in a golden torrent that illuminated the city as far as the Guadarrama. Called urgently, firefighters forced open the fifth floor door, and found the house brimming with light up to the ceiling. The leopard skin sofa and armchairs floated in the living room at different levels, between the bar bottles and the grand piano and her manila shawl that fluttered in mid water like a golden stingray. Household utensils, in the fullness of their poetry, flew on their own wings across the kitchen sky. The instruments of the war band, which the children used to dance, floated to and fro among the goldfish released from Mama's fishbowl, which were the only ones floating alive and happily in the vast illuminated swamp. Everyone's toothbrushes, Dad's condoms, cream jars, and Mom's spare teeth floated in the bathroom, and the television in the master bedroom floated on its side, still on in the last episode of the movie. Midnight Forbidden for Children At the end of the corridor, floating between two waters, Toto was sitting in the stern of the boat, clinging to the oars and with the mask on, looking for the port lighthouse as far as the air from the tanks reached him, and Joel was floating in the prow searching. Still the height of the pole star with the sextant, and his thirty-seven classmates floated throughout the house, eternalized in the instant of peeing in the pot of geraniums, singing the school hymn with the lyrics changed by mocking verses against the rector, sneaking a glass of brandy from daddy's bottle. Well, so many lights had been turned on at the same time that the house had overflowed, and the entire fourth elementary year of the San Julian El Hospitalario School had drowned on the fifth floor of number 47 of Paseo de la Castellana. In Madrid of Spain, a remote city of hot summers and icy winds, without sea or river, and whose mainland aborigines were never masters in the science of navigating in the light. December 1978 The Trail of Your Blood in the Snow At dusk, when they reached the border, Nina de Kant realized that the finger with the wedding ring was still bleeding. The civil guard with a raw wool blanket over his patent leather hat examined the passports by the light of a carbide flashlight, trying very hard not to be knocked over by the pressure of the wind blowing from the Pyrenees. Although they were two diplomatic passports in order, the guard raised his flashlight to check that the portraits resembled faces. Nina de Kant was almost a child with happy bird eyes and molasses skin that still radiated the Caribbean sun in the gloomy January evening, and she was wrapped up to the neck in a mink-naped coat that couldn't bought with a year's salary from the entire border garrison. Billy Sanchez de Avila, her husband, who was driving the car, was a year younger than her, and almost as handsome, and he was wearing a plaid jacket and a baseball cap. Unlike his wife, he was tall and athletic with the iron jaws of timid thugs. But what best revealed the condition of both was the platinum car whose interior breathed the breath of a living beast, as no other had been seen on that border of the poor. The rear seats were crammed with two new suitcases and many unopened gift boxes. There was also the tenor saxophone that had been the dominant passion in Nina de Kant's life before she succumbed to the disgruntled love of her tender spa gang member. When the guard returned the stamped passports, Billy Sanchez asked him where they could find a pharmacy to treat his wife's finger, and the guard yelled against the wind to ask them in Hende, on the French side. But the Hende guards sat at the table in their shirt sleeves, 
playing cards while eating bread soaked in wine bowls inside a warm and well-lit glass sentry box, and it was enough for them to see the size and class of the car to tell them. By signs that they will enter France. Billy Sanchez sounded the horn several times, but the guards did not understand that they were being called, but one of them opened the glass and shouted at them with more anger than the wind. Merd. Alas Vuin. Then Nina de Conte got out of the car wrapped with the coat up to her ears, and asked the guard in perfect French where there was a pharmacy. The guard answered out of habit with a mouth full of bread that this was none of his business, especially with such a storm, and closed the window. But then he paid attention to the girl sucking her wounded finger wrapped in the flash of natural mink, and he must have mistaken her for a magical apparition on that night of fright, because he instantly changed his mood. He explained that the nearest city was Biarritz, but that in the dead of winter and with that wolfish wind there might not be a pharmacy open until Bayonne, a little further on. Is it something serious? I ask. Nothing, Nina de Conte smiled, showing him the finger with the diamond ring on the tip of which the wound from the rose was barely perceptible. It's just a puncture. Before Bayonne it snowed again. It was not after seven o'clock but they found the streets deserted and the houses closed by the fury of the storm, and after many laps without finding a pharmacy they decided to move on. Billy Sanchez was happy with the decision. He had an insatiable passion for rare cars and a dad with too many guilt feelings and resources to spare to please him, and he had never driven anything like that wedding present Bentley convertible. He was so drunk at the wheel that the more he drove the less tired he felt. He was ready to arrive that night in Bordeaux where they had reserved the wedding suite at the Hotel Splendid, and there would be no headwinds or enough snow in the sky to prevent it. Nina de Conte, on the other hand, was exhausted, especially because of the last stretch of the road from Madrid, which was a ledge of goats whipped by hail. So after Bayona she wrapped a handkerchief around her ring finger tightly to stop the blood flowing, and she fell asleep soundly. Billy Sanchez didn't notice it until around midnight after it had finished snowing and the wind suddenly stopped among the pines and the sky over the lawns was filled with icy stars. He had passed the sleeping lights of Bordeaux, but only stopped to fill his tank at a station on the road, for he still had the courage to get to Paris without taking a breath. She was so happy with her £25,000 large toy that she didn't even wonder if the radiant creature that slept beside her in the blood-soaked ring band, and whose teenage dream, for the first time, was traversed by bursts of uncertainty. They had been married three days before, 10,000 kilometers from there, in Cartagena de Indias, to the amazement of his parents and the disappointment of hers, and the personal blessing of the Archbishop Primate. No one, except themselves, understood the real foundation or knew the origin of this unpredictable love. It had started three months before the wedding, on a Sunday at sea when Billy Sanchez's gang stormed the women's locker rooms of the Marbella Spas. Nina de Conte had just turned 18, had just returned from the Châtelaine boarding school in St. Blaise, Switzerland, speaking four languages without an accent and with a masterful command of the tenor saxophone, and this was her first Sunday at sea since her return. She had stripped completely to put on her bathing suit when the stampede of panic and shouts of boarding began in the neighboring booths but she did not understand what was happening until the knocker on her door splintered and saw the man standing in front of her. Most beautiful bandit that could be conceived. The only thing she was wearing was a linear boxer shorts of faux leopard skin, and she had a gentle, springy body and the golden color of a seafarer. In his right fist, where he had a metal Roman gladiator's slave, he wore an iron chain wound that served him as a deadly weapon, and he had a medal without a saint hanging around his neck that beat silently with the fright of his heart. They had been together in elementary school and had broken many piñatas at birthday parties, since both belonged to the provincial lineage that had managed the fate of the city at their discretion since colonial times, but they had stopped seeing each other for so many years that they were not recognized at first glance. Nina de Conte stood motionless, doing nothing to hide her intense nudity. Billy Sanchez then carried out his puerile ritual, he lowered his leopard briefs and showed him his upright, respectable animal. She looked straight at him without astonishment. I've seen them bigger and firmer, he said, mastering his terror. 
so think carefully about what you are going to do, because with me you have to behave better than a black man. In reality, Nina DeCant was not only a virgin, she had never seen a naked man before, but the challenge proved effective. The only thing Billy Sanchez could think of was to throw a fist of rage against the wall with the chain wound in his hand, splintering his bones. She drove him to the hospital, helped him cope with his convalescence, and in the end they learned together to make love the good way. They spent the difficult June afternoons on the interior terrace of the house where six generations of Nina DeCant's family had died, she playing fashionable songs on the saxophone, and he, with his hand in a cast, gazing at her from the hammock with a blank amazement. Relief The house had numerous full-length windows overlooking the bay's rotting pool, and it was one of the largest and oldest in the Manga neighborhood, and certainly the ugliest. But the checkered tile terrace where Nina DeCant played the saxophone was a haven in the four o'clock heat, and it overlooked a large shady courtyard with mango sticks and banana bushes, under which was a grave with a nameless slab. Prior to the house and the memory of the family, even the least knowledgeable in music thought that the sound of the saxophone was anachronistic in a house of such ancestry. Sounds like a ship, Nina DeCant's grandmother had said when she first heard it. His mother had tried in vain to get him to touch him in a different way, and not the way she did for comfort, with her skirt pulled up to her thighs and her knees parted, and with a sensuality that did not seem essential to music. I don't care what instrument you play, he would tell her, as long as you play it with your legs closed. But it was those airs of goodbyes from ships and that fierce love that allowed Nina to con to break the bitter shell of Billy Sanchez. Beneath the sad reputation of brute that he had very well sustained by the confluence of two illustrious surnames, she discovered a scared and tender orphan. They got to know each other so much while the bones of his hand were being welded that he himself was amazed at the fluidity with which love happened when she took him to her maiden's bed one rainy afternoon when they were alone in the house. Every day at that time, for almost two weeks, they frolicked naked under the astonished gaze of the portraits of civil warriors and insatiable grandmothers who had preceded them in the paradise of that historic bed. Even in the pauses of love, they remained naked with the windows open, breathing in the breeze from the rubble of ships in the bay, the smell of shit, and listening in the silence of the saxophone to the daily noises of the patio, the unique note of the toad under the bushes of banana, the drop of water on the grave of no one, the natural steps of life that they had not had time to know before. When Nina DeCant's parents returned home, they had progressed so much in love that the world could no longer reach them for anything else, and they did it at any time and anywhere, trying to invent it again each time they did it. At first they did the best they could in the sports cars with which Billy Sanchez's father tried to appease his own guilt. Later, when the cars became too easy for them, they would sneak into the deserted huts of Marbella at night where fate had confronted them for the first time, and they even hid in disguises during the November carnival in the rental rooms of the old neighborhood. Of slaves from Gethsemane, under the protection of the Mama Santis that until a few months ago had to suffer Billy Sanchez with his gang of chain workers. Nina DeCant indulged in furtive loves with the same frenzied devotion she used to squander on the saxophone, to the point that her tame bandit came to understand what she meant when she told him that he had to behave like a black man. Billy Sanchez responded to him always and well and with the same joy. Once married, they fulfilled the duty of loving each other while the flight attendants slept in the middle of the Atlantic, locked up with difficulty and more dead with laughter than with pleasure in the airplane toilet. Only they knew then, 24 hours after the wedding, that Nina DeCant had been pregnant for two months. So when they arrived in Madrid they felt a long way from being two satisfied lovers, but they had enough reserves to behave like pure newlyweds. Both parents had planned everything. Before disembarking, a protocol officer went up to the first-class cabin to bring Nina to count the white mink coat with luminous black stripes, which was her parents' wedding gift. He brought Billy Sanchez a lamb jacket that was the novelty of that winter and the unbranded keys to a surprise car waiting for him at the airport. The diplomatic mission of his country received him in the official hall. The ambassador and his wife were not only longtime friends of their family, but he was the doctor who had attended the birth of Nina DeCant, and he waited for her with a bouquet of roses so radiant and fresh that even the dewdrops they seemed artificial. 
she greeted them both with mocking kisses, uncomfortable with her slightly premature newlywed status, and then received the roses. As he picked them up, he pricked his finger on a thorn on the stem, but he dodged the mishap with a charming resource. I did it on purpose, he said, so they would notice my ring. Indeed, the entire diplomatic mission admired the splendor of the ring, which must have cost a fortune, not so much for the class of diamonds as for its well-preserved age. But no one warned that the finger began to bleed. Everyone's attention then shifted to the new car. The ambassador had had the good humor to take him to the airport and have him wrapped in cellophane with a huge gold bow. Billy Sanchez didn't appreciate his wit. He was so eager to see the car that he tore the wrapping off in one go and gasped. It was that year's Bentley convertible with real leather upholstery. The sky looked like a blanket of ash, the Guadarrama was blowing a biting and icy wind, and it wasn't good out in the open, but Billy Sanchez still didn't have the notion of cold. He kept the diplomatic mission in the roofless parking lot, unaware that they were freezing out of courtesy, until he finished recognizing the car in its hidden details. Then the ambassador sat next to him to guide him to the official residence where a lunch was planned. Along the way, he pointed out the best-known places in the city, but he only seemed attentive to the magic of the car. It was the first time he had left his land. He had gone through all the private and public schools, always repeating the same course, until he was floating in a limbo of heartbreak. The first sight of a city other than his own, the ashen blocks of houses with the lights on in the middle of the day, the bare trees, the distant sea, everything was increasing a feeling of helplessness that he struggled to keep out of the heart. However, shortly thereafter, he inadvertently fell into the first forgetfulness trap. An instant and silent storm had set in, the first of the season, and when they left the ambassador's house after lunch to set out for France, they found the city covered in radiant snow. Billy Sanchez then forgot about the car, and in the presence of everyone, shouting with joy and throwing handfuls of snow powder on his head, rolled in the middle of the street with his coat on. Nina DeCant noticed for the first time that her finger was bleeding when they left Madrid on an afternoon that had become clear after the storm. He was surprised because he had accompanied the ambassador's wife on the saxophone, who liked to sing opera arias in Italian after official lunches, and he hardly noticed the discomfort on the ring finger. Later, while she was showing her husband the shortest routes to the border, she unconsciously sucked her finger every time it bled, and only when they reached the Pyrenees did she think of looking for a pharmacy. Then he succumbed to the overdue dreams of the past few days, and when he awoke suddenly with the nightmare impression that the car was driving through the water, he did not remember for a long time the handkerchief tied around his finger. He saw in the luminous clock on the board that it was after three, did his mental calculations, and only then did he realize that they had gone on a long way through Bordeaux, and also through Angoulême and Poitiers, and were passing the lawyer dyke flooded by the floodwaters. The moonlight filtered through the haze, and the castles among the pines looked like fairy tales. Nina de Conte, who knew the region by heart, calculated that they were already about three hours from Paris, and Billy Sanchez remained undaunted at the wheel. You are a savage, she told him. You have been driving for more than eleven hours without eating anything. He was still held in suspense by the drunkenness of the new car. Despite the fact that he had slept little and badly on the plane, he felt awake and with the strength to spare to reach Paris at dawn. I still have lunch at the embassy, he said. And he added without any logic. After all, in Cartagena they are barely leaving the cinema. It must be about ten o'clock. Still, Nina de Conte was afraid that he would fall asleep while driving. He opened a box among the many gifts that had been given to them in Madrid and tried to put a piece of sugar orange in his mouth. But he dodged her. Males don't eat sweets, he said. Shortly before Orleans the haze lifted, and a very large moon illuminated the snow-covered fields, but the traffic was made more difficult by the confluence of the huge trucks of vegetables and wine tanks heading to Paris. Nina de Conte would have wanted to help her husband on the wheel, but she didn't even dare to suggest it, because he had warned her from the first time they went out together that there is no greater humiliation for a man than to be led by his wife. 
she felt lucid after almost five hours of good sleep, and she was also glad that she had not stopped at a hotel in the province of France, which she had known from a very young age on numerous trips with her parents. There are no more beautiful landscapes in the world, he said, but you can die of thirst without finding anyone to give you a free glass of water. So convinced was she that at the last minute she had put a soap and a roll of toilet paper in her handbag, because there was never soap in hotels in France, and the toilet paper was the newspapers from the previous week cut into squares and hanging from a hook. The only thing she regretted at that moment was having wasted an entire night without love. Her husband's reply was immediate. Right now I was thinking it must be the hell to throw in the snow, he said. Right here, if you want. Nina DeConte thought it seriously. At the roadside, the snow under the moon looked soft and warm, but as they neared the suburbs of Paris the traffic was heavier, and there were lighted factory clusters and many workers on bicycles. If it hadn't been winter, they would already be in broad daylight. Better wait until Paris, said Nina DeConte. Very warm and in a bed with clean sheets, like married people. This is the first time you've failed me, he said. Sure, she replied. It's the first time we're married. Shortly before dawn they washed their faces and urinated in a diner on the road, and drank coffee and hot croissants at the counter where the truckers had breakfast with red wine. Nina DeConte had noticed in the bathroom that she had blood stains on her blouse and skirt, but she did not try to wash them. He threw the soaked handkerchief in the trash, changed the wedding ring for his left hand, and washed his injured finger thoroughly with soap and water. The puncture was almost invisible. However, as soon as they got back to the car it bled again, so that Nina DeConte left her arm hanging outside the window, convinced that the icy air of the fields had the qualities of cautery. It was another futile recourse, but he still hasn't been alarmed. If someone wants to find us, it will be very easy, he said with his natural charm. You will only have to trace my blood in the snow. Then he thought better of what he had said, and his face blossomed in the first light of dawn. Imagine, he said, a trail of blood in the snow from Madrid to Paris. Isn't that beautiful for a song? He didn't have time to think again. In the suburbs of Paris, the finger was an irrepressible spring, and she really felt that her soul was draining from the wound. He had tried to mow the flow with the roll of toilet paper in his briefcase, but it took longer to bandage his finger than to throw the bloody strips of paper out the window. The clothes she was wearing, the coat, the car seats, were getting soaked little by little, but irreparably. Billy Sanchez was seriously scared and insisted on looking for a pharmacy, but she knew then that this was not a matter for apothecaries. We're almost at the door of Orleans, he said. Go straight ahead, along Avenida del General Leclerc, which is the widest and with many trees, and then I'll tell you what to do. It was the hardest journey of all trip. General Leclerc Avenue was a hellish junction of small cars and motorcycles, bottled both ways, and of huge trucks trying to reach the central markets. Billy Sanchez became so nervous with the useless blare of the horns that he shouted insults in the language of Cade Neros with several drivers and even tried to get out of the car to fight with one, but Nina DeConte managed to convince him that the French were the most rude in the world, but they never hit each other. It was one more test of her good judgment, because at that moment Nina DeConte was trying hard not to lose consciousness. Just to get out of the roundabout at Leon de Belfort they needed more than an hour. The cafés and warehouses were lit as if it were midnight, for it was a typical Tuesday in January in Paris, cloudy and dirty, and with a persistent drizzle that did not reach snow. But Denfertrochero Avenue was clearer, and after a few blocks Nina DeConte directed her husband to turn right, and parked in front of the emergency entrance of a huge and shady hospital. She needed help getting out of the car, but she didn't lose her composure or clarity. While the doctor on duty arrived, lying on the rolling stretcher, she answered the nurse a routine questionnaire about her identity and health history. Billy Sanchez brought her the bag and squeezed her left hand where she was wearing the wedding ring at the time, and it felt languid and cold, and her lips had lost their color. He stayed by his side, with his hand in hers, until the doctor on duty arrived and did a quick examination of the wounded annulus. 
he was a very young man, with skin the color of ancient copper and a bald head. Nina DeConte paid him no attention, but gave her husband a livid smile. Don't be scared, he told her, with his invincible humor. The only thing that can happen is that this cannibal cuts off my hand to eat it. The doctor concluded his examination, and then surprised them with a very correct Castilian, although with a strange Asian accent. No, boys, he said. This cannibal would rather starve to death than cut off such a beautiful hand. They were confused, but the doctor reassured them with a kind gesture. Then he ordered the stretcher to be taken away and Billy Sanchez wanted to continue with it, holding his wife's hand. The doctor stopped him by the arm. Not you, he said. He goes for intensive care. Nina DeConte smiled at the husband again, and continued waving goodbye until the stretcher was lost at the end of the corridor. The doctor lingered studying the data the nurse had written on a clipboard. Billy Sanchez called him. Doctor, he said. She is pregnant. How long? Two months. The doctor did not give him the importance that Billy Sanchez expected. You were right to tell me, he said, and went behind the gurney. Billy Sanchez stood in the gloomy room smelling of the sweat of the sick, he was left unsure what to do looking at the empty corridor where Nina DeConte had been taken, and then he sat on the wooden bench where other people were waiting. He did not know how long he was there but when he decided to leave the hospital it was night again and the drizzle continued, and he still did not even know what to do with himself, overwhelmed by the weight of the world. Nina DeConte was admitted at 9.30 a.m. on Tuesday, January 7, as I was able to verify years later in the hospital files. That first night, Billy Sanchez slept in the car parked in front of the emergency room door, and very early the next day, he ate six hard-boiled eggs and two cups of coffee with milk in the cafeteria that he found closest, since he had not done a complete meal from Madrid. Then he returned to the emergency room to see Nina de Kant, but was made to understand that he should go to the main entrance. There they finally got an Asturian from the service who helped him get along with the doorman, and he verified that, indeed, Nina de Kant was registered in the hospital, but that visits were only allowed on Tuesdays from 9 to 4. That is, six days later. He tried to see the doctor who spoke Spanish, whom he described as a black man with a bald head, but no one gave him reason with two such simple details. Reassured by the news that Nina de Kant was in the registry, he returned to the place where he had left the car, and a traffic officer forced him to park two blocks later, on a very narrow street and on the side of the odd numbers. Across the street was a restored building with a sign, Hotel Nicole. It had a single star, and a very small living room where there was nothing but a sofa and an old upright piano, but the piping-voiced owner could communicate with customers in any language as long as they had enough to pay. Billy Sanchez settled with eleven suitcases and nine gift boxes in the only spare room, which was a triangular mansard on the ninth floor reached out of breath by a spiral staircase that smelled of boiled cauliflower foam. The walls were lined with sad hangings, and nothing could fit through the single window but the murky light of the inner courtyard. There was a bed for two, a large wardrobe, a simple chair, a portable bidet, and a wash basin with its tray and jug, so that the only way to be in the room was to lie on the bed. Everything was worse than old, shabby, but also very clean and with a healthy trace of recent medicine. Billy Sanchez would not have had enough life to decipher the enigmas of that world founded on the talent of stinginess. He never understood the mystery of the staircase light that went out before he reached his apartment, nor did he figure out how to turn it back on. It took her half a morning to learn that on the landing of each floor there was a small room with a chain toilet, and she had already decided to use it in the dark when she discovered by chance that the light came on when the lock was passed inside, so that no one would leave it. Lit by oblivion. The shower, which was at the end of the corridor and which he insisted on using twice a day as in his land, was paid separately and in cash, and the hot water, controlled by the administration, ran out after three minutes. However, Billy Sanchez had enough clarity of judgment to understand that that order so different from his was in any case better than the bad weather of January, 
and he also felt so dazed and alone that he could not understand how he could ever live without shelter scored by Nina Decant. As soon as he went up to the room, on Wednesday morning, he lay face down on the bed with his coat on, thinking of the creature of prodigy that continued to bleed out on the sidewalk in front of him, and very soon he succumbed to a dream so natural that when woke up it was five o'clock on the clock, but could not deduce if it was five in the afternoon or dawn, or on what day of the week or in which city of glass blown by the wind and rain. He waited awake in bed, always thinking of Nina Decant, until he realized that it was actually dawn. Then he went to breakfast at the same cafeteria the day before, and there he knew it was Thursday. The hospital lights were on and it had stopped raining, so he leaned against the trunk of a chestnut tree in front of the main entrance, where doctors and nurses in white coats came and went, hoping to find the Asian doctor who he had received Nina DeCant. She didn't see him, and she didn't see him that afternoon after lunch, when she had to give up waiting because she was freezing. At seven o'clock he had another coffee with milk and ate two hard-boiled eggs that he himself took from the sideboard after 48 hours of eating the same thing in the same place. When he returned to the hotel to go to bed, he found his car alone on a sidewalk and everyone else on the opposite sidewalk, and he had a fine notice posted on his windshield. Nicole had a hard time explaining to the hotel doorman that on odd days of the month she could park on the odd-numbered sidewalk, and the next day, on the opposite sidewalk. So many rationalistic tricks were incomprehensible for a Sanchez de Avila of the most honest, who just two years before had gotten into a neighborhood cinema with the mayor's official car, and had caused death havoc before the undaunted policeman. He understood even less when the hotel doorman advised him to pay the fine, but not to move the car around at that time, because he would have to change it again at midnight. That morning, for the first time, he did not think only of Nina DeCant, but he was tossing and turning in bed without being able to sleep, thinking of his own nights of grief in the queer canteens of the Cartagena del Caribe public market. He remembered the taste of fried fish and coconut rice at the inns on the dock where the Aruba schooners docked. He remembered his house with the walls covered with Trinitarias, where it was barely seven o'clock last night and he saw his father in silk pajamas reading the newspaper in the cool of the terrace. He remembered his mother, who you never knew where she was at any time, her mouth-watering and talkative mother, wearing a Sunday dress and a rose in her ear since sunset, drowning in heat from the encumbrance of her splendid fabrics. One afternoon when he was seven years old, he had suddenly entered her room and found her naked in bed with one of her casual lovers. That mishap, of which they had never spoken, established between them a complicity relationship that was more useful than love. However, he was not aware of that, nor of so many terrible things about his loneliness as an only child, until that night when he found himself tossing and turning in the bed of a sad mansard in Paris, with no one to tell of his misfortune, and with a fierce rage against himself because he couldn't bear the urge to cry. It was a helpful insomnia. On Friday he woke up spoiled by a bad night, but determined to define his life. She finally decided to break the lock on her suitcase to change her clothes, since everyone's keys were in Nina DeCon's handbag, with most of the money and the phone book where she might have found the phone number. Some acquaintance from Paris. In the usual cafeteria he realized that he had learned to say hello in French, and to order ham sandwiches and coffee with milk. She also knew that it would never be possible for her to order butter or eggs in any form because she would never learn to say them, but butter was always served with bread, and hard-boiled eggs were visible on the sideboard and caught without asking. In addition, after three days, the service personnel had become familiar with him, and helped him to explain himself. So Friday at lunch, while trying to get his head back on his stall, he ordered a fillet of beef with fries and a bottle of wine. Then he felt so good that he asked for another bottle, drank it halfway, and crossed the street with a firm resolve to break into the hospital by force. He did not know where to find Nina DeCant, but the providential image of the Asian doctor was fixed in his mind, and he was sure of finding him. He did not enter through the front door, but through the emergency room, which had seemed less guarded, but he did not reach beyond the corridor where Nina DeCant had waved goodbye. A guard in a blood-spattered robe asked him something as he passed, 
and he paid no attention. The guard followed him, always repeating the same question in French, and finally grabbed his arm so tightly that he stopped him short. Billy Sanchez tried to shake him off with a chaining device, and then the guard shitted on his mother in French, twisted her arm behind her back with a skeleton key, and without stopping shitting a thousand times on his fucking mother took him almost and he flew to the door, raging with pain, and threw him like a bundle of potatoes in the middle of the street. That afternoon, sore from the lesson, Billy Sanchez began to be an adult. He decided, as Nina DeCant would have done, to go to his ambassador. The hotel doorman, who despite his sullen attitude was very helpful and also very patient with languages, found the number and address of the embassy in the telephone directory and wrote them down on a card. A very kind woman answered, in whose slow and dull voice Billy Sanchez immediately recognized the diction of the Andes. He began by announcing himself with his full name, sure to impress the woman with his two last names, but his voice did not alter on the phone. He heard her explain by heart the lesson that the ambassador was not at the moment in his office and they were not expecting him until the next day, but in any case he could not receive him except by appointment and only for a special case. Billy Sanchez understood then that he would not get to Nina DeCant either that way, and he thanked the information with the same kindness with which it had been given. Then he took a taxi and went to the embassy. It was at number 22, Calle del Eliseo within one of the most peaceful sectors of Paris, but the only thing that impressed Billy Sanchez, according to what he himself told me in Cartagena de Indias many years later, was that the sun it was as clear as in the Caribbean for the first time since their arrival, and that the Eiffel Tower loomed above the city in a radiant sky. The official who received him in place of the ambassador seemed barely recovered from a fatal illness, not only because of the black cloth dress, the oppressive collar, and the morning tie but also because of the stealth of his gestures and the meekness of his voice. He understood Billy Sanchez's anxiety, but reminded him, without losing his sweetness, that they were in a civilized country whose strict rules were based on the oldest and wisest criteria, unlike the barbarous Americas, where it was enough to bribe the doorman. To enter hospitals. No, my dear young man, he said. There was no choice but to submit to the rule of reason and wait until Tuesday. After all, it's only four days away, he concluded. In the meantime, go to the Louvre. It's worth it. On leaving, Billy Sanchez found himself not knowing what to do in the Plaza de la Concorde. He saw the Eiffel Tower above the rooftops, and it seemed so close that he tried to reach it by walking along the docks. But very soon he realized that he was further away than he seemed, and that he also changed places as he searched for her. So he began to think of Nina DeCant sitting on a bench on the banks of the Seine. He watched the tugboats pass under the bridges, and they didn't look like boats, but wandering houses with stained roofs and windows with flower pots on the windowsill, and wires with clothes hanging on the slabs. He stared for a long time at a motionless fisherman, his rod motionless and his line motionless in the current, and he got tired of waiting for something to move until it began to get dark, and decided to take a taxi to return to the hotel. Only then did he realize that he did not know the name and address, and that he had no idea where the hospital was in Paris. Confused with panic, he went into the first café he could find, ordered a brandy, and tried to collect his thoughts. As he thought, he saw himself repeated many times and from different angles in the mirrors, numerous on the walls, and he found himself scared and lonely, and for the first time since his birth he thought about the reality of death. But with the second drink he felt better, and had the providential idea of returning to the embassy. He reached into his pocket for the card to remember the street name, and found that the hotel's name and address were printed on the back. He was so badly impressed with that experience that during the weekend he did not leave the room again but to eat and to change the car to the corresponding sidewalk. For three days the same dirty drizzle fell without pause as the morning they arrived. Billy Sanchez, who had never read a complete book, would have liked to have one so as not to get bored lying in bed, but the only ones he found in his wife's suitcases were in languages other than Spanish. So he kept waiting for Tuesday, staring at the peacocks repeated on the wallpaper and without stopping to think for a single moment about Nina DeCant. 
On Monday he put some order in the room, thinking about what she would say if she found him in that state, and only then did she discover that the mink coat was stained with dried blood. He spent the afternoon washing it with the scented soap that he found in his carry-on bag, until he managed to put it down again as they had put it on the plane in Madrid. Tuesday dawned cloudy and icy, but without the drizzle, and Billy Sanchez got up from six o'clock, and waited at the hospital door along with a crowd of relatives of the sick laden with packages of gifts and bouquets of flowers. He entered with the crowd, carrying the mink coat on his arm, without asking anything and without any idea where Nina DeCant might be, but supported by the certainty that he would find the Asian doctor. He passed through a very large inner courtyard, with flowers and wild birds, on the sides of which were the pavilions of the sick, the women, on the right, and the men, on the left. Following the visitors, he entered the women's pavilion. He saw a long line of sick women sitting on the beds in the hospital rag nightgown, illuminated by the big lights from the windows, and he even thought that it was all more cheerful than he could imagine from outside. She reached the end of the corridor, and then went back down it again, until she was convinced that none of the sick women was Nina DeCant. Then he walked the outer gallery again, looking out the window at the men's wards, until he thought he recognized the doctor he was looking for. It was him, indeed. He was with other doctors and several nurses, examining a sick man. Billy Sanchez entered the ward, pushed one of the group's nurses aside, and stood in front of the Asian doctor, who was bent over the patient. He called it. The doctor raised his desolate eyes, thought for a moment and then recognized him. But where the hell have you been? said. Billy Sanchez was perplexed. At the hotel, he said. Here, around the corner. Then he knew. Nina DeCant had bled to death at 7.10 p.m. on Thursday, January 9, after 70 hours of useless efforts by the best qualified specialists in France. Until the last moment she had been lucid and serene, and she gave instructions for them to look for her husband at the Plaza Athene Hotel, where they had a room reserved, and gave the information for them to contact her parents. The embassy had been informed on Friday by an urgent cable from its foreign ministry, when Nina de Kant's parents were already flying to Paris. The ambassador himself handled the embalming and funeral procedures, and remained in contact with the Paris police prefecture to locate Billy Sanchez. An urgent call with his personal data was transmitted from Friday night to Sunday afternoon via radio and television, and during those 40 hours he was the most wanted man in France. His portrait, found in Nina de Kant's bag, was displayed everywhere. Three Bentley convertibles of the same model had been located, but none were his. Nina de Kant's parents had arrived on Saturday at noon, and they watched over the body in the hospital chapel, waiting until the last minute to find Billy Sanchez. His parents had also been informed, and they were ready to fly to Paris, but in the end they gave up because of a confusion of telegrams. The funerals took place on Sunday at two in the afternoon, just 200 meters from the sordid hotel room where Billy Sanchez was dying of loneliness for the love of Nina DeCant. The official who had attended him at the embassy told me years later that he himself received the telegram from his chancellery an hour after Billy Sanchez left his office, and that he had been looking for him in the stealthy bars of Faubourg St. Honor. He confessed that he had not paid much attention to it when he received it because he would never have imagined that that coastal man, stunned by the novelty of Paris, and with such a badly worn lamb coat, would have such an illustrious origin in his favor. On the same Sunday night, while he endured the urge to cry with rage, Nina de Kant's parents gave up the search and took the embalmed body inside the metal coffin, and those who saw it continued to repeat for many years that they had not never seen a more beautiful woman, neither alive nor dead. So when Billy Sanchez finally entered the hospital, on Tuesday morning, the burial had already been consummated in the sad pantheon of La Manga, a few meters from the house where they had deciphered the first keys to happiness. The Asian doctor who informed Billy Sanchez of the tragedy wanted to give him some painkillers in the hospital room, but he refused. He left without saying goodbye, with nothing to be grateful for thinking that the only thing he needed urgently was to find someone to whom he could break his mother with chains to get even for his misfortune. 
when he came out of the hospital, he did not even realize that there was falling from the sky a snow without traces of blood, whose crisp, tender flakes looked like the feathers of doves, and that there was an air of celebration in the streets of Paris, because it was the first big snowfall in ten years. 1976 And 12 Pilgrim Tales Gabriel Garcia Marquez